Council Member Cormack? Here. Chair Du Bois? Here. Vice Mayor Fine? Here. Three present. So this is the May 15th meeting of the Finance Committee to go over the budget. Um, we don't have any oral communications. And we talked a little bit, but we're going to take a break every couple of hours. And the first break will be at 2.45. And then we'll have a break at 5.15. All right, so let's go ahead and start with item number one, which is uh, the budget overview. Thank you, committee members, and really appreciate all of the time and effort I know you've already put into reviewing the material we've given you in preparation for our uh, hearings tonight and uh, in the upcoming weeks, as the case may be. Um, just want to uh, provide some opening comments just in terms of uh, appreciation for all of the work also that staff has done in putting together this information. Uh, you'll see a slice of our staff coming and going through the course of the next couple of meetings. Um, there are pieces I know that are still in the works. We've talked a lot about the services inventory, and I think we're, we're still working on the finishing touches of that. So Kylie and I will chat about when that will be ready. Um, also note that uh, given the schedule of the upcoming meetings, you're, you're going to want to establish something of a pace in, in uh, going through the material. So we'll, we'll support you as you do that. Um, recall that we have uh, the feature of the parking lot or referrals uh, that uh, should there be issues that you think need uh, more discussion or uh, the additional information be help, helpful, then uh, we'll be happy to take those referrals and then come back yeah. timing-wise. What's past practice? Is it just any one person puts things on the parking lot? Um, typically, it's been two votes. Um, we'll put it in the parking lot. Yep, very good. So, thank you. With that, um, I think we're ready to roll into it. Uh, so, I'll hand it off to Steve Gargliardo and uh, get us going. Thanks, Ed. Steve Gargliardo with Sorry the Office of Budget. <laughs> Not a problem. It's a difficult last name. I didn't pick it. <laughs> so, as Ed mentioned, today marks the first day of the Finance Committee hearings. We have three scheduled. Kylie will go through the calendar a little bit at the end of this overview. This Opening overview is really meant to be at about the 5,000 foot level. We'll go through uh, the operating budget in its entirety, talking about citywide funds, and then moving fund section by fund section, including internal service funds, general funds, special revenue funds, enterprise funds. Paul will talk briefly about the capital budget, and we'll talk a little bit about the calendar and the overall order of operations for these hearings, addressing some of the questions like the chair just asked. So the operating budget consists of a number of different sections. Uh, internal service funds are the ones that serve other departments. In one of the app places memos that was distributed to you earlier today, there's actually a bit of an explanation for how an internal service fund works. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to that section as well to explain the mechanics of that. The general fund is where we spend a lot of our money on things like firefighters, police officers, libraries, community services, etc. And special revenue funds reflect things where we get revenues for a specific designated purpose. The parking funds are special revenue funds, as an example. Enterprise funds are rate paying activities where the city charges rate payers, collects the revenue, and then provides the service in turn. The utilities are one of the clearest examples of an enterprise fund that the city has. Capital budget is where we budget for infrastructure. We'll talk at length about capital budget. We'll talk about it a little bit today, and then next week we have a lot of time set up to discuss it. And then finally, at the end of today, we'll get through the summary. Most of these slides were included when the budget was transmitted to full council, so they may seem um, familiar. They're also included in the budget book, um, so there shouldn't be anything too surprising in here. Starting off with, at the citywide level, which is uh, the accumulation of all funds across the organization, we see our citywide sources. You can see that net sales, which represents selling commodities to ratepayers, and the taxes represent almost 70% of the city's overall revenue. This is Overall, a slight decrease in the city's um, sources from the FY19 budget, and that largely reflects shifts in planned capital projects. Um, on the expense side, you see a similar story. Um, as you'd expect with a balanced budget, your revenues equal your expenses. The sum of three of these slices of the pie of salaries and benefits, the utility purchases, and the capital improvement program comprise nearly 75% of the city's total expenses. So we're a service-driven organization. Salary and benefits are what pay for the people who deliver the services. The utility purchases are recognized as an expense, but they're also recognized as the net sales revenue we just saw on the prior slide. And the CIP expenses are, again, where we're building that infrastructure. 
Across the organization, you see some changes in full-time positions. In order to balance the FY2020 budget and position as well for FY2021, various position actions are recommended in this FY20 proposed budget. Many of the reductions are in the general fund. Six of the full-time position reductions included in the general fund reflect the shift of animal services from in-house to the public-private partnership with Pets in Need. Um, where position ads are recommended, they are for specific service enhancements in critical areas. Two of the positions recommended to be added are in transportation, for example, a critical need that the city faces as we go forward through FY 2020. This next slide shows the salary and benefit changes. Um, that base column for the general fund shows what expenses would have been had we not taken any reductions across the organization. So we would have had a total of $136,491,000 in salary and benefits in the general fund. However, through the actions recommended in this proposed budget, we cut nearly, we reduced nearly $2.5 million in salary and benefit expenses. Um, across all funds, it's a similar story. We would have been at about $234.5 million, but we, through the reductions that are recommended in this budget, we're getting down to 231.9. A big portion of that is council's direction to more proactively fund the city's long-term pension liabilities. So this next slide shows the increases by budget category for salary, pension, health care, retiree health, and other benefits. And this is again focused on those reductions. You can see large increases in what the city is paying for pension, that 27.6% in the general fund and that 34.5% in all funds. That represents in large part the proactive funding using that 6.2% discount rate. It costs an additional $3.8 million in the general fund and it costs $6.2 million in all funds for the ongoing piece. The reason you see that 34.5% in all funds is because non-general funds are also making a one-time catch-up contribution of an additional $2.3 million. Without those increases in the FY 2020 budget, you would see an increase in the general fund of only 3.8%, and you'd see an increase of about 5% in all funds. Those are far more in line with the historical increases we see in salary and benefits. Moving on to the internal service funds, these are the funds that serve the city internally, um, as you might expect from that somewhat circular explanation. This is where we charge ourselves for the services we're providing and allocate them out. This is where things like the technology fund are included. So the technology fund charges everybody for the laptops provided through the city and then provides those laptops in turn. The workers' compensation fund operates as a self-insurance fund. We pay into that, and then that's where workers' compensation claims are paid from. The general benefits fund is similar, um, and the costs that are allocated here for the general benefits fund reflect the administrative costs that need to be allocated out. The benefit costs themselves are paid directly and budgeted in that salary and benefits slide we just saw. So they're not included here because they're paid directly by those. The administration of those. Correct. Um, worthy of note in here is that the workers' compensation fund costs, you can see, are increasing by 43% in the general fund and by a similar amount across all funds. That does not represent a significant increase in the city's workers' comp um, liability or uh, what we need to pay. Instead, it represents that as part of FY19's budget, we were able to do what was essentially a rate pass and use accumulated fund balance in that fund to subsidize the city's contribution into it. On an annual basis, we examine the internal service funds, we examine where we expect them to end, and we budget accordingly for those. For both the retiree, uh, excuse me, for both the general liability fund and the workers' compensation fund, we do have an outside actuarial consultant, Bickmore, do a risk assessment for us and help inform what those budgeted levels should be. Just quickly before we move on, um, at your places, Steve referenced a memo, and just to, We'll highlight what's in this memo slowly as we go through it since we know you haven't had a chance to read it. On page three is the visual kind of representation of what Steve just verbally walked you through, <clears throat> excuse me, of how these internal service funds work. Um, so in particular, it's just a, a model of the vehicle replacement fund. So looking at the diagram on the far left at that at places, you can see all of the departments that are paying into the vehicle replacement uh, and maintenance fund. And that's totaling, there's a general fund component as well as an other funds or enterprise fund component. That's totaling 9.2 million in revenue into that fund, of which you can see there's expenses obviously in the vehicle uh, replacement and maintenance fund of 9.2 as well. And so if you look at that diagram, when Steve says that there's a rate pass, quote unquote, in a year, 
that $9.2 million number may be $8 million because there's enough money sitting in a fund balance that we don't need to fully recover all the costs in that year. We can drain the savings because we've accumulated too much, meaning either revenues or expenses were um, above or below experience in prior years. So again, just if you're a visual person versus a numbers person versus a verbal person, there's text, there's an image, um, but just something to keep in mind. May I? Um, so, but then within the fund, there are other allocated charges. So those are going elsewhere for laptops and HR and what have you. Correct. So it's not just a, okay, thanks. And, and just so, I, <laughs> so in these internal service funds, it's not really a reserve. We actually use an actuarial to tell us if we have too much from year to year. So next up, we have the general fund. This is the big one. Um, this graph is what you saw when we transmitted the long range financial forecast to full council a little bit earlier this year. It was also included when we transmitted the budget. So this is what we were calling for when we did the 10 year long range financial forecast in the fall. The blue line shows the one time gap between salaries and expenses in any given year according to that forecast. And the red line shows the net operating margin. The net operating margin shows what happens if you solve any deficit on a structural basis and if you spend any surplus on a structural basis. So you can see that according to this graph, we were expected to generate more revenues than expenses starting in FY 2024. But if we structurally solved every deficit in FY 2020 and FY 2021, we'd go positive by FY 2022. This really served as a baseline, as a forecast, as a way to instruct us as a city of what we were expecting to see and guided us through the budget development process. This chart is that same information that we just saw on that graph, just in a chart form, and depending on how um, people want to process it. Again, this is showing that we had a $2.8 million gap in FY 2020 when we developed the long range financial forecast. Through the hard work of this organization, we're pleased to report that we did balance the FY 2020 budget. Um, that's what we see here on this slide showing revenues of 232.1 million. This reflects the updated estimates past what we had when we developed the long range financial forecast as you would expect as we go forward in time we get updated information and we incorporate that into our budget forecast as appropriate. It's important to note that for the general fund taxes comprise nearly 60% of general fund revenues. That's transient occupancy tax, property taxes, sales tax, utility users tax, et cetera. There should be a little line connecting documentary transfer tax to that purple slice on this. I think we caught that yesterday and it didn't make it into the slide. On the expense side, the budget includes $230.8 million in expenses. Now for those of you who we're tracking, that's less than we had in revenues. You're probably wondering what happened to that money. So that money, that difference there of about $1.3 million represents the contribution to the budget stabilization reserve to maintain it at council's target of 18.5%. So the guidelines for the budget stabilization reserve are that it can be between 15% and 20%. Council's target has been 18.5% and we thought it was important to keep it there. Why is that just shown as an expense to balance it? So it goes essentially into um, fund balance. And so to your point, it could be shown as an expense here and reflect that it is being contributed to that. Um, it's just a matter of how we treat it in the budget document itself. We don't set it aside. It's just where everything goes. Um, as a service driven organization, the single largest component of general fund expenses is the salary and benefits that covers our police officers, firefighters, librarians, community service uh, aides and others in the general fund. This next slide shows some of the trends we see in revenue and expense growth. The revenue growth is about 8.2% or $7.7 .7 million higher than it was in FY 2019. Over 75% of that growth is due to tax revenue increases, about 13 million of it. Property tax is growing 7.3% in this budget to $3.3 million increase. And you can see that reflected on the green line in the chart at the bottom of this slide. Expense growth is 9.5% or about $20.1 million higher than it was in FY19. But this includes a number of uh, actions that help explain that 9.5% growth. So first and foremost of this is the restoration of FY19 one-time items. And we talked about this a little bit when we uh, transmitted the long-range financial forecast to council. The FY19 budget had that 
$4 million reduction included in it while we were figuring out how to address that through FY19. This also includes the $3.8 million for the 6.2% discount rate for the normal cost to more proactively fund the city's long-term pension liabilities. Um, and this also includes labor agreement costs. So when the budget was adopted in FY19, the safety labor agreements had not yet been ratified by council and as such were not included in the adopted budget. So this includes the increases necessary for those agreements in FY 2020. And again, we see that $1.3 million BSR contribution to keep it at $42.7 million, which is 18.5% of the overall general fund budget. So the balancing strategy for FY 2020 was to incorporate council's direction to change the pension forecasting. This is the first year that the city of Palo Alto has done that as the base model in the budget to include that. Um, we are among the few organizations in the state of California to be proactively funding the pension contributions, and we are certainly among the few to use a more aggressive normal cost than CalPERS uses. Incorporating that direction necessitated ongoing reductions in expenses, including position eliminations in the general fund. We see those throughout the budget in the sections. They include things like a librarian, um, public, public works positions, excuse me, and other non-salary reductions. Um, this budget also includes one-time savings while departments can evaluate ongoing strategies to make sure we thoughtfully articulate a long-term structurally balanced budget. As discussed a little bit when we talked about positions, there's a net reduction of eight and a half full-time positions from FY19 adopted levels. Um, this includes one council approved change, which was that auditor position as part of the CMR that went forward in December, as well as an additional seven and a half positions. One quick question. For the one-time savings across departments, are we going to see those department by department, or is there a list of those at some point? So you'll see those department by department. Um, they also are detailed somewhat in the uh, transmittal letter of the operating budget. And I'll grab that page for you right now. So XI. So we talk about the departments that are in, um, gonna be holding positions vacant on page uh, seven of the transmittal letter. They include administrative services, community services, the <coughs> fire department, planning and community environment, and the police department. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. This budget also includes targeted enhancements to address critical needs. These are things like establishing an office of transportation to reflect that critical need for the organization, as well as committing funds to workforce stabilization and continued leadership in public and private partnerships. So the next section we're gonna run through are the special revenue funds. These are revenues we receive for specific purposes. Um, this is also where we see things like parking funds. So for federal and state revenues, the big one is the community development block grant funding that we get every year. Um, those final allocations are still being confirmed by HUD. I think we might have just got the numbers earlier today, so we'll report back on those. But this reflects the plan as approved by council to submit to HUD in the first place. For street improvement funds, we have $2.6 million invested in capital projects for transportation and street maintenance. We did reach our goal of a current pavement condition index beyond 85 uh, three years early. So now we're re-pivoting a little bit and working towards no street being below a PCI score of 60. In the parking funds, we're focusing on strategies to address the myriad traffic and transportation challenges that we're facing. Um, we're establishing that Office of Transportation, which we'll talk about a little bit more later today. We're also including a general fund subsidy to the residential parking permit fund. So, this was a topic of conversation at council earlier this week, so it's something you're probably all familiar with, but as a reminder, the RPP fund is not cost neutral, like that activity is not cost neutral. So this budget includes a necessary subsidy to cover the operating deficit for that, and it is $720,000. The parking funds also have $1.5 million in investments in capital projects, including a comprehensive parking management system um, and some improvements at University Ave, as well as parking wayfinding. For enterprise funds, these are the utilities as well as the refuse fund, as well as um, the airport fund. But what we focus on here is the utility rate changes and what the average change is to a residential bill. So by utility service, you can see what the average impact is um, to their bill in both percentage and dollar. This will be discussed a little bit as part of the utility section later today. 
and it should be noted that the electric and gas rates are still scheduled to be reviewed by you as part of that discussion. In total, the residential average residential monthly bill is estimated to increase by about $15 per month to a total of $312 per month. With that, I'll turn it over to Paul, who will run us through a little bit of the capital budget. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Paul Harper with the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, so the capital improvement plan uh, is split across three funding types, uh, the capital project funds, the enterprise funds, and the internal service funds. Uh, the, this uh, makes up about 210 projects uh, over the five-year plan, costing approximately $730 million. Uh, the capital project funds include the general fund, capital improvement fund, and the Karuli fund. Uh, the internal service funds are the uh, technology fund and the vehicle fund, and then the enterprise funds uh, cover the utility and public works enterprise funds that are um, mainly those ratepayer uh, programs that we have. Uh, the capital project funds have the most projects budgeted. However, the amount of funding, uh, the enterprise funds have a little bit more um, in terms of uh, total amount budgeted uh, within them. Uh, a few things to highlight uh, over the five-year plan. Uh, there are 13 new projects that are being added in here. Nine of them are in the general fund capital improvement fund. Uh, a majority of those, about six of them, are for uh, safety enhancements, so uh, automated external defibrillator replacements, uh, cardiac monitor uh, replacements, um, and then two of them are for facility upgrades, including uh, bridge improvements, and then one is for transportation safety improvement at the Churchill Avenue Alma Street Railroad Crossing. The five-year plan uh, actually has decreased about $16 million from the last five-year plan. Um, this is mainly due to the realignment of uh, replacement schedule for utilities infrastructure. So the utilities department has recommended that for water, wastewater, and gas projects that we basically spread the projects out over a longer timeline in order to um, save funding as well as align the workload better with the staff that uh, works on all of these projects kind of simultaneously. As a result, this pushes some of the bigger projects out beyond the five-year plan, and so that uh, has reduced the overall amount budgeted across the five-year plan. Uh, some of the major initiatives uh, that we are focusing on are continuing to fund the infrastructure plan uh, while maintaining funding for the IBRIC, the Infrastructure Blue Ribbon Committee catch-up and keep-up projects. In addition, uh, there was a major push to recognize all the operating and maintenance costs that are ongoing for capital projects. Um, it has been um, basically the, the funding hasn't been aligned um, as clearly as it should be between the capital and the operating budget. And so in this, we're attempting to make sure that when the funding is needed on the operating side that it'll uh, be budgeted appropriately uh, for the ongoing maintenance and operating of those uh, capital projects. Uh, six of the 13 stormwater management fee ballot measures are planned as part of this. There were four that were in the five-year plan last year. Two more are being added. Uh, two of the three enterprise new projects this year are in that grouping. And then the last uh, kind of major initiative is at the water control uh, plant where um, some major infrastructure needs are coming up. Uh, there's about 131 million programmed in the budget uh, this year, um, sorry, in the five-year plan, um, and staff is working on coming up with funding alternatives to mitigate some of those costs for the city and the partners that uh, the plant services. So, <clears throat> Paul, just make sure I heard you right. Yeah. So the decrease, 16.4, it's not that we saved money, we just pushed it out beyond the five years. Is that Right. Essentially, yeah. It's uh, basically staff re-looked at um, how to fund the projects and when they would have capacity to get to them, um, mainly in the utilities. But yeah, we're not essentially saving money. We're just pushing them out beyond the five-year okay. plan. Thanks. Uh, these next two slides, we're going to look at the infrastructure plan a little more in depth. Uh, we will be talking about it more next week uh, when we do the general fund capital section. But essentially, this uh, table is organized in order of estimated completion date for the projects. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first four projects, the fire station three, 
Charleston or Astrodero, California Avenue parking garage, and the Highway 101 pedestrian bridge are all planned to be completed by summer or fall of 2020, so within the next fiscal year, if not slightly beyond. Um, as you can see, those four projects have major investments through fiscal year 19. That does include actuals and encumbered funding, so um, that funding may move into the next year just through our financial mechanisms, um, but it's essentially going to be uh, tied up um, and awarded for those projects. The next four, the Downtown Automated Parking Guidance, Bixby, Fire Station 4, and Public Safety Building are kind of the next set of projects. Uh, all of the projects are anticipated to be completed within the five-year timeline. Um, and one thing to note, the Downtown Automated Parking Guidance System is actually a new project in terms of the infrastructure plan. Um, it has been a project that's been budgeted, but it's being recommended to be added to the infrastructure plan this year as part of the budget in order to mitigate some of the uh, parking issues with the downtown parking garage project currently on hold. Just a question, does that need to go to council doing that? Or is that just staff's initiative? Ultimately, it will be part of the Ultimately, it will be part of the budget that the council will be approving. Okay. I just question because I know some of our colleagues have, you know, multiple times asked about prioritizing the infrastructure plan projects. And so this is a bit of a change, which we may want to highlight to them. Uh, this last slide is a similar look at the infrastructure plan. Uh, it's basically a timeline of the projects and how they are estimated to be completed. Uh, again, the top four uh, should be completed at or the end at or near the end of fiscal year 2020. Um, the next four, as you can see, are all to be completed uh, within uh, the next two years. And then the final two at the bottom, the bicycle and pedestrian plan and the downtown parking garage, are currently both both on hold, um, pending further direction from council. Um, and lastly, if you know if you have further questions, there is an infrastructure plan website that's been set up by the Public Works Department. It details the plan as a whole, as well as the individual projects themselves and uh, kind of where they are in their, their current timelines. Turn it back to Kylie or Steve. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're not done with me yet, Paul. Sorry. So we just went through at a 5,000 foot level of the things that are included in the budget. We wanted to call out some of the additional needs of the things that are not included in the budget. Um, so in the near term, some of those things are the continued cost escalation we see for capital infrastructure plan projects. There are the costs associated with the master plans that are currently in the works. That's for parks, that's for Coverly, um, and the additional costs that may be necessary as a result of what is decided with those master plans. Um, outright new CIPs, for example, JMZ phase two, which would be the construction of an additional building out at the JMZ. Um, that could be a classroom or an insectarium. Um, but there's still work to be done there in terms of uh, funding that, if that is chosen to be pursued. In addition, should we choose to completely rebuild an animal shelter rather than renovate the existing one, those costs are not yet included. And same with Foothill Park and whatever we want to do out there. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Yes. And also the, um, the, the new acreage, right? It's two separate issues, right? Yep. Additionally, there's the transportation initiatives of hot topic at council these days is grade separation and what ultimately the choice will be there and what that long-term funding plan looks like. Any additional funding for housing. Um, this budget does include funding to address the normal cost for long-term pension liability. All else being equal, we would pay down the unfunded actuarial liability over the next 30 years if CalPERS meets the rate of return every year. Um, should we choose to go after that in a more proactive manner, funding is not yet included in the budget for that. Um, additionally, if we choose to renovate or enhance city-owned assets that are currently operated by nonprofits, that would require further funding and any future labor agreements beyond the terms of what we've already agreed to would require additional funding. Finally, but worthy of note, um, just kind of looming out there, especially if you've been tracking the stock market over the past few days, is you know we've enjoyed economic success for a number of years in a row now. There is always the potential for a recession over the next few years. On that happy note. Wait, can I ask a quick sure. question on that page? Or are we going to hold and do questions all at the end? Okay. Um, 
Do we have a list of city-owned assets that are operated by nonprofits? Is it three? Is it 15? Is it? Uh, to my knowledge, we don't, but I suspect we could come up with that if that's something that the committee would Just like. Just be helpful to keep in mind because, you know, if I look at the new CIPs up here at the top, I can imagine there are other ones, that, <laughs> right, are, are in that, that same, uh, same situation. Do you want to add that to the parking lot to get that list? Sure. Do I have a vote? On the, do we do a vote for that or I'd, I'd we have three that. votes? Is that okay? So that's what I'm wondering if she wants. So uh, one of the things we're, we're kind of talking about down here is, is, uh, is that something, would it just be city-owned assets that a nonprofit is in, or what about the leases, right? We have a number both, of... Both, both would be actually, I think, very helpful. And I don't know that, you know, it's necessary for approval of the budget. If I'm just thinking out loud, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to, you know, um, divert your precious time during mm -hmm. this these two-week period. but. I, every time, every year I see this list, more things get added, and I, I like this description, but it opens up, a, you know, a bit of a Pandora's box in terms of how many things might be in there. I feel like I learn something every month or two about, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, the city owned that That's and it was leased, et cetera. So I just think in the context of, like, thinking about risks or um, potential future costs, that would, it'd just be helpful to have. Perhaps I'd suggest that we start with that list of leases, below market leases in particular, and um, see if there's a way to, to roll that up for your context. I think that that uh, uh, would provide a pretty good list. Thank you. Right. Kylie, did you want to do this slide or do you want me to? Nope, you're getting up. I'll do it. I just missed the cue. Sorry. So uh, this is our quick wrap up a little bit of the overview, so important things to keep in mind as we go forward. The city continues to face competing priorities and strategically significant decisions. Um, through the budget process, we'll comprehensively review all options and make sure we have an informed and balanced approach, including things beyond the scope of this budget. We'll continue service delivery evolutions to make sure we maintain high quality services while keeping costs contained. And we're balancing our long-term financial implications with our ability to attract and maintain the workforce that our community requires. We have significant investments to require, will require new revenues to fund strategic initiatives to, such as grade separation, such as the Carberly Master Plan that we are aware of that are on the horizon. And in capital, as discussed a little bit on the last slide, slide excuse me, we continue to see cost escalation. This compresses our ability to fund future anticipated projects. And finally, throughout this process, it's incredibly important that we manage the expectations of the City Council, of the community, and staff regarding the fact that we do have limited resources and a great desire for a great many wants. With that, I'll turn it over to Kylie. Got it. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we just wanted to spend a little bit of time kind of going over the fit and form of the next few days um, so that we can all kind of norm together. We've gotten actually some of it out of the way. Um, before you on the slide are the three public meetings uh, that the Finance Committee is scheduled to have, uh, obviously today, uh, the 23rd, which is next Thursday, and then we'll wrap up on the 28th of May. Now, just as a reminder to the committee, uh, Monday the 27th is a holiday, so there's about one business day turnaround between the 23rd and 28th, so any information will probably be at places on the day of the 28th. Um, provided to this committee. Obviously, the staff will do their best to get um, and provide information in advance, but a lot of this will be real time. Um, in the event that staff does provide something at places in real time, do expect that we will spend a little bit of time going off script from the PowerPoints to help walk you through this and orient you to what's in the memos um, so that you can use them and you know, add them to your repertoire of resources uh, as we go through this process. Um, Turning our attention strictly to today's agenda, uh, we have the agenda items bucketed. Um, so it's not necessarily department by department, but we have them bucketed kind of by service area. Um, so the first one is going to end up being our utilities department, um, and you will have two rate presentations as part of that. Um, and as part of their presentation, they'll work in the rates. The, then we're going to move to a bucket of kind of our transportation planning and development services. So this will be, you know, Jonathan Late's team, Chantal as the interim CTO, 
Uh, and so we'll do a presentation that both highlights what's going on in terms of what Ed had alluded to, the services inventory. So visually what the services inventory looks like for these departments, um, major accomplishments as well as um, kind of what they're looking towards over the coming year. And then obviously the transactional um, items for that, those departments as a whole. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to the committee for any questions or comments on any of those departments or any of those sections. So it's, uh, you know, it's incumbent on you guys in terms of how you want to meeting manage that necessarily. If you want to go uh, member by member, um, et cetera. Right. So we all agree, I guess we'll hold our questions till, till the end and then hit, hit them up, right? Sure, not okay. a problem. We can do that. Isn't that what you just proposed? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and then in terms of the administration, just we have it on the slides in case we all forget. Uh, what we, our goal uh, as part of this is, as we go through each of these agenda items, is to get a tentative approval from the Finance Committee with any amendments that the committee wants to recommend. And that tentative approval will be all revisited as part of budget wrap-up on the 28th, uh, where the Finance Committee will finalize what they recommend to the full council for budget adoption for 2020. Um, and some mechanisms to help us through that are obviously the tentative approvals uh, at places, in not in places, I'm sorry, um, motions that can be done for the parking lot. Uh, so that's kind of short-term stuff, things that you need to help get us through the budget process to help make a decision and a recommendation to the full council. And then additional staff follow-up would be things that the committee wants to flag for potentially a referral by the full council. You know, the items that are gonna take more than an hour of staff time, we want to do some sort of in-depth something over the course of the next year, adding it to the work plan, so to speak. Um, and then lastly, as you go through these PowerPoints, you're going to start seeing these little diamonds, I guess, flowers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and that's just staff's way to try and denote areas where we are taking budgetary reductions uh, in accordance with trying to attain this uh, new higher pension contribution. Uh, so just a, a visual to try and peg through consistently. So you'll see that throughout the two days. Um, so that's kind of the nuts and bolts uh, details. Uh, as I just promised, to quickly tell you what's in the At Places memo for this agenda item specifically, um, we'll, the first part is more just kind of trends that you're going to see in department sections. Um, between salaries, year-over-year -year changes, et cetera. A lot of this Steve actually already went through the PowerPoint earlier. Uh, this is just the written form. Something that we can get into more potentially as part of utilities as well as um, the coming day on the 23rd is there's been a lot of conversation about how we prioritize CIP projects. We already covered the internal service funds. And lastly, um, the committee had previously asked for a list of vacancies throughout the organization. Uh, and so staff has provided in attachment A the vacancies by department, just as a reference for the uh, committee members as we go through the agendas over the next couple of days. Uh, one thing to note on this, it does have the vacancy date, how the positions are funded, as well as um, if they're italicized, it means that there's some sort of backfill. Someone's working out of class, we're doing extra overtime, we are hiring a contractor, uh, et cetera. Uh, so even though the position may not be filled, uh, we have allocated or changed our resources or added resources to, to backfill for that role. Um, and I think with that, that is most of the housekeeping items. So sure. maybe we'll take a pause before we move to non-departmental. Any questions, housekeeping, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. could we just take two minutes to read this? Sure. Is that all right? Of course.
Yes, ready? Right. Yep. One or two quick questions. Um, speaking of CIPs, do we have any like longitudinal data on the number of CIPs in the budget year over year? Like I know we have a rolling five-year cycle, but I'm just wondering, you know, in 1996, what was the budget there, and how many? Uh, I'm just choosing a date and time, and, and you know how many projects we had in the CIP. Is it an ever-increasing bucket? I, I don't have those numbers on hand. I do have the last two five-year cycles of how many total projects we had. So, for example, in the 1923 CIP, we had 218 projects. And then the five-year cycle before that, we had 213. If we needed to go back further, we could put together that data, but we haven't been tracking that from a... Yeah, I actually think the number of projects may be less relevant than the dollars because to a certain extent the number, the segmentation of the individual projects can be somewhat arbitrary based on, you know, whatever, however it's defined for the purpose of the delivery of the project. So we could have a one project that's a public safety building or another that's a line replacement. So on the, um, <clears throat> on the open position list, Colleen, Ed, I, is there going to be a time where we're going to talk about this, or is now a good time? About the vacancies? Yeah, in general. I mean, so there are quite a few that are being covered through other means, so mm -hmm. which begs the question, like, should they remain open? I guess it varies probably position by position, whether it's kind of long-term, outsourced, or covered some other way. I actually think it might be most productive to talk about that when the departments are here. And so, for example, when we, after we go through the overview on utilities, uh, to speak to the utilities vacancies uh, and in turn do that with each one if you find that uh, useful. Okay. Because there are relatively few that are not italicized. Exactly. Right. I mean, that's the general practice is that vacancies occur if there are people who would step up on an interim basis to fill in. Uh, that that's done, and um, based on that, either a recruitment would proceed or, as in some cases, it's also a succession strategy uh, to have someone um, operate in a, in a higher capacity. Okay. So, again, th they can vary, and so if any of these are in general terms, um, you'd like to discuss it, then having the department here would be useful. Okay. And then separate topic on the five-year capital plan. Um, obviously, we're talking a lot about grade steps, for example. When would we start to put dollars into a future years for, for some of these items? Right now, and let's see, oops, uh, uh, Paul, you can speak to our local funds, but, uh, you know, obviously we're working with VTA in particular as a primary funding source, uh, as well as uh, going after any grant programs that are available to be able to put placeholder dollars in, uh, recognizing that these are all pre-construction dollars, and uh, the real uh, funding need will be once we have uh, construction uh, concepts and um, being able to move on design and environmental on, on the specifics. So I expect that it will probably be a year or so before we can have, um, you know, really kind of a financial plan put together. So so for both Great Steps and Coverly, we are spending planning dollars already. Mm -hmm. How are those accounted for? Those are currently in the CIP. The they are. Correct. Okay. It's under specific specific project line items. Okay. May I? Yeah. Okay. Um, what is an overstrength position? What does that mean? Sure. Uh, it's within Ed's authority to have up to twenty what are called overstrength positions. So what those are are non budgeted positions. Um, that we find a need for. It can be anything from someone out for workers' comp reasons to um, a short-term initiative that we wanted to or need to allocate staffing for. Um, they cannot exceed two years uh, by our own personal internal policies um, and require, obviously, the city manager's approval. Um, so they are not permanent FTE, but they are part-time, not part-time, uh, limited term. Right, stop gap. Yeah, stopgap measures. Typically, if we want to pilot things, we will do it. Um, and are they their contractors, or sometimes they're our own employees, no, and we just put them in an overstrength position? Correct. They are city employees. They are on city payroll. Okay. They would receive city benefits um, and be subject to any 
uh, MOU requirements for whatever the specific classification okay. is. Okay, so it's like um, I can't come up with the phrase, but there's like a it, it's a opportunity for you to flex, basically. Yes, yes, yes. And so the individuals themselves could come either from outside the organization or someone who decides to step into it, um, who's already in the city organization. Okay. Um, when is the time, and if now that's fine, for us to talk about the infrastructure plan, what's on hold, how it's funded? You know, it's very helpful on page two of the At Places memo that the main factor you use in this process each year is previous city council direction. So when is the time and where is the place to talk about um, sources of funding for this and what's on this list and what isn't? I'd recommend that next week's conversation about the general fund capital plan would be okay. where we would tie it in. All right, because we will have gone through each of these, right? None of that was on the on the list for today. Correct. Okay. Um, great. Thank you. Sorry, one other thing, small thing. Um, fire station numbers, not helpful to your average person. Um, map or an address or anything, like I don't know what number my fire station is. I'm sorry, I just don't. <laughs> the rest of it is helpful, um, mostly. Point out the parking garage is not exactly on California Avenue, but that's a, it's a, small, <laughs> it's a small thing. I just don't want somebody driving down California Avenue looking for that, uh, you know. Parking garage that costs uh, forty-nine million dollars and not being able to find it. Cal out business this year. Um, should we move on to the non-departmental section? Are we pretty much on schedule? Yep, you guys are doing great. So Steve Guagliardo again with the Office of Management and Budget here to talk about non-departmental now. So the general fund non-departmental budget begins on page four hundred and forty-seven of your book. Um, it includes revenue and expense appropriations that are not attributed to a specific department nor a specific function. These are things that typically benefit the city as a whole. For example, the coverly lease payments to PAUSD are budgeted here. In FY2019's adopted budget, this is also where we included the $4 million reduction as a temporary placeholder. If you see on page 448, you'll see a budget summary. A budget summary will appear in each department section and each fund section of the book. So this budget summary walks you through four years of data, FY 2017 actuals in the first column, then 2018 actuals, then the 2019 adopted budget, and the 20 proposed budget. Very often, especially in individual department sections, you'll see discrepancies between 18 actuals and 19 adopted. We talked about that a little bit in the App Places memo. Very often that happens with salary and benefits reflecting actual experience versus budgeted experience. In non-departmental, you see that the contingent accounts show that there are no expenses. That's because by practice, we don't spend directly from those contingent accounts. We actually shift them to various things. Those funds do get spent on an annual basis, and they're spent on things like memberships. They're spent on things like city events, um, and they're spent on special city council priorities. In FY 2020, there are a number of things budgeted in non-departmental that are worthy of note. Um, we have these things set up in the budget uncertainty reserve, and we can talk about those individual components as we go through the section. So on page 449, you see the same information from the budget summary 2020 proposed budget column, but instead of going left to right, we now run top to bottom. So we start with the prior year budget walk you through one-time adjustments. The 19 budget included $100,000 for city council election costs, as well as the $4 million general fund structural reduction. And then we get into base changes. Um, the transfer to infrastructure this year is increasing by $3.8 million, largely reflecting increased TOT revenues. Meanwhile, traffic and street light electricity costs are being adjusted downward by about $578,000. Then we get to the budget adjustments, which are the budget proposals. These are the things where you'll see service delivery changes in each individual department. So on page 448, you see that $2.2 million budget uncertainty reserve, and that's comprised of three elements. There's the budget operations reserve, the reserve for recruitment and retention initiatives, as well as the city council reserve of $300,000. Also in non-departmental is that transfer of $720,000 to the residential parking permit fund to cover the operating deficit. It should also be noted that this 2020 budget does also include a $50,000 ongoing structural reduction to the city manager's contingency, 
um, largely to reflect the savings necessary to meet Council's uh, pension policy update. So there's a reduction of $50,000 on an ongoing basis to the city manager's contingency. If you continue flipping through the budget book on page 450, you'll see a proposal write-up for each of those budget adjustments, going into more context and offering more detail for each of these individual items. That is present in every department and every fund. Um, it's a great place to uh, go for further reference on those things. And with that, we're open for finance committee discussion about non-departmental. Um, so I'm just reading on the recruitment and retention. There's 500K from non-departmental and 250 from the city manager's budget. Um, so that's 750,000. What could that potentially go up to, given this is one of the priorities we've kind of identified? Additional funding? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if this group or the council were to move that this should be better funded, what, what could that, what's the, the ceiling there? The first thing that I will set for context, because um, I'm sure we could spend oodles of money on, on these kind of activities given the current workforce environment that we're in, uh, is this is $750,000 of general fund support. Um, to the extent we would be working on citywide initiatives or initiatives that touch um, operations other than pure general fund, we would actually supplement this money by additional funds from enterprise. Um, funds. Right. Typically, 60-40 uh, or 50-50 split is kind of something to keep in your, the back of your mind. So we could potentially double the amount of this money uh, if we were doing citywide initiatives and were to pull in and charge the enterprise funds their fair share. With that, I will let Ed talk about how big we could balloon this program to. Well, I think, um, thank you, Kylie. The, the issue is maybe two dimensions. One is the size of the program or potential size of the program, and the other is the availability of funds to, to fund the program. I think on the first, it, this is scalable, and uh, as, as uh, we've discussed previously, uh, we would uh, take uh, the program itself and elements of the program back to council for discussion and identification of the priorities within it. It, it is definitely scalable, so I do think double or even uh, factor up from there uh, could be uh, meaningful and, and certainly used productively given the potentially significant funding necessary to address issues of not only um, whether it be commute support uh, and uh, general workplace environment uh, programs, but also there has been discussion around housing at which point order of magnitude funding I think is, is uh, potentially needed. So that's on the program side. Then on the funding available side, in general, um, any significant increase would, would take away from other priorities. Uh, there may be some uh, flexibility that you want to point out uh, that the committee could uh, have at your back pocket, both for this as well as for other uh, initiatives as we uh, or priorities as we proceed. I think Ed is potentially referring to at the end of the year, typically we have a positive balance in our general fund. At least that's our goal. Um, and so what we call that is excess BSR uh, or excess budget stabilization reserve. Uh, and so to the extent that we have that kind of additional funding at the end of the year, this committee or the council could choose to allocate that towards investing in our workforce infrastructure uh, as opposed to investing in our physical infrastructure, which historically has been where we do the transfer of funds. But with the, the new passage of the TOT um, ballot measure this past year and the potential opening of new hotels, I believe we are on more solid footing now on the infrastructure plan, so that is something that council could choose. Um, thank you for this. Um, sustainability, $100,000. I see we haven't had that before. Is that just in light of the fact we don't have a person now or? Yep, so actually that's uh, a very good question because previously there was a contingency for sustainability of $250,000. And what we're recommending in this budget is to reappropriate that through the budget process. So you're seeing the set aside of that $100,000, and then you're seeing $50,000 being put towards that sea level rise study funding in the actual budget proposal. And then there is funding from that reappropriation also included in the city manager's office for some of those sustainability activities as well. Okay. Um, so right. to your point, there is still dedicated support for sustainability funded in the city manager's office. There is a management analyst that is included there, um, and this is additional funding beyond that. Great. I'm, I'm happy to see that because just about every 
project or plan that people comes up with is going to require some some work by staff. Um, debt service goes to zero in 2020. Another good question. So it's not that the debt service is going away. It's now being treated as an operating transfer out. So you can see that that 612 goes to zero in FY 2020, but the operating transfers out increases by 538. That transfer out. Oh, I see. I see. Includes the debt service. Okay. Two layers down. Okay, great. Um, mm -hmm. um, and uh, let's see. Budget adjustment four. Budget uncertainty reserve, did I understand correctly that at the end of this process, should the Finance Committee wish to restore some of the proposed cuts, that would be the amount that we have available? Just translating here from budgetees to... Unless we change other things. Okay, but that's, but that's, the, that's what's available. Okay. Um, great, thank you. And could you explain the traffic light adjustment? Sure. So on an annual basis, the city has to pay the utilities for the cost of electricity associated with traffic and streetlights. Um, through the annual uh, calculation of that cost, the utility calculated it and realized and refined their methodology somewhat to more appropriately capture the cost that the city should be paying. So this downward reduction captures that. So is that a refund for previous overpayment? Or so it's not a refund for previous payment. What it is is the refined cost going forward. Okay. Was there overpayment then? So they applied the calculation on a prospective basis. I don't know that they've had the chance to do it on a retrospective basis. So I don't know if they've done the determination to see whether a refund would be warranted. And just to, to be clear, these are done as part of the cost of service um, analysis that's done for the utilities every year. So typically from a utility perspective, we do those COSAs on a semi-frequent basis, but we don't go retrospectively. They're all prospective. Yeah, it's just that this is a change, right, where the general fund had to start paying for streetlights. As a result of that COSA study. So the first all allocation amount to the utility was based on the original COSA study that um, was the impetus once we changed our rates. I think it was in 2017. Yeah. Um, and so then now they've done a more recent COSA study. And so based on how the operations have changed, how where their costs are now, this is the revised. Right. But because it's new, I guess, why wouldn't we consider looking retroactively? I mean, was it really just kind of more accurately billing for the usage based on nighttime rates or something? Or I mean, what, what was the change? We'd have to get the utilities folks yeah. to talk about specifically <laughs> I, what's going I would just sitting back there. I figured yeah. I would just offer to the committee that we did do an adjustment at mid year in FY 2019, reflecting this for FY 2019. So, okay. Good afternoon, Eric Keniston, uh, Utilities Rights Manager. Um, the basis that we use for the street, right, street light traffic signal is based upon, uh, is we charge them based upon the estimated usage of those services. That's always how we, how it's been calculated in the cost of service study. So. What, what, what's the basis? If the delta is half a million dollars, like what, what's the total amount? It's just when we do the reallocation based upon the, the increasing or, or changing distribution costs, the, the percentage. It, the streetlight traffic signal is a relatively fixed component. It's a fixed amount of usage running through. But with the rest of the city, when they are now using less, they end up with a, a different allocation within the cost of service basis. And the total oh. expense for this line item That's what is, I'm is it about three, three million? Do you happen to know? I don't have that in front of me. Yeah. Okay. Two. Two million? Because that's a pretty and big delta. Half yes. million is a big delta on a base of two. I think million. the, the um, other factor to consider is this also includes the cost of the commodity, right? So mm -hmm. to the extent that that cost varies, that also necessitates a change going forward, that the electricity itself um, cost fluctuates mm -hmm. some. So there's a number of factors that were, you know, it's not, it's 
uh, it's a large uh, calculation. So it's the cost of electricity, it's the staff that are also out there um, that are maintaining the streetlights, it is the commodity cost, obviously, uh, it's the um, the utility over CIP. like the CIP investments that are going on, it's the overhead of the utility itself. So just like you see as part of the utility rate presentations, what's going on in terms of the electricity uh, rates and the changes there, there are an equal number of factors associated with. So, so to that point, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and Dean as well. So if we are, as a result of vacancies in staffing, unable to do the level of proactive maintenance on traffic signals uh, or and uh, streetlights as we had originally anticipated, would that result in a res reduction in cost? It should, yes. Yeah. So, so that's a, a significant factor as well. It's basically our ability to deliver on the services also is a factor in, in this calculation. All right, thank you for that. Can we talk just a little bit about the, the $4 million from last year um, and just kind of go into that and kind of where we are for this year? Sure. I think Steve will take the first track of that. Yeah, happily. So the FY 2019 budget included a $4 million reduction in non-departmental, and that was a placeholder while the organization went through and assessed where those reductions could be realized to make that contribution to proactively fund the city's long-term pension liability. Through the fall, Finance Committee and subsequently City Council actually adopted the policy to include that lower discount rate of 6.2% in our pension calculations. So when we developed the base budget through long range and when we developed the 2020 budget, we incorporated that direction. Um, that cost $3.8 million in the general fund alone, and so that is budgeted on an ongoing basis now. So that $4 million you see being restored to the budget reflects the restoration of that one-time action reduction. Meanwhile, in every single department section through this book, you will see an increased pension cost. That includes not only the CalPERS dictated pension cost, but also the council directed pension cost. So a couple, couple of quick questions. So for this year, we're at 3.8, not 4 million, is that correct? That's correct. And why not? Go to the four. <laughs> and so I think it's, it's a valid question, and it's one that's come up at Finance Committee before. The, the $4 million was calculated at the time um, as part of an analysis looking at what the rough cost would be to use a lower discount rate for normal cost and the UAL. Um, as we refined our methodology for that, and as we incorporated Council's direction for 6.2, there were a couple of other things happening in parallel. CalPERS used to have a discount rate of 7.5%. So the baseline pension cost was higher, or was lower, excuse me, as a result of that. And so the gap was greater. Now, CalPERS has already started to lower their discount rate somewhat. So the FY 2020 budget reflects part of that lower discount rate of 7.25%. So the gap has shrunk a little bit. So there's not as much of a need to make up as much ground to still cover the same exposure that the city may face. And then if I, if I remember right, Council or the Finance Committee last year was talking about a total of an $8 million reduction eventually, right? And we were doing the first $4 million. Um, so what's the thoughts on kind of an additional $4 million? I mean, we, the $4 million sure. covered the normal cost, is that correct? Yeah. So um, to take the, the conversation a little bit further, the Finance Committee did do this $4 million based on the more conservative normal cost rate, and then subsequent to that, the full council adopted that 6.2 lower discount rate. Um, and as Steve alluded to, there are a number of reasons why that $4 million number is going to change on any given year. It's also based on as we reduce our headcount, your normal costs are going to go down because you don't have as much salary on the books, potentially. So there's a number of factors that are going on, or positions, I'm sorry, as part of that. Now, the second tier of this is do that the Finance Committee discussed last year is do we want to reassess our unfunded liability payments assuming a lower discount rate, meaning we don't think CalPERS will achieve the 7% discount rate over the next 30 years, so we want to lower that and pay, make sure that we can pay off that mortgage payment, so to speak. Um, the, it was too much to bite off in one year, uh, and as the team has gone through this first $4 million this year. I, I think they will validate that statement. Um, and the council nor the committee have taken action on how we want to specifically deal with the unfunded liability payments. Um, we've talked about that as a committee uh, last year, I think, was the most recent time. 
um, and how we wanted to create some sort of policy once we accomplish this, four, this first four million to figure out how we want to deal with the latter portion. Um, and the reason why we wanted to punt on that is um, to an extent you potentially start to double count in terms of your contributions if you make these wild swings in our um, assumptions. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we kind of had a little bit of time and space to experience what the calculations look like when we implemented the normal cost portion first. And then let's revisit after that what does it look like to deal with the unfunded liability. Uh, so uh, I think another way to think about it is we, uh, former chair and current mayor Phil Sepp would say, we've stopped digging the hole as our current payroll is processing every two weeks but we still need to come back and figure out how we want to deal with the, the hole that's already been dug, um, so to speak. Yeah. And so that's the, the forward-looking piece of it. So I think it's worth a little bit of discussion. I mean, this might be an item that we'd want to uh, request for additional follow-up and maybe have council refer back to Finance Committee post-budget. So it is actually on the finance committees. It is an outstanding referral um, to establish a pension policy um, on the finance committee's work plan, and so it would Right now, I think staff is anticipating it comes back within the calendar year. Okay. And I, I think when we started this, when I was on finance last, um, what we thought of is the FY 2019 kind of placeholder was, was a mechanism to get us to account for that $4 million, which we did with one-time changes, right? This year, it's distributed across the different funds. We're going to do it structurally, hopefully. Um, and then I think the mayor's theory was, you know, quarter turn the time, next year or the year after, we can do the other four million for the unfunded pension and retiree health care. And, you know, maybe we do it as a placeholder at first and then structurally again. That's roughly the theory I understood. Hopefully that will come back to us relatively soon, uh, definitely this year for discussion. Um, I'm certainly supportive of us continuing to look at um, how to make more progress going forward. Um, am I not also right that in addition to the, the $4 million, which is now the $3.8 million, we've also um, flowed this through the enterprise funds, which was not done last year. Is that correct? That is correct. It so is. it's not like we just, I mean, we've done, we've gone two steps ahead from last year, which was here's a plug and you know, frankly, as someone on the outside, it looked like we kind of grew our way out of <laughs> um, making cuts last year. Um, so I just want to recognize that we're doing it not only in the general fund, but also in the enterprise funds. Yes, okay. And then, you know, I, I, I second Chair Du Bois's um, comment that um, uh, we do need to look at this and figure out how to, how to do it going forward. Um, and absolutely, this is something we need you know, a, a report on <laughs> a policy. Um, I, I don't want us to be making, um, you know, decisions of this magnitude without more information. So I look forward to that. Um, absolutely, we have to, to refill the hole. So I would be willing to tentatively approve this non-departmental budget. The one question I guess I have for you two is, are we interested in parking lotting the reserve for recruitment and retention as, a, as something we may put some more money against going forward? Or do you think this is a good enough level right now? Personally, I think it's good enough for now. I think that plan will come back to council and could be handled as a Okay, at uh, council, yeah. So is that okay for the city manager? It may come back to council, and yes. if council wants to throw more money at it, okay. All right, uh, then I'll tentatively move this budget. Second. And I'd say let's not throw money. Let's carefully consider it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. But, okay. So, I think we're all in favor. So. We are 15 minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> Good job. Yes, so next we'll move on to item two, which um, are all of our utility funds. So I think Dean and his team <laughs> are going to, to come help us walk through this. Um, so there's a second packet of presentations at your places. It has windmills on it. Um, and woven into this presentation will also be the um, CMRs, which you should have received as part of your packet for today's yep. um, item. If you need a copy of those, let me know. All right. So welcome to our new head of utilities. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So, Dean, welcome. And uh, whenever you got ready to get started. Du Bois, council members. Uh, we're trying to get it together here real quick. There is uh, two B is the fiber fund to C little I will be your gas um, one. So there's two CMRs um, that you should see. So the electric is CMR 10217 and the uh, gas CMR is 10255. You should also have a PowerPoint at your places with windmills. And you should also have both your operating and capital budgets. <laughs> and with that, I think I will turn it over to Alexandra Harris with the budget office who will kick off the presentation. Um, and it'll, they'll weave in everyone's presentations from there. Alex? All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon. I am Alexandra Harris with the Office of Management and Budget. For this next section, we will go over the utilities department. As part of this agenda item, utilities spans both operating and capital budgets. The pages within the operating and capital budget books for utilities are listed on the slide. The City of Palo Alto is unique in that it offers a full suite of utilities in addition to all the other services it provides. I will now turn over the presentation to Dean Batchelor, the Director of the Utilities Department, to tell us a little bit more about this. Great. Thanks, Alex. So good afternoon, Chair Du Bois, Council Members. So uh, before I go into a little bit of the presentation, I just um, wanted to make this statement about the utilities, um, and I'll go and talk about these next slide portions of it. So the City of Palo Alto Utilities rates are based on costs that are needed to provide safe, reliable, environmental, sustainable services to our customers. Um, the American Society of Engineers just released its infrastructure um, report card to the California, and it reminded us how forward-looking our community um, to infrastructure investments is. Our agencies are just beginning to reach sustainable rates in the water and the gas and wastewater main replacements. Well, Palo Alto has maintained its um, sustainable rates in um, decades. It's paid off in lower rates and safer and more reliable systems. The, we invest in the safety. We inspect our gas lines and repair leaks more frequently than PG&E and have for a long time. We're the, one of the first agencies in the state to investigate um, gas bore um, intrusion lines. So that's our cross board program. I'll go back into that a little bit further into the presentation. We continue to invest in re, um, resiliency. The Hetch Hetchy system has been upgraded to meet the 24-hour service and restoration goals to case, case the major earthquakes and working hard to establish the second transmission connection in the city. The cost of the safe, reliable system has been increased and construction costs have doubled in the last 10 years. We've seen this going through most of our projects and we're recognizing the need for more annual investments as we're starting to see our assets coming to the end of life. Many of our suppliers are making these same investments in asset replacements. For example, PG&E is um, looking at their gas and electric transmission costs that are increasing in recent years. And then the Hetch Hetchy system that was just rebuilt on the bottom half of the Hetch Hetchy, and they're going to start building the top half um, as the coming years will come, which in turn has unfortunately increased our commodity costs. Um, all these cost increase have led to an upward pressure of customer bills. We're pushing ourselves to do more control costs. And this is one of the priorities in the coming year. Some things have been achieved recently, including the gas prepaid um, deal, which has been saving the customers about a million dollars a year in our gas rates. I'll go into that a little bit more, too. And then advocating with the CPUC and the FERC, which is the Federal Agency Regulatory Commission, through our business partners, NCPA um, and others, have hold down the rate increases in the gas and electric transmission costs. So while these costs are increasing, 
they're also not increasing as much as some of the other areas that and some of the utilities have been. Though all of this, we went through and continue to enhance our sustainabilities of services that we provide. We're looking for ways to maintain our low carbon electric supply and do it at a lower cost. We're also working on how we can step up to support our community sustainability goals, including vehicle and building electrification, and focusing on mostly efficient ways to achieve the biggest carbon reductions. This is gonna be the important focus in our coming years. So as I, as I talked a little bit about this, as we go into this, these slides, there's two slides here. Um, Um, this first slide is basically just a slide to kind of break it down by what our expenditures are, looking at um, where the biggest pieces are. So our commodities is about 50% um, of our costs. And then as we go into it, it's into the business operation costs, um, which is included in that is some of our admin, some of our equity um, transfers into the general fund, also um, costs going into other departments for allocated charges that we go through. And then the lar next largest one is our CIPs. So our CIPs, this is, again, this is all of all the funds that are falling into this portion of it. And the reason why we broke it out this way is because here's how it really looks like. And it's very difficult to look at it from a funding source. But this is the breakup of how each of these commodities look and how it was broken down. So going on, onto this and looking at some of our highlights that we wanted to really kind of talk about as was the university infrastructure improvements. As you all know, it's been a challenging um, year and a half um, with um, putting in this, it's basically about 2,700 linear feet um, of water and um, gas lines, placing all the services within on university and then the surrounding areas. <coughs> it was another um, CIP, but there was almost four miles worth of water main and gas mains that were replaced in the outer line areas in the downtown. So it was very congested during this period of time. We are at the last legs, um, fortunately, at this period of time. Um, our contractor uh, was working, uh, the plan was to work um, and hopefully be done by today um, with all the paving. But unfortunately, with the rains that came, we had to push it off. So. Um, It'll be probably, we'll have to, uh, it's another two week delay. I, is that correct? Yeah. About two more weeks that we'll get the um, contractor to come back in. And then the plan is then um, right after the holidays, um, it's gonna have to sit, the paving has to sit and cure for about seven days and then the striping will come into place. Striping will be done during the daytime. So we'll have this until probably, I guess until I'd say middle of June. And then we'll be completely done with the, the project at that period of time. So um, again, it was about a year and a half's worth of time of project. You know, we collaborated with other departments, the transportation group, public works group, our attorneys group, um, and then um, of course then our engineering groups um, from public works and um, utilities. And then um, sewer sanitation replacement, again, another collaborative uh, portion of it. Not as big, about 700 feet um, of uh, wastewater. But the big thing about this was is that that line needed to be moved. Otherwise, the junior uh, museum went, or uh, junior, uh, uh, yeah, museum zoo would not get a chance to be built at this period of time because it was in the easement area. When we wanted to expand, it would have been right on top of the sewer line. So we moved that 700 feet and we uh, rejoined it and we were able to get the construction work down on time. And then <coughs> a little bit about the underground districts 46 and 47. So 46 is basically East Charleston to El Camino. And most of the majority of the electric work has been completed in that, in that phase. And then the other one, 47, is Middlefield, Homer to Webster to Addison. And we're waiting for some customers to um, wanting to make that conversion portion of it. So uh, there's about a handful of customers that have not made the conversion, they're, they're gonna hold out. Um, we're still trying to work with them, um, but it's holding up the projects. 46 and 47 are tied together. Um, so we are working diligently to work with them. Uh, we've got our attorney's office involved as well with that, and hopefully we'll come to some resolution on that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit about the cross-board safety inspection. There will be a report that will be coming to you shortly. 
um, around La Crosse Bore, about a million dollars um, of doing this work in the second phase. Um, and then at that point, we'll probably put it out one more time um, and after this, and that should conclude the, uh, the phases of getting through the rest of the, about the 10,000 services that we need to take a look at. Um, upgrade on, online is basically what we're doing is, is that we're in the process of redoing our utility account um, to our new um, My CPU account um, portal. Um, we're looking forward to that. Um, our portal is, is fairly old. It's, it, we've heard it from our customers. We're looking forward to doing that. It'll be done here probably within the next um, four to five months, I would guess. We'll be testing it, and then we'll go live on that. Colorado Power Station, we had a bad transformer, um, which is one of our main transformers, at the cost of a tune of about a million dollars. Um, we have three, so there's actually one spare that sits in there that, um, that we were able to move. And so we can run the system on the two, but uh, we are in the process of replacing that, that one there. And the last thing is the Corte Madera Reservoir replacement. So one of the things that I've been talking to all of you and, and to council about is, is that, you know, what do we do with our reservoirs? We're at our last legs of our life of our reservoirs. Should we replace them? Should we wrap them one more time? Should we do some maintenance work that maybe lasts for another seven years and at that point we're going to have to replace it anyway? And that's it at the tune of about a million and a half where it looks like we're out um, looking at trying to find out what those costs look like. We think the estimated is somewhere between two and two and a half million dollars. So we think that we're probably replacing it is probably the best way. Um, these reservoirs have been up there 60, 70 years. So it's probably time for it to, to look at it to do that. <coughs> and then a little bit on the gas uh, prepay. So we use our tax exempt um, status and we're able to get through a muni um, through that we get this gas prepaid. Um, and what it does is it allows us to do that and we're able to save the customers about a million dollars a year on an annual basis. It's been in place for a couple years now. And then just the Western Hydro contract. We've had some contracts um, talks around this that we know that we have to do something with this by 2024. It's about ready to um, expire. We're in the process working with NCPA and other agencies on how this is going to look. And we are going to look to see if, if it really makes sense for us to take as much as we take today. Because the problem is, is that contract goes into place, it's going to be a 30-year contract. And if prices continue to spike, what are we going to do with it at that period of time? So it's something that we're looking at hard. And then we continue to invest in our succession planning of our 257 employees. Um, as you well know, as uh, uh, last year when you passed the um, strategic plan, it talked about workforce. And within that was around the succession planning pieces that we're doing and we're working with our employees. So that's it. Do you have any questions on that section? Nope. I just have, I have a couple quick ones. Sure. So, um, I'm sorry, Kylie, do you want to go through the whole thing and then do this? That's totally, that's your okay. call, Jay. Thanks. Um, you said the crossword is going to come to us. Um, I, so I'm just curious how, how we're going to know if, if the quality is happening as we go along. So the idea was is that I know that, you know, that's one of the things that we talked about in the past, you know, is that is, is the quality um, and is everything getting done and then you find out about it years later that it really wasn't done. So one of the things that we thought we would do is that um, we will go ahead and we'll give you an update on a six month basis on how what's been completed, what our challenges have been, does it seem like it's going to be better and it could be just an informational or if it's something essential, then we'll come back and we'll actually have an action item and we'll come back. But what our idea was is to actually come back to within about six months after the contractor starts. And something like a big hydro contract, do we negotiate that ourselves or are we basically piggyback, piggybacking on uh, like other people's negotiations? So we piggyback because, it, you know, it's, it's a contract that's throughout through NCPA as well as the other agencies. And so we, it's one big large contract for everybody. And then you take percentage of whatever your agency would want yep. out of that. So our decisions think, rather we just want to participate or not participate. I think rather than uh, piggyback, the better analogy might be more, in, in fact it is, a joint powers authority. So right. we are a partner uh, with uh, the Northern California Power Agency that with other municipal um, electric utilities are representing us uh, in uh, discussions with uh, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation. And then just uh, ballpark, like in terms of staffing and, and retention, like uh, how, 
what kind of what percentage of your workforce is nearing retirement age, and I guess how much how much of your time personally are you spending on planning for recruiting and ret retention? So I think right now is that we look at that there's about a good um, coming in this coming year. At the end of this year, we're looking at about a 22 percent or so that are coming. Um, are eligible are going to be eligible at by year end so it is one of the keys to look at um, as you um, saw in the early report you know there's about 20, 28 openings approximately right now at this period of time it's down from 42 um, and we think that um, looking at working with HR um, or on the recruitment um, and then also looking at the increase in salary portion of around the line sections um, as you saw in here, there's quite a few line sections and those troublemen positions fall within that. So we're hoping that, you know, that will help us in the recruitment. Right now also too is that we also have a contract out um, for a contractor that will come in to supplement some of our maintenance work since we don't have these workers at this time, but we really are, are after trying to recruit for these positions. So it's, it's a key priority for us. Right. Seems like you're chief recruiter as yes. well. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, and along those lines, um, I think we can uh, speak with uh, Rumi when she's here for the HR um, section, but definitely uh, expect, and, and we are in discussions on some creative approaches that will be necessary in order to ensure we're not only recruiting, but recruiting in a time frame that allows uh, transfer of knowledge uh, from staff uh, that uh, will be retiring over the next year or more. All right, thank you. On this next slide, we will go over some of the major budget highlights for the utilities department. This spans multiple funds in the utilities. Some of the major highlights for the operating side changes are staffing realignments in the resource management division that were recommended as part of a service delivery evolution the department is undergoing as the city focuses on long-term sustainability goals. This will have a ongoing cost of approximately $39,000. The alignments will also help with succession planning. Additionally, recommendations were made to strategically upgrade two engineering positions that will enhance technical expertise and succession planning for engineering staff at an ongoing cost of approximately $23,000. Finally, recommendations were made to improve the Elwell Court facilities, which are rented and occupied by utility staff. These improvements fall on the responsibility of the tenant and will update the space at Elwell Court to bring it in compliance with the Americans with the Disability Act, while also making the space more functional. This action would have a one-time cost of 365000 For the Utilities Department capital projects, there were no new capital projects proposed for fiscal year 2020. However, a new construction schedule was recommended to better align the capital workload with staffing resources and help smooth out rate increases affected by capital needs. Now, we will shift our focus to the recommended utilities rate schedule changes. The CMRs for these utilities rate changes were distributed as part of the Finance Committee packet for today's meeting. It is these reports that Eric Keniston from the Utilities Department will reference in the remaining slides, which I will now hand over to Eric to present. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Um, so today we're bringing to you the last two of the uh, rate increase proposals. Uh, earlier in the month, last month, we brought to you the water and wastewater collection. This tonight we'll be bringing the electric and gas. So, so this is a much truncated presentation. Um, we have obviously the full presentations are, are in the background. We can uh, delve into those. Um, if you wish, but for today, um, here's the recommendation. If you would like me to read it, I can, but or I can skip. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I think one of the big highlights here are that uh, on the electric, 
side, the distribution related costs account for about 38% of, of the overall cost structure, 31% related to operations, 7% um, related to capital investment. The other roughly 60% is, is all related to the supply side. And the areas that we're seeing the biggest increases in are on the transmission, that 14%. That's an ever-growing piece of the pie and as well as our operations and capital investment side. So when we're talking about the proposed rate increase, we're looking at a system-wide 8% uh, rate increase. Uh, it's very slightly depending on various customer classes, but the general rationale for why, what, why we're increasing rates, about half of it is related to those uh, supply transmission related cost increases. About 1.4% is related to operation cost increases, which also does um, includes the cost for us to go out and get a uh, temporary line crew uh, on contract. 1% is related to roughly CIP expense increases. And two items that we've not really talked a lot about a lot in the past, but we thought were important to bring up, 0.8% um, existing revenue shortfall. Currently, in the electric fund, we're only collecting our revenues are about 90% of our overall expenses. So we you know, and our reserve positions are relatively low. Um, our distribution and supply funds are, are near the lower end of the spectrum. We had to go out and get, uh, borrow $10 million from the electric special projects reserve to help uh, boost up some of our operations reserves. We'd like to be able to pay that back. In addition, our hydro stabilization reserve is going to be sitting at about $7.4 million. We'd like to have something closer to about 19 million in there um, based upon reserve guidelines. So we would like, you know, we're recommending this rate increase to, for the overall fiscal health of the utility. But one of the other factors that's uh, kind of fighting against us is that 0.4% of load loss. One of the things that we've noticed in the last few years is that uh, usage, especially in the commercial sector, has been declining steadily and uh, it's it's a trend that we've noticed and we're not we're not wholly sure how long it will continue we're hoping it will level off but it is unfortunately the a factor where we have increasing distribution relatively fixed costs and we're spreading them over fewer and fewer units so with that that's the that's the recommendation for the overall eight percent rate increase and I can rest here for questions or move on for do you have any questions? Are we just doing electric rates right now? We're just discussing electric rates. This is strictly okay, just. Okay, so that's 10217? Correct. So I do have just a couple yeah. questions. Um, so um, thanks for mentioning the reserves. Um, it is a little concerning on page six, you know, just to, to read about those. So um, <laughs> hmm? how, 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 what is the risk essentially that we're taking by having them at, at this lower level? So. There's always the risks that you, there's, I believe it's actually in the financial plan, we outline a whole series of potential risks for each individual um, area. But the major ones are if there's a, uh, a big spike, if we were to get into another drought situation and we needed to go out and purchase power at market, we would be exposed on that side, whatever we don't have in the hydro stabilization reserve, we'd then need to start tapping the operations reserve. Um, on the distribution side, uh, one of your major risks are one-time cost increases, uh, uh, CIP cost overruns. And the other big factor that, like I said, wasn't really as big of a influence on the electric fund for many years, but the decreasing load loss as we continue to, to use less. If our sales continue to decline at 2 3% per year, then um, that's just, if we're continuing to spend, we're not collecting enough to even maintain at existing levels. And like I said, our revenues are only 90% of our existing costs, so it's just an additional risk to that, that we're eating out of operations. And how concerned do you think we should be about that risk? If we continue, if we can, if we can raise rates with the path and pattern that we have uh, outlined, I think we'll be okay. Where okay. The, the goal is to get ourselves up to where uh, at least revenues are at cost within the next two, one to two years, and then we are going to have to uh, look at having a few years where ideally revenues are above, so that we can feed those uh, additional reserves. 
we always hope that with uh, good hydro conditions that we might be able to, the cost may come down, um, but we won't know that until it happens, essentially, so. Okay, thank you. Um, on page three, um, so I guess in 2017, council authorized some proposals, transfers that were not performed. Can Correct. you tell us why they weren't performed? Um, it was a, I'll admit a, possibly a snafu on my part. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, um, we discussed the transfers within the body of the financial plan themselves, mm -hmm. but it was not specifically called out in the resolution that so it was a procedural error, and we are okay. clarifying that. Okay, so no, no worries. Thanks, thanks for letting me know that. Um, and then the other thing is there are some tables in here that have something I don't understand. Um, we can use page seven as example. There's summer energy and there's summer demand, and I confess I don't know what those are and how I should think about that. Summer energy and summer demand for the commercial customers. Yes. Yes. So for large commercial customers, we bill on two different. We bill them on a seasonal basis. So for six months of summer, they get one set of rates. For six months of winter, they get another. Um, we also bill them uh, based on uh, how to describe demand versus KWH. I think we all understand because it's the flow through. But that maximum one-time hit, if they turn everything all at once, and sort of like if you turn a hairdryer on. Your lights dim. It's that demand. I don't dry peak. my hair, but I know, well, I know yes, that that well. works. But um, <laughs> but it's that train. We need to have the system sized up enough, transformers, everything, to be able to handle those instantaneous like maximum, throughput, uh, maximum capacity okay. at a short term. And so that's what the demand charges seek to recover. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, so what, what's the status of the second transmission system connection and do we have any options if Stanford doesn't want to do it? So um, I personally had a, um, and myself and the electric um, engineer manager had a meeting with Stanford this past or on G in January to talk about where they are with this and um, it's my personal feeling is, is that right now is that Stanford is looking to possibly become their own energy provider themselves and get away from PG&E. Um, so they told us that, you know, that this is being hung up in their legal um, system portion of it right now from Stanford. And that uh, we were going to be giving um, an update on what's going on on a quarterly basis. So um, in April, I contacted them again. Um, they basically had told us um, it's the same thing. It's still stuck in their legal department. Ed and I have had recent conversations about this that um, we're going to go back and um, make an appointment in June um, with them and then basically tell them we need to move on. Uh, we, we as the city need to move on and come up with a different um, plan. And um, it doesn't seem in, in Ed and our opinion that they really are working towards trying to get the second transmission and it's, you know, that's a stalling and on their side. Now maybe they are, they are really truly looking at um, doing their own electric. Um, but we will look at the other options, and we do have other options. We can go directly to with PG&E. Um, there's some other line. Uh, one of the reasons that we wanted to go through the Stanford portion of it is to go with a higher voltage. You get a less of an increase cost for your transmission cost, but we'll have to probably end up going with a lower um, lower voltage, and it may cost us a little bit more, but we can go directly with PG&E and then go through Cal ISO to get it scheduled as a project. Would that always be used if it was there, or would it only would it be like a backup? It'd be mostly for a backup portion of it. I mean, we 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 could use it with. There are times that we want to take the like Colorado down. We would be able then to take out the main um, substation at that point and run it off the backup portion of it. But it's mostly there for insurance. Right. Thank you. So I'm wondering if we should uh, go ahead and get the motion on the rates and then maybe take, take a break. Sure. I'm happy um, to make a motion tentatively approving the electric rates. Up to the full staff recommendation? Yes. <laughs> That's it. I'll, I'll second that. <laughs> Then shall we vote for it? Yes. Fine. Okay, great. Um, and actually, just one clarification. You don't have to tentatively approve this one since it is a separate CMR if you just want to 
recommend it, then it'll yeah. go to full council and we won't bring it back to the budget wrap up here. Okay, then I will recommend approval. Thank yes. you. So I think we approve that. <laughs> Thank okay. You. Um, and we're ahead of schedule, great. right? Yeah, should we go ahead and just, is that okay with everybody? Uh, sure. Councilmember Fine had a business call and we're just going to take a break here. So we can be in at 3.15. Great. Okay. Thank you.
Okay. 314, we're going to resume. Moving on to the utility advisory recommendation for gas. Again, another long recommendation sequence. Um, on the gas side, we have, it, it's a little bit opposite from, from the electric side. So here, the distribution costs add up to about 65% of the overall. Um, about half is related to straight operations, which is the, the maintenance of the existing uh, pipes in the ground, billing, customer service administration. Um, about 14% is related to capital uh, improvement. And the other 35 is related to supply-related costs. And you see those have asterisks next to them. Those are all currently done as mar market pass-throughs. So gas supply, that changes every month. Um, we reflect it as of the uh, pg e bid week price. Um, we'll change that on the first of every month. Gas environmental costs, cap and trade uh, related expenses mainly, those uh, don't fluctuate nearly as much, but they will increase annually as, as the, the price in the market changes there for allowances. And gas transmission costs, that's also direct pass-through. Uh, that is on a gas wholesale schedule, um, which is assessed to us by PG&E. So. so when it comes to the gas proposal that we're bringing for you today, the overall rate increase is about a 5% uh, on an aggregate bill or for the aggregate for the utility. Of that, 2.8% is related to CIP-related increases. About 2% of it is related to O&M expense increases, and we do have that other sliver out there for uh, projected loan loss. Now, again, when we talk about um, gas rate increases, it's a, those are getting back to that prior slide of what's, in, what's done in asterisks, we don't uh, know from like any given month what those costs are going to be. So we hold, for purposes of budget and projection, we hold those costs static or assume them to be sta uh, static. And what we're all we're changing here is just the strictly the distribution related portion of the rates. So just to clarify that. And any questions you may have related to gas? I welcome. Just one quick one. It seems like operational costs are a bigger portion here than some of the other utility cost structures. And I'm just wondering if you can just tell us why. As to why they're, why they're a larger portion? Yeah. Um, Offhand, I can't say exactly why they're they're just a larger portion of the pie. Um, when we do when we do a lot more in the way of uh, inspection um, uh, on the gas side than we do say on the on the electric side, so that yeah. does a more intensive process, okay. uh, and we have a smaller system. So, so one of one of the keys in this um, operational cost is the cross board. So the cross board is not a CIP fund because, you know, it's just we're going to go back out and maintain and clean up these pipes. So we're, the monies that we have um, have allocated towards it actually goes into the operational budget. Mm -hmm. So that's part of that co higher cost of the operation. And there's a couple other little projects like that where we've actually, it actually goes to the O&M side instead of actually thinking about what a co CIP. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've discussed these at length um, before. Um, and we probably don't need to rehash all of that. Um, I just did want to talk about um, page 23 and the long-term outlook. Um, um, I'm, I, am, I am happy to see that um, one of our major goals around climate change and sustainability is reflected here. Um, and I think staff's done a great job of saying that um, you know, uh, extensive electrification of gas using appliances is necessary. I, I just want to highlight that, and I'm glad to see that um, we're already thinking ahead about this. If if we could accelerate that, um, that's that's actually something that I would be interested in understanding uh, what that looks like, what are the impacts. Um, because I think when, you know, when we went over things um, a couple weeks ago at the um, annual Earth Day presentation, I mean, the math suggests that even if all, you know, vehicles were electrified, we'd still have um, a problem to achieve our goals. So 
I just want to highlight that this is something on the long run um, that I'm interested in us moving more quickly on. There's no other questions. I'll go ahead and move the staff motion to uh, recommend these fees to the city council. Second. <laughs> What's that? Oh, we voted on um, electric while you were gone. <laughs> Right. Uh, you can let uh, Vice Mayor Fine have it. So That's all in fine. favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. So with that motion, um, I think we're just at still item number two, but we're on the operating and capital budgets for all of the utility funds. So that would be the electric fund, the fiber fund, the gas fund, the wastewater collection fund, and the water fund. So any questions or discussion the committee wants to have? Operating and capital? Operating and capital on those. I, yeah. So did staff want to highlight anything or just? dive into questions uh, we can dive into questions the highlights from staff of the transactions that are going on in these funds we've put back up on the PowerPoint slide for the committee's review but from a presentation perspective we've already gone through the, the major edits either of you have any Questions? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Jump in. All righty. I don't know if we have this in any. Um, I just did in the order from before. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, electric operating, um, you know, I know we talked about it earlier, but I just want everyone who's listening to understand if we look at the, you know, the 1.6 million delta in the pension, um, that that's going to be everywhere. <laughs> Anybody in the audience who's actually, you know, not not here for utilities will we'll be seeing that everywhere and it's um, it's pretty extensive and certainly has come up in other conversations on other parts of the budget as ever, it just, just jumps out at everybody so I just mentioned that um, okay wood poles so interesting um, so we get reimbursed like 10% of the cost is that right just if I'm trying to match what we spend on it and what we don't that's capital 342 and um, 344 we're spending $1.5 million a year, wood poles. Right. Okay. So, yeah, so we share that cost. You know, AT&T and Comcast pay a portion of the poll. Um, our actual, so we actually get monies back from that section of poll that they actually lease from us. Okay. So it's a joint poll with, with that. Okay. Great. And I, in general, very happy to see in so many places real consistency. Um, I think backward looking, maybe this is just hopeful budgeting, but backward looking sometimes things are lumpy and it looks like consistently, certainly throughout the utilities section, um, where there's an ongoing process, we're putting in the same amount here going forward and, you know, sort of a averaging out things. Um, so EL16003 on security, um, that should be in the capital budget, 344. Um, did substation. you just want to talk a little bit about the substation, substation security? security? So about three years ago, we had actually a consultant come on board um, to take a look at, um, so we have nine substations throughout the system, to take a look at it to see um, what is actually what our security risks really truly are. So the majority of the substations actually have cameras and lights interior um, in the substation itself. So we are asking basically to increase the budget to about $700,000 this year um, because we're moving forward on some of the recommendations that is looking at replacing some of the old fencing portion of it. Some of it is the larger fencing that you can actually climb to the smaller fencing that you can't actually get through. Um, we had some breaks actually that we replaced um, with that in the substations. The other thing is, is that um, one of the recommendations is, is to look at from some external lighting some large external lighting. Um, we're a little cautious to take that, um, and the reason for that is is that some of the substations canopy is there's a lot of trees around those areas, and you know as some of these substations are, they're in the residential areas as they stand. So we are kind of balancing what that really truly means about 
looking at exterior lights and trimming some of these large trees. Um, with the, some of the trees are actually hanging over the top into the substation. Mm -hmm. We know that we'll have to trim those larger limbs off, but how much do we remove to the outside? Um, some of the tree trunks are very close to the fence lines. Um, so, but again, we're reevaluating some of these. Um, and then we're so looking at this external external lighting portions of it and more security cameras um, as we move forward. So that this is a big push as into this next year as well as in 21. Yeah, great. Um, thank you very much for the color coded map. Makes it so much easier to understand what's going on where. Um, so page 368. Zoom. I'm in capital still, but hard to know. So which page? Down. Um, I'm assuming this spike here was in 19 was related to the downtown upgrade, and that's why we go down in 20. BL98003. Yeah, page 368. Is that what that was? Yes, that, okay. that is correct. Okay, great. Um, uh, page 360 and 374. I, I did not follow the difference between EL15000 and EL20000. Don't know what they, the difference is between those, 360 and 374. They both had to do with the Hopkins substation. I mean, They just, I'm sure it's EL15000 and EL20000. Good afternoon. Uh, Debbie Lloyd, um, Acting Assistant Director for Engineering. Um, so 374 is um, part of the 4 to 12 kV conversion, um, that project there. And I believe 360, we're at... Um, this is general um, system improvements. Um, so that's just, it's separate from the 4 to 12 kV okay. conversion program. Okay, great. Thank you. Just a little hard for a non-electrician not to, under to understand that. <laughs> um, I had a general question because we're rebuilding so many underground districts. And I know this is always a hot topic for people. Um, do we have a sense if there are higher failure rates um, or it's, I'm just interested in understanding as we start spending money to rebuild underground districts, that expenses shared by all rate payers, correct? So I just want a better understanding of, you know, is that, is that an ongoing cost that is different from, from the other districts? Go ahead. Oh, Go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I was... Relocating, but um, you're asking about the underground district. Yeah, because yes. there's so many of those projects, yes. and mm -hmm. you know they're nicely laid out over the course of the year. But I just want a better understanding of you know if they're. I certainly hear sometimes that it's harder to manage them. Is there a higher failure rate if it's underground, or just just interested in sort of um, so the, the general? Sure, there is a um, a shorter life um, span for the underground uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, and wires is just, uh, especially any equipment that we got undergrounded, it's a pretty inhospitable um, environment for electrical equipment. So it doesn't last as long. <clears throat> um, and when we do have issues with it, it's normally, um, it, it, it's more effort, more time to, um, to find where the faults are and then to fix them. So especially with um, undergrounded equipment and subsurface faults, they very often have to go in and um, pump any water or liquid that's in there. If there's any chance it's been contaminated, it has to be um, uh, treated as contaminated um, liquid. So it can just be a, a more time-consuming um, uh, maintenance. Okay, and what percent of customers have underground at this point in time? Uh, okay, you know, we did just recently give a report update to the UAC. Um, I think we're at, it depends what, what percentage of you're looking at. So if we look at our primary, we're about 55%. About 55% okay. of, of our um, primary wires are undergrounded versus overhead. 
Um, in terms of residential areas, um, we still have 14,000 residential are uh, still um, with the overhead wires and poles. And that's out of? So that's less than, um, significantly less than 50% of yeah. residential. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and I noticed that the oldest is, you know, would be being redone this year. So those are sort of from the 1970s. But by 2021, we get all the way up to the ones that were done in 1980. So it looks like we're sort of on an accelerated path to, you know, because um, a lot of their lifespans, it looks like. Exceeded. We, yeah, we've yeah, exceeded. So exceeded their anyway. 40 year um, lifespan. So yes, okay. there is a, um, you know, we do are replacing our underground um, districts at a much, you know, well, we have to do at a higher rate than the overhead system. Um, and yes, we are having to do those um, rebuilds while we also haven't done all of the undergrounding conversions um, that are on our books. There is some heads. risk to that schedule. That, that was uh, going to be yes. my next yes. question. Is it a, um, a sunny a projection to do it in that order? I suspect it would be. Um, well, perhaps not in order, but in terms of the um, funding available to complete uh, the rebuilds, uh, as a council member may know, uh, we're currently in discussion in one neighborhood uh, where the issue is that current standards for the rebuild uh, involve moving uh, transformers to above ground and that that's an issue of significant concern um, among the neighbors in uh, the aesthetic impact that they uh, perceive with that switch. So that's an ongoing discussion with the UAC uh, that uh, I believe will be coming to the council next month shortly. Yeah. Uh, the, and also um, along those lines, so around in, in the 90s, our standards changed. Uh, so the rebuilt, the undergrounding had started in the 60s. At that time, everything was going underground, not just the wires, but the equipment in um, subsurface vaults. Around the 90s, uh, just um, operational knowledge of this um, equipment in the field, the industry standard changed to the equipment being on pad mats. Um, so those remaining, especially residential areas that originally had everything out of sight, um, are somewhat um, perturbed by the idea of now having pad mounted equipment. Okay. Can I follow up on that real Please. quick? Yeah, so in the past I believe council was told that the lifespan was longer underground and, and that's why we started undergrounding a lot of things as well. I mean, I understand maintenance being more expensive once something breaks, but uh, can you talk a little bit about has that changed? Has the lifespan expectancies changed? We used to hear a lot about- I haven't. I used to hear a lot about storms and squirrels for overhead, you know. So. Yeah, Tom Marshall, Assistant Director for Utility Operations. So on uh, underground systems, the main issue with them is the cable life. So the older cables have a 30 to 40 year lifespan. And we've seen a number of failures on the cables <clears throat> excuse me, over the years as they reach the end of the lifespan. So you see these underground districts that we're looking at now, those are at that 30 year lifespan for the cables. So that's sort of one of the issues we have to deal with is the cables are at the end of their life, they need to be replaced. And um, I think the, the underground districts you see here are the ones that are in that time frame. So the overhead, it's really indefinite. Um, as long as the pole and the cross arms are taken care of, the, the wire can be up there for years on end, maybe 80, 90, 100, 100 okay. years or more. We do replace the poles. We do replace the poles as they deteriorate. Um, and we also treat the poles to extend the life of the poles as well. Um, and it's obviously much cheaper to rebuild the overhead as well when we come back because we don't have to come in and rebuild vaults and find places to put the pad mount. So the original undergrounding wasn't really about, um, it's really about two things. One was to improve on um, reliability. So the overhead wires are exposed to weather where the underground is not. So that was one thing. And the other thing was aesthetics, to improve the aesthetics in the neighborhoods. And that's what drove the undergrounding program, I even on the state level with pg e as well. Right. Yeah. So is the reliability a factor? Is it more reliable underground? 
So I would say yes in terms of what I, when you have a storm, you're not going to see outages typically on the underground, like in a windstorm or something like that. The, the downside with it is the lifespan, as, you, as we've talked about. You're only going to get 30 to 40 years. Some of the newer cables, we expect to get a longer life span out of the newer cables than we got out of the old. Yep. But we've done testing in the, on the cables to see uh, what condition they're in. And, you know, we found them in a condition where they're starting to deteriorate. Okay. Thank you for all that. So those yep. cables are in a conduit themselves? Like yes, the cables are pulled inside a conduit. And they deteriorate inside the conduit? Or? Yeah, it has to do with electrical stress on the, the um, insulating materials over time. It's not really the impact of like the water or, or anything on them. It's electrical stress and it's the material. And over time, the electrical stress in there breaks down the um, insulating material. Okay, thank you for that. Learn something every day. Um, okay, mm, the SCADA, SCADA, no, SCADA, third try, SCADA system upgrades. Um, is that just a reappropriation? I'm on page 399 in um, Capital. It's not, it's just sort of, we didn't do it last year, so we're moving it forward. I mean, I, I, yes, okay, great. Oh, that's easy, straightforward. Um, all right, wastewater, 526. <laughs> yeah, we're doing all this now, right? Yeah, okay. Um, So the beyond the five-year CIP horizon, <laughs> um, any concern about climate change with respect to this? Um, reducing the inflow of rainfall and groundwater into the collection system, I know that this is um, a bit of a concern, so not doing anything for five years, everyone's okay with that? I'm looking for nods or... The question is, it, it looks like we're not going to do anything for five years. There's a, there are actually a number of um, rehabilitation augmentation projects. Um, so that, that one is just one of the ones that's further, further out. out. Oh, OK. Oh, because it's right. got a number on it. Yes. OK, I got it. Uh -huh. yep. OK. So, we, yeah, we're so this is all the rest mm -hmm. of them. I guess the other question is that 2004 study um, 15 years ago, it, we're confident that it's still valid. We don't need to. Look at it again. I don't think we're scheduled to look at it again. Sylvia Santos, manager of Water Gas Wastewater Engineering. So the study we performed in 2004 was to study the capacity of the wastewater collection system, and we have addressed uh, capaci uh, capacity deficiencies already. So uh, as long as there's no major development in the city. Uh, capacity-wise, we're still okay. So we can uh, continuously to perform condition assessment. So right now we're fo focusing on the condition deficiencies. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, those were the ones I had written down here, but if I flipped through all my pages, I'm sure I'd find more. Why don't I take a pause and let, let, uh, let somebody else uh, jump? Just got one quickly. Uh, 372, the facility relocation for Caltrain modernization. Um, so we're looking at spending the lion's share of this CIP this year, obviously, because Caltrain's doing all their work. Um, is there any reimbursement from Caltrain for this if we're having to move stuff for their CalMod program? Or are we just moving it? No, we're just moving it ourselves. We, we've, we've had long conversations with Cal Caltrans about this, but, um, you know, we, they were talking about if we were finding an easement, um, then we would be able to claim it, but these are crossings there. have been in there since the early 20s. So these are things in their right of way right now, and as they do their work, we just need to move them out. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, we're, we're going to underground a few, and then we're actually going to grow the poles a little taller um, so that we can okay. get over the, the Cantonese um, terrain trestle. Okay. Vestige of a railroad that has been around for 100 plus years. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Carlos, I have a couple of questions. So <clears throat> one of the goals was accelerating EV adoption, I think, through more chargers. Um, I know we have a set up program right now for multifamily housing, but is there anything beyond that going on in terms of getting more chargers in the city? Jonathan Avenchine, Assistant Director for Utility Resource Management. Um, we're in the process of looking at a, a few different options for um, for use of our low carbon fuel standard funds. We're still in the process of doing some internal uh, studies, but we'd like to be able to spur more development with our um, with our commercial customers and find ways to increase uptake in all of our all of our classes. But you're right; at the moment, uh, the main focus of our program is the uh, the multifamily vehicle charging uh, program. So, but yes, we are thinking about how to extend that. So it would be some kind of incentive program for commercial buildings? So. Well, it may be more about uh, facilitation and assistance. We found as we talked to our, our CNI customers that they're really interested in engaging on a conversation about how to just, how to work through the technical issues around getting chargers into their parking lots. Um, so. A couple of dimensions there as well, uh, both for commercial as well as multifamily. The issue of zoning is uh, a pressing issue in that um, they're often at required parking spaces, and typically the installation of the chargers requires removal of one or two spaces. And so that's been an ongoing issue. Uh, the planning department is uh, actually had a study session with uh, PTC recently to talk about this issue and looking at some ways uh, to provide some um, balancing. Uh, of the question of when it might be acceptable to eliminate a space or two for both ADA as well as uh, the equipment necessary to, to go into retrofit existing um, uh, facilities. Yeah, I mean, I've heard, heard that issue come up. It seems like that there's some tech that would let people rotate spots, I guess, as their car gets charged, right, so that they're not, um, if they have another spot in the building and then they park their car in the charger spot, there's now kind of an unused spot that was assigned to somebody. Huh. I had, um, hadn't heard about it in that dimension. I, yeah. I was actually, as I've heard it, it's I mean, really the absolute the building, number. There's enough parking, but right. it's how to get the electric cars into the charger spot and use the other spots. Well, it's actually, um, in the issues we've been working through, it's been the absolute total number of spaces available or provided uh, that in order to retrofit, uh, property owners have been faced with the prospect of needing to come in to get a variance or some relief, uh, and that that's been a, a significant obstacle. And have you guys heard any issue about either fire li or liability for these? I've heard that raised as an objection. Oh, really? I was surprised. No, <laughs> none, of, none of our facilities uh, or certainly prospectively as well. The, the other dimension I would want to mention is related to single family, that we have been uh, incorporating uh, energy and electric um, needs as a part of the cool block pilot that is continuing and as a way to facilitate uh, c discussions among neighbors uh, for uh, interest in things like EV installations and the extent to which as a block, uh, if a block were to express interest in uh, pursuing EV installation, that that could um, generate a, a rationale for us to do system side improvements to upgrade transformers and the like. So it's a part of the facilitation uh, this, uh, perspective that Jonathan uh, mentioned. Good. Um, <clears throat> I did have a question on the, I think it was the electric utility in page 394, which is really some of our metrics. Um, it looks like we, we've been pretty steady at kind of what percentage of our electric is from renewable sources. And um, you know, my question was, what would it take to shift that to be a larger percentage? So um, right now, our supply is 100% carbon neutral. So our, um, our supplies are from carbon-free hydroelectric, and uh, that's, that's about 50%. And then we have about 60% um, renewables, which adds up to 110%. We do have a surplus of energy uh, right now. So um, to the extent there was a, a council interest in replacing some of our hydroelectric power with renewable energy, um, the 
opportune time to do that would be around the replacement of our Western um, base resource contract, which accounts for about a third of our, um, it, we get energy from them at about a third of our, third of our load. Uh, that contract ends in 2024, and we, if, if we were directed to replace that with some renewables um, or to look at different options around that, we could, uh, that would be the time to, to look at it. And so if I, I might. This metric, I guess it was 60% of our sales volume is from renewable supply resources under long-term agreements. Right. Yes. And it's, this is, for those who aren't really close to this issue, this is one of those things that do doesn't make sense under the way the state classifies renewables or non-renewables. Hydroelectric is considered non-renewable, and or large hydroelectric considered non-renewable. And so that's the reason that it doesn't show 100%. I see. So it might be. Doesn't make sense. We might, but we might need to switch <laughs> that metric so to percent just, carbon, just, carbon neutral or carbon free right. electric supplies. It's that might make it a little more. Credit accounting. Yeah. It's the, the, the little the trick they use is eligible renewable. So they have to recognize that hydro is actually renewable, but it's not eligible under the state program. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I know it's relatively small. But on the fiber utility on uh, page 407. So we've, we've continued to kind of chug along and generate revenue with, um, but in terms of like customer accounts, it's been steady and falling. And uh, well, I just wanted to get staff's reaction to, um, we don't really have kind of a salesperson on staff. Like what do you think would happen if we actually had a sales position could it potentially be revenue neutral or, you know, generate more revenue than the cost of the position? So I think the focus is, is that we actually have somebody that actually goes out. One of our key account reps is actually our fiber person that actually can go out and, and talk to the customers, small businesses and things like that. One of the key problems that we're having right now is that we have some choking points, um, some areas that um, we need to rebuild on the fiber line itself. So one of the things that we have been looking for that will be coming to you is on a recommendation on, on how we're looking to build fiber out to our switches and then also to our nodes is that that take, will take care of some of these um, areas that we will have some problems with and then at, once that gets fixed we can go actually out and start selling again to the small businesses as well as medium businesses that we can uh, move forward with. So are you saying right now we, we're turning away customers? Cause we we're not turning away customers now. What we will do is that we actually will actually go out there and fix it as customers come in. So we're actually out there pursuing as we stand. Right. So I mean but that person I mean, do they have enough time? Are they actually like marketing and selling, or is it more like inbound responding to? I think the thing is, is that you know, it's it, they're a key account rep, so it's it's not their number one um, focus of of their job on a daily day basis. But um, I think that you know, he has been very successful in in signing up the customers that we have. Um, he understands. He comes from a fiber background, um, so um, I think he. Um, would be able to f sell some more if we were able to fix some of our problems that we have within okay. our backbone. I mean, I have talked to um, Josh CIOs of oh. other cities mm -hmm. where their revenue businesses are growing, and yeah, I've just been concerned that ours has been pretty flat for a number of years, and uh, it just seems like we may miss miss some opportunity. Right, there could be a lot more revenue right, right there. Okay. <coughs> For me. Just operations, check points. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, th I think if we're looking at what's um, kind of the capacity that's holding us back, it's not being able to s um, sell it okay. or market it. It's um, engineering operations um, capacity to okay. kind of like. But I, I would I would ask you to think about like again if you know a lot of times we go through the budget and we look at the cutting positions, but you know if an additional position actually unlocks is is a net positive, we should definitely think about that. The other question I had is I know Caltrain, as part of the electrification project, is also laying, relaying a lot of fiber there. And I just wondered if we've had any discussions about the, any opportunity for the city to maybe put some fiber strands in, in those that network, or if that's just an entirely separate thing. I haven't been involved in any of that discussion. Anyone aware? No. Good afternoon, Tom Ting, Electric Engineering Manager. 
Uh, so the fiber for the Caltrain project, we're basically just raising the wires that we have there. So we're not actually adding any new fibers to that. Oh, I thought Caltrain itself was putting in some for themselves. No, they may be doing it for their, along their right away, but uh, the work that we're performing is just all the crossings. Yeah. Yeah, my question was really, is there an opportunity for us to kind of do a dig once with them when they're putting in their yeah. fiber? I, uh, we have not pursued that. I don't, not sure if they would want us in within their right of way. Right. Uh, they're very protective of what goes in there. Uh, so. Okay. You know, yeah, it also does represent a challenge to us after the fact to get in and do any changes because once in Caltrain right of way, we need flaggers and their their whole series of uh, uh, safety requirements for any work done within the Caltrain right of way. Okay. And then um, I would just ask really kind of a more general question is, um, you know, what if you had more dollars, I guess, where would you put them? Like what, what did you have to like cut back on in the, this year's budget? If anything, it's just for the sake of the, uh, Dean and team are thinking about the, the plethora of answers they can give to that <laughs> question. And did you, you uh, specific to the fiber fund or more generally? Oh, generally. Generally. Overall. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. All right. Wide open uh, opportunity there. <laughs> <laughs> the line forms behind Debbie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so our, um, I think it, it came up on our um, presentation earlier on that we have got a new construction schedule on our gas water and wastewater infrastructure and that was to go every other year. Um, so every other year we'll be doing gas and then water, wastewater, so they'll, they'll get a break and um, that was intended to um, mitigate some of the rate impacts for the CIP projects that have as we said, the construction costs have doubled over the past 10 years. Um, so, yeah, we could we could definitely be happy to um, go forward a more aggressive replacement schedule. Um, part of that as well is that if we go every other year, we might try and do bigger projects and get more competitive um, bidding from contractors. Um, uh, you talked on fiber. Um, yes, we you know we would like to have more capacity on the engineering side to. Uh, to do the engineering work, uh, design there. Um, come on, that was an open question. Well, Dean and I have been talking about, I mean, especially as we're moving into the uh, t uh, updates to the sustainability and climate action plan in 2020, I think that for us to reach these sustainability goals that we're um, aiming for, there, there are going to have to be a lot more um, programs and a lot more outreach to to um, to uh, to the community, and that's uh, that may down the line we have to we have to take a look at it. That may stretch resources. So. If I could uh, pick up on that, um, Councilmember Cormack raised earlier the uh, decarbonization and electrification. And that's a, I, I know that's what uh, Jonathan's referring to. There's actually um, some pretty exciting work that's happening right now, but it's all very um, conceptual in terms of what would the strategy and transition plan be, uh, both at a local but uh, as importantly, if not more importantly, a statewide level uh, related to gas utilities and electric utilities and how um, funding for stranded assets and transitions can be managed effectively. So uh, our piece of that action um, is obviously at the local level, but also uh, Jonathan and, and Dean are involved in some discussions and uh, that uh, are pulling me in as well to um, provide the local perspective for one of the few uh, municipal gas utilities uh, in that larger uh, strategic discussion. So it, it is actually a really important time for us to, to uh, become uh, more actively involved with that. The strategic level at the municipal utility uh, uh, perspective is really one of how to uh, manage that interface with individual customers, the development and uh, the opportunities for uh, more widespread uh, implementation of gas, or excuse me, electric appliances, uh, consumer acceptability, and in some ways the feasibility also of those electric alternatives to gas uh, uh, appliances. And so that's really where the programs are largely focused on incentives and uh, fitting it where it makes sense and we're 
consumers feel that it makes sense for them as well. You know, we um, wasn't too long ago that we were uh, pushing the uh, behavior, um, uh, what do we call it, demand side management, not behavior modification, but demand side management to encourage consumers to be uh, um, more accepting and uh, uh, provide the, those kinds of options. So we don't use that terminology and not interested in, in pushing that way, but ultimately consumers have to say it's good. And, and uh, so having some resources to facilitate uh, both the outreach as well as the um, um, ability to demonstrate that it does work. I think is, is the next frontier, but we're not quite at a scale level there. Uh, I think it'll probably be in the next couple of years. Anybody else? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah Tom Marshall, I mean, one of the major issues we have right now is on the electric side is construction resources. So, I mean, we're very short and the marketplace is very short as well. And, um, we have uh, having a difficulty getting contractors to even do work on projects. So obviously these things, electrification and other things, will have impacts on the electric system, which will lead to construction activity. So it's something we have to figure out how we're going to uh, attract construction resources here. So. Yeah, all sounds like very reasonable stuff, but it sounds like overall uh, you guys are pretty happy with the, the budget we ended up with. Uh, any any more questions? Okay. Well, I just wanted to thank thank all the staff who came out today, um, and thank you for your work on the budget. So, Do we need to so have this a would be tentative approval. Through. Correct. Uh, if you just said item two, <laughs> I guess. So there's nothing, no parking lot items, nothing we want to go into in the future. Mm -hmm. Not on, not on this, no. Okay. Happy to move tentative approval of item two. Perfect. Okay. Everybody in favor? Yep. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you all congrats. very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. And I will say, as staff is changing, you guys are right on time. Hey, way to go. This is great. Yeah. Because I, we were looking at the agenda, I'm like, four o'clock. Okay, so uh, if the committee is ready, we'll move on to item three, which is uh, planning and community environment, formerly development services, which is now rolled into that department, as well as the Office of Transportation um, budgets. And then one other thing to note are the special revenue funds. So um, that's a separate section in your operating books, which has all of the um, various other revenue funds, such as the parking funds. And with that, um, I think Steve's going to actually give this yeah. one. Yep. So Steve Guaglierdo, just going to do a quick read into Orient to the service area. Planning and community environment, which now includes development services, includes functions such as code enforcement, current planning, which where they review public and private projects for compliance with things like CEQA, things like zoning ordinance and the comp plan. This year, it now includes development services, which is where private development goes through for permitting. It's the one-stop shop that you've heard talked about before. And planning and community environment also includes long-range planning, where we ensure compliance with the city's comprehensive plan, including the housing element. In the FY 2020 budget, we have uh, established the independent Office of Transportation, recognizing the criticality of that need for the organization. 
With that, I'll turn it over to Jonathan, who can talk more about planning and community environment. Before I jump into the pie chart, just uh, want to say good afternoon to uh, our finance committee members and staff. Thank you for all that you've been doing this afternoon. Um, you know, this is a little bit different. We're, um, we're not only presenting today a, a budget for uh, the next fiscal year, but we're also in the process of merging uh, two departments and, and saying goodbye to another um, function of our operation with transportation. And so that's been in the works now for a little bit. So a lot of our effort for the last several months has been how do we um, do this in a way that's mindful of the, the council's interest to uh, address unfunded liability yet still provide the level of service that we're interested in providing for our customers. So uh, we've made that effort uh, today and we're happy to hear your feedback on, on how we go forward. The first uh, chart that I want to speak to is uh, just sort of the overall um, uh, budget for uh, the merged program. So now this includes planning and um, and building and by the way throughout this process we're still trying to figure out our new name because we don't want to have one group move into the other person's apartment so if you have any uh, <laughs> suggestions along the way we're we're open to that <laughs> new apartment that's right we need a new apartment so um, okay so first of all this uh, this graphic shows uh, represents basically about 20 million dollars worth of expenses that our um, our operation uh, requires uh, at this time uh, I want to speak to that first large, um, the first quarter of that uh, pie chart is administration and business operations and at nearly 25% that requires a little bit of explanation so I want to spend a minute on that. Uh, this, this piece here uh, again represents about $5 million, um, five million dollars. about $2 million of it is for staff and salary benefits. Um, the, uh, the balance of that uh, is for rent supporting our development center operations across the street and further down on Bryant for about 1.2 million. And we have a number of allocated charges, charges uh, to the tune of about a million dollars and this is IT, uh, our printing, mail, uh, vehicle replacement, things along those lines. Um, we have some other uh, half million uh, dollars worth of expenses uh, for uh, sort of a variety of business operations, uh, memberships, um, bank charges, telephone meetings, and things like this. And then the balance of about, um, I don't know, about a 0.13 uh, million is contracts that we have to support uh, our ongoing operations and IT support with uh, the way that we have communications with our, um, our customers. Uh, so that's that's a big part of that. So, but when you when you when you take uh, some of those other administrative functions, and if you look at just the salary and the benefits, it's really about 10% of the total pie that is dedicated in administration towards salaries and salary and benefits. So, um, one of the things you've seen this format. One of the things that we're you know working on and and um, you know we think is working well and, and proud of is that we, we have a huge volume of customers that we, we serve across the street uh, in terms of walk-ins and uh, appointments uh, for um, just filing applications, having questions about what we can, people can do with their property. And so we, um, we manage that, that high volume and, and we still have some plans going into the next fiscal year and at the end of this fiscal year as to how we can make some enhancements to that service level. And so that's um, anticipated. Uh, we've completed uh, the first phase of the work plan, um, the housing work plan, and uh, with the council's adoption, and it became effective in, in May, uh, May 2nd. So we feel like we've had success in that regard. And then we continue to have a number of applications, uh, increase in applications, whether it's new homes or, um, uh, you know, just any kind of rebuilding. Most of our applications are up from last year, uh, with some minor exceptions. And as far as areas where we want to focus, uh, this departmental merge is a, is a huge one. Um, there's, uh, it, on paper, it seems like a pretty straightforward deal to match these two programs back together, but the organizational you know, considerations and development and management of that is going to take a lot of our time and effort this year. Um, all the while, we still want to maintain our uh, commitment to the blueprint and deliver um, not just the same level, maintain the same level, but also try to find ways to enhance that where we can. And then, of course, is to do our best to satiate the council's uh, continuing um, need to give us more work every Monday. Uh, so we, uh, <laughs> so we're going to try to do that as well. Duly noted. <laughs> so, so sometimes we have national holidays on Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 
So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll pass it over to Chantel. Awesome. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chantel Cotton Gaines, Assistant to the City Manager and Manager of Transportation Services in the interim. So I will briefly run you through our transportation information. Um, you've heard a lot about transportation in the last two weeks, so I think programmatically you're pretty up to speed with everything we have going on. But I'll spend a moment on our pie chart. The biggest chunk of this pie chart, about 51%, is traffic and transportation capital projects. And I know that we'll be going through CIP-related transportation projects at next week's Finance Committee. But obviously, that's a big chunk of what we do. It's infrastructure improvements throughout the community. And then we also have focus on grade separation, our capital uh, parking capital project, our shuttle, bicycle program operations, alternative modes general transportation operations, maintenance, and planning, and then our parking operations and our transportation impact and in lieu fees. Um, focus there is we are really having a lot of programs that are focused on reducing single occupancy vehicle trips, which is one of the goals across multiple priorities for the city. couple of highlights for the transportation office what's working well first off we um, are creating an office of transportation and we are really focused on enhanced community engagement we've conducted over 50 meetings and reducing the possible grade separation alternatives down to six we've had that conversation at council on Monday but that is a really big big pull for our office and a lot of progress has been made in just a year really in terms of acceleration on that project We've increased the number of middle and high school students bicycling to school through collaboration with the school district and the Palo Alto PTA. We've seen record numbers of students bicycling and walking to school this year, and we hope to continue growth in those efforts. That's a really exciting success point for us. And also completed some infrastructure changes, some loved, some not so loved. We're aware of every bit of variety of them. Uh, some of the smaller ones are Quarry Road, some striping and path improvements, Colorado and Sandra Place was a school safety improvement project. We've done some of the changes along Ross Road and a few others throughout the city. So we just highlight a few here. And where we plan to focus, you have received almost every possible work plan related to transportation in the past two weeks. We plan to focus on those efforts. The transportation and traffic work plan that was taken to policy and services committee last week. We are going to factor in the changes recommended from that committee and bring that forward for council adoption in August. And in the meantime, we'll be working on elements of that. Also, the rail grade separation work plan there is more than enough to do to get council to where you um, desire to be on that project by the end of this year. So we are actively working on that, as well as improving data collection and staff capacity. With the creation of transportation as its own office, it gives us a great opportunity to reset some things and reprioritize our focus. And so in addition to all the high priority things that you see that are happening and being brought forward, there's a lot of day-to-day -day operations that we really want to make sure we're efficient with and doing proper data collection and just increasing staff's ability to get those things done. So that's where we will be spending a lot of our time in this coming year. It is a big lift, and we plan to do our best with it. With that, I'll give it back to OMB. Thanks. So just a quick overview of what's going on here. This slide has far more in the budget overview than the previous budget overview did, reflecting uh, in large part the reorganization and the realignment that's happening. So we're establishing the Office of Transportation, where we're doing a net zero reallocation of existing positions that were previously in the Transportation Division of Planning and Community Environment into the Office of Transportation. We're also taking a part-time position that was previously in the Clerk's Office associated with um, citation review and moving it into the Office of Transportation since that's a better alignment of that. Through this budget, we're also adding two positions. Um, this is not exclusively in the general fund. This is across all funds. There's one parking manager to oversee the parking and shuttle programs and one senior engineer. There's also various funding realignments through the various parking funds um, to reflect this new staffing complement. Then as Jonathan was alluding to, um, trying to merge the, develop the former Development Services Department and Planning and Community Environment into a new apartment. And so there's the net zero reallocation of all of the existing positions um, that were previously allocated to Development Services into PC&E. 
And then there's also the transfer of the business registry certificate program, which used to be a part of development services, and that's moving to the administrative services department. So this is half of the transaction moving. The other half of the transaction will be talked about later tonight with administrative services. Um, this section, item three, also includes the special revenue funds, including the parking funds. As such, we recognize the operating subsidy transfer that we talked about earlier in the general fund of about $721,000 coming from the general fund to cover the operating deficit in the residential parking permit fund. Additionally, there's investments from the special revenue funds for various capital projects totaling nearly $10 million. That's for things like Rinconada Park improvements, um, park impact fees are covering things like park restroom installations, and things uh, such as uh, improvements to traffic signals from the traffic mitigation funds. With that, we're open to discussion from the Finance Committee. Oh, one quick note. Actually, you should have an at places memo on this item. You should have two at places memos on this item. Um, so we are also available to answer questions on that, or Kylie can run you through those if she so chooses. So just a uh, quick so that uh, orientation to what they are. Um, there are, as Steve alluded to, two at places memos. Um, I, let's take the shorter one first, um, even though it's actually probably the more convoluted one. The <laughs> shorter one, complicated. Uh, yeah, complicated. The shorter one is the realignment of staffing resources as a result of the merging of the planning and uh, development services department. Uh, just to kind of give some context, in the budget document, we were able to block out the positions, meaning we physically moved the positions um, between the new Office of Transportation, the new um, Planning and Community Environment Department, but we hadn't yet figured out the right classifications, meaning we don't need two directors anymore. We have Jonathan. He's going to oversee both development services <laughs> and Planning and Community Environment. Um, and so staff spent uh, between basically the issuance of these documents and this memo some time figuring out what the organizational structure needs to be uh, in order to, to have a successful department. So specifically on the back of the first page is a chart with all the position recommended eliminations and um, the, on the left and all the position additions on the right. Overall. Um, this is about a $250,000 cost in the general fund, um, but this was already anticipated and the reserve was set aside in the non-departmental section to cover this. Uh, we just didn't have enough to execute in time for the book. So it wouldn't aff affect balancing per se. We would be just moving money between non-departmental and this department. Um, so that's one. The second one, we can go into more detail on that later is uh, the Finance Committee heard a request from the Transportation Management Association back in April um, to increase the annual allocation uh, from the $480,000, which is currently funded, to uh, $720,000. Uh, staff, there was a lot of discussion that evening uh, and various ranges of funding that was discussed. So staff uh, at the Finance Committee's request just put together if um, the Finance Committee wanted to explore adding additional funding to TMA and uh, offsetting it by additional permit revenues. Here are some scenarios in terms of what those fee increases would mean um, and how much you could allocate. So it's, these are also not done in isolation or these are also not the only scenarios. These were just building blocks to provide the committee with some data to help them um, evaluate. And also the the TMA PowerPoint is attached just for your ease of reference, um, so you don't have to go find it since we gave it to you today. Um, so with that, I think everybody is here for any discussion, questions, yeah. et cetera, but I know this is a, a meaty section. So yes, I'd suggest we do planning first, and then we do transportation. So do we have questions on planning? Okay. Um, all right, page 303 in operating. Um, so it looks a little aggressive on the um, workload to get to 80% if we've been at 57%, but it sounds like in the status, maybe we just weren't measuring things correctly. Could you repeat the question? Yes. 
Um, on page 303 mm -hmm. um, in the operating budget, um, the workload measure is about um, percent of permits initiated within a given period. And we're estimating that this year it'll be 57%, and we're proposing to hit 80% in 2020. We haven't achieved that in the past three years. So I'm just wondering if we have a plan for that or if it's just related to the under the status part where it describes that we haven't maybe perhaps been counting things most accurately. It just seemed like an aggressive, it jumped out at me as I went through. I'm like, is there a plan or is it just about how we've been tracking? Okay, well, so I'll take a first cut at this, but then I'll also acknowledge that uh, Michelle Flaherty is also here and, and has been providing some oversight to our development services in the midst of all the other hats that she's been <laughs> wearing. So we may need to uh, tag team this one. But I, I believe what we're trying to accomplish here is um, this may be a bit aspirational, um, okay. but it, it is something that we're striving to achieve. I mean, this was one of the concerns that we heard coming from the blueprint is that, you know, we, we want to be able to turn out application permits more quickly. And I think there's been a number of changes over the past year, actually, not just in planning, but uh, in some of the other areas where we've not been able to hit that mark. And, and I'll just kind of look back and see if George has any sort of, he's kind of looking at it too. So maybe we can look at that a little bit more. Okay, if there's that's, some more yeah, feedback, I mean, we can get back to you. That makes sense. George Hoyt, Chief Building Official Development Services. Um, I think you're correct. There, there was an error in our reporting. One, we were counting plan reviews falling on holidays and weekends as due dates, so we ended up being late, So the, and we have made some adjustments in our system to account for that, so we should see improvements, and we also are striving to, to improve our process at Development Services. Okay, great. Two-part answer. Thank you. Um, and then on page 305, you know, it's interesting. I know council members have asked these questions before, like how many applications are we getting? It actually looks like, you know, for the more complicated applications, they've been decreasing over time. And I'm just curious if, if that's, if you see that in residential or commercial or if it's, if it's both. Yeah, so mostly the... Uh, 305. Our, our residential um, activity continues to be strong. Uh, and this year... Um, We've done, I was looking at another data set, but I don't know if it's aligned with this one, but it's on the order of 20 or 30 new homes this year compared to last year. Our commercial development, uh, mixed use development is, is definitely down. Okay. Um, and so, uh, and that has other, of course, implications that the council will be interested in in terms of, you know, uh, impact fees and other uh, services that are provided and supported by those fees. But yes, we do not have a lot of major development taking place at the moment. Okay. And then for um, ASD, I'm just assuming that from 306 to 309, any of the deltas are related to moving things to transportation. And so we shouldn't even, I mean, I just didn't even pay much attention to the FY 2020 changes because I assume it's all <laughs> subsumed in, in, the, in the move. I was going to say there are three moves technically happening okay, if so you think I'm, about it. So, yes. Well done. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> no, I'm not going to spend any time on that. Um, and then I just, it was temporary and hourly positions. Um, I just saw that pulled out on 309. Looks like we have four, four people. I'm just curious what, what they do. It's, it's kind of rare, I think, to see that in these. Well, I think I would note, I believe it's on the, I'm sorry, I'm sharing Nick Sodom with the uh, planning, the New department. Whatever you're called. <laughs> <laughs> um, and y I think you will note in the app places memo that Kylie provided that we actually are, are reducing some of the hourly positions, so that number goes okay. down. Um, but we do have one of the hourly positions um, that we had was, we have is an administrative specialist person who helps with record keeping and so on. Um, so that was, I think, a 0.48 position. Um, in the department, we also have um, uh, a point four eight position with the CDBG. Um, oh, so right, a right, right, right. And we have a person who's been handling special projects. You may know Meg Monroe, who sometimes she does a little bit of um, hourly work for okay. us. Okay, And I'm across the street, I think they've also had some assistance when I, the other half of our, <laughs> of our um, partnership. Uh, they have some folks who work on um, also doing some record keeping and assisting with administrative tasks. Okay, great. That's all I have for this section. So just looking back in the presentation on page two, inspections are roughly 20% of the service costs. Um, are all of these fee recovery or? Yeah, this is uh, ours. 
uh, the inspection program is a uh, we recover those expenses through through fees. Okay. I think that's it for me. Um, I think Councilmember Cormack had the right point because of the moves. It looks like there's a lot happening here, but not really. Yeah. So I actually wanted to pick up on that. I thought I thought a lot of the KPIs for planning were good, but it would be great to see a KPI around building inspections. Um, so this is like a big area. So maybe like, you know, response time or number of issues found, those kinds of things. Um, if, I, if I may, I, the development services component of the department has a history of having actually a, a fairly rich complement of KPIs, but we wanted to take a new look at them as part of the merger. So I think you'll see those come back, and right. I think you'll be very pleased with what you see. Good. Okay. Yeah, something just beyond, like, number of inspections. Um, it was kind of hard to tell through sorting all this out if if the, all this reorganization, did, did we gain any efficiencies? Did we, where it's actually going to cost us more money or save us money? I mean, we got rid of one director by consolidating. Um, so could maybe, Kylie, you could talk about how that's sorted out. Sure. Um, you are correct. Um, all of this reorganization, there isn't uh, a net decrease in costs or FTE that's currently recommended. Um, part of it is is that you got you went you still went from two departments to two departments. Uh, it was just the development services department and the planning department, and then now you're at the whatever this new department office is plus the office of transportation. Oh. <laughs> um, so in reality, from you know when you look at from an administrative standpoint, you're still going to have an analyst supporting both of the departments. Uh, you know, one in planning, one in um, transportation. You'll still have an admin in one in planning, one in transportation. So the typical efficiencies that you would see from the consolidation of two departments, we yeah. we didn't actually consolidate. We just rearranged. Um, I would argue, though, that um, if you look at the PCE's reorganization. Um, they are really turning their staffing levels more towards kind of pl the planner level, um, which allows them to actually increase their FTE by one um, overall on an ongoing basis because they're moving away from the higher level management staffing to the more, you know, program assistant, principal planner type staffing uh, to, you know, Jonathan's going to take on the management side of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, I understand, I guess, but it would have been good to see if there was any other way to have efficiencies. Even I don't know if you've looked at even like um, shared administrative admins between multiple departments or, you know. So let me um, maybe not respond directly to that quite yet, but um, look at it perhaps a different way. In terms of the transportation, effectively what this does is elevate the functionality of the transportation function. And if you look at that in isolation, we've taken what has been basically a planning function in transportation um, to one that is now presumably able to plan and operate uh, in a more um, uh, both efficient as well as basically functional and uh, ability to see through from a plan through implementation both of projects as well as uh, ongoing programs, which, which is significantly greater than we had before. And then if you were to separate that out, and take that as, a, uh, as its own kind of isolated silo, for lack of a better term, then what you're left with really has been um, increased efficiency and effectively slimmed down administrative uh, resources for what remains in the planning development services uh, functions. So there's been a belt tightening there, and um, I believe uh, the expectation of uh, greater synergy between the functions uh, that remain in the planning and development services piece. So just a yeah. slightly different way to, to look at it. So, But I guess I was a little confused by this. It said it was a net of, well, so was there a net of a $250,000 increase in cost? Yes. So the, the thing to consider or to remember as these two departments are merging is the development services department um, is 100% cost recovery. Um, and so as you gain efficiencies between the two departments, as you are merging things, as you are sharing staff, um, you, if you, uh, when you reduce costs associated with the development services, the revenue goes with it. Um, and so you, 
you know, you, you're really kind of shape-shifting and we can't charge some of the administrative side that's in the planning side uh, to the development services because that would not be oh, legal. Seems, yeah, because um, they're not assign receiving assign a portion that. of it, right? So you can absolutely assign a portion of it. For example, we are shifting a portion of Jonathan's time into that. We're shifting a portion of the remaining administrative staffing into that. Um, the senior business analyst that you see on this list is also now partially funded by fees. Um, and so it's just, this is the balancing act as you kind of unfold everything. So where, um, where did the increase come from? I guess that's... Yeah, the increase comes from the salaries, the position levels, and the allocations of staff. So I guess to what Ed just said, we, we, if you just looked at these two departments, mm -hmm. no. you said we created some efficiencies, but do I guess we have more senior people, and so it's more expensive? Is that what we're saying? No, actually, I think it would be the opposite. So if you look at that, so let's look at the full-time headcount um, on the At Places memo. From um, there is there's a recommended four positions that are being eliminated, and then we're also eliminating another 1.5 essentially part-time positions, and then on the far right side. So for example, we'll just kind of peg some of these to each other, although they're not 100% pegged. It says we're adding two planning managers. Well, what that is is we're the division manager of planning is going away. It's too high level of a position. Jonathan's going to centralize under one chief um, planning official. And the manager of development center is going to go away. Um, and so in lieu of those two positions, we're going to move towards a planning manager. Um, and this will be a consistent classification across all of Jonathan's program areas. Um, the Let's take the program assistant. The program assistant is a little bit more expensive, but that's because we're getting rid of part-time staffing and adding full-time staffing. The reason for that is the part-time staffing, to Allison's point, having 4.4 part-time staffing is, that's a lot of bodies that you're kind of managing from an employee perspective. That's probably eight or nine people, and there's a lot of high turnover. But from a departmental standpoint, they really need more um, consistent and uh, I don't know. Steadfast? No, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, there, there's I so. Don't know how else to explain that? Consolidating that into one FTE where you only have to train one person once, mm -hmm. you only have to do one performance evaluation, you only have to, you know, go through the process instead of with three different folks that may be doing different aspects. It's definitely an efficiency that we gained, but it does add now to. So, so it's benefits and things where yeah. we didn't have that before? That's right. In that, in that scenario, with, the, with that. That's one what point. I'm really just trying to get, like, yeah. Where, yeah. where did the expense come from? No, right. that's totally fair. And I'll, and I'll note one other change, uh, and that is the, the principal yeah. management analyst. This is a limited term position, so that six goes to five next year. Uh, this is a term limited position, and the reason we're, um, we're asking for that position is because in, a, uh, in addition to the model where we have, you know, the building department and the planning department, we're creating this, uh, this other component that has our administrative functions, but also our data management, but also data analysis piece, which to this point, we've not given enough sort of attention to it. And so um, because we're merging the departments, I, I want to create a situation where um, by having this principal analyst, I can have somebody get trained to do the budget um, for next year and uh, help oversee this new sort of program dealing with our data and our administrative uh, functions. I wish I had a flow chart or a yeah. work chart. I didn't bring yeah. it down. Oh, that was, that's coming up. It's another question. Okay. But, but why is that only a one-year position? Though? It's transitional. So this is a, a transitional plan to get us where we need to go. And so with two departments coming together, um, the budget books are, are different. The sources of income are different. Our, you know, our certifications are different. So we need to consolidate that. And, and so we have somebody in mind who can bridge that gap, and then we can bring somebody on board uh, to get tailored uh, training so that they are in position to do this next year. Okay. So, so yeah, I'm looking at the third page of this memo. Um, so, I, I, why, why was there a $85,000 loss of revenue? Because you're losing, so that principal uh, management analyst, since it is one time, uh, once that goes away, the side of it that was funded by the development services, you lose the revenue side of it as well. So we're having 
fewer people in development services, so we're cost recovering less? Is that what's happening? Correct, because you're gaining the efficiencies associated with smushing, smushing two departments together. Yeah. And we're still doing the same amount of work with par partial support from people like Jonathan. Correct. But it worked out to be a net loss. On the revenue um, side yeah. for development services, that is correct. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So uh, is it really just a combination of that loss of revenue plus shifting to salaried employees? Is that? Some of it is that, yeah. Some of it is salaried employees. Some of it is uh, the loss of revenue. Uh, the other piece that's not on this page but is driving some of why the staffing is getting solidified in the way it is, is we also moved some of the positions that used to be in development services. So we moved a management analyst and we moved an administrative assistant that used to be in development service to the Office of Transportation so that they could have analytical and administrative support uh, to kind of establish that robust setting. So, and those positions were previously partially funded by fee funding as well. So it's, I'm not gonna lie, it's a pretty gnarly yeah. couple hundred row. <laughs> so um, after, after we do this for a year, workbook. If if you find more of your staff is doing uh, yes. development desk work, I guess we will re yeah. allocate. Absolutely. Re yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I will admit we did, uh, you know, when I went over the allocations of staffing with um, Sherry and Jonathan, we did take a conservative approach um, because you never want to overcharge people from a fee perspective. Um, so we erred on the side of caution. We erred on the side of general fund. But one of the reasons for the principal management analyst is to really look at all of the, what happens once these two departments are merged, <laughs> who's doing what, what the time allocation is, and frankly, we may need to do another fee study again, um, and kind of reset and re, redo the kind of development, development center one-stop shop allocation. Okay. Yeah, so I did, I did have a question about the org charts, and I thought maybe that could be a parking lot item, maybe it sounds like it's in progress. Mm -hmm. But one thing you pointed out to me earlier today was looking at the org chart in terms of the number of people on a function versus what we see here in terms of where their time is being billed to. Correct. I think it would be useful to be able to see that for these two groups. Sure. Um, because we they're can. not 100. They are getting funded through other means, right? Um, the, what's interesting now is the planning and community environment department is primarily general funded at this point, but a lot of it is feedbacked. So although it all runs through the general fund, um, a significant point, component, over 10 million of that 20 million is backed by um, fee revenues. Um, and then the special funding is limited to the housing funds, uh, like CDBG. Um, and then transportation is the one that now has the more complex funding structure where they have staff in the general fund, in the parking funds, in the capital improvement fund, um, because they're the ones that are working on rail, on the transportation, CIPs, whereas now planning and community environment is not so much on the um, capital side of things. It's much more operating type of work. It seems like it'd be useful. Is there a way to see how much of the planning st staff is coming from fees versus... Um, it would be on page 307. So of the $20 million budget, about $18 million um, is assumed from fees, or from revenues, I'm sorry. Uh, and your biggest fee categories on page 307, I guess it actually is on 306 as well, uh, you'll f see it, the $9.8 million that's in charges for services and the $8.2 million that are in permits and licenses. So this is everything from your um, kind of time-based fees, uh, the small ones, uh, to your larger valuation fees associated with your building projects. Okay. Um, I know we, we've, council has had discussion in the past about um, stop, stopping paying rent you know, for additional space. I don't know if that is something that's still being considered. Um, you know, we, we passed on the post office, but, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know, within this building, if there's space or even, we haven't even talked yet, what will happen with the police department when the police move out? I can speak. But saving, saving that relatively large rent. So we, we have a long-term plan for the one-stop shop to move over to this side of the street once police move into the new public safety building. Okay. So until then, uh, we're probably stuck paying rent for a couple more years. And I think um, plan might be a bit 
too definitive at this point. I think it's a <laughs> desire. It's a vision. It's a vision. It's a vision we're very enthusiastic Ho about. Hope is not a plan. Lots of, lots of work ahead to confirm and, and verify that all that works. There's no option other than that space. Do you mean the, I'm sorry? Is it how about the Ross building? Yeah. Hold that thought. Um, yeah, I don't want to step into that quagmire. Um, so at this point, that's really the focus. Remember also we have the Elwell Court uh, is another major uh, leased uh, space that the city has. So I think as we uh, go forward, you know, planning for the move of the police department out, there are lots of calls on that space. <laughs> and uh, also needing to look at the functionality and where we are throughout the city. Uh, uh, clearly, um, we've got other properties that could be looked at as uh, possible recipients as well. And I, just to add on to Ed, you just reminded me, I believe we have a CAP in um, public, works. public works for them to start looking at planning. that. Yep, planning. Planning as a verb rather than as a thing that exists. Yes, <laughs> correct, correct. Uh, to really start looking at how we, how we deal with all of these space issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my last question on the planning, uh, or just really more of a comment, was the KPI around code enforcement? It's like sixty percent, which does is not. not <laughs> <it's> pretty, <laughs> <laughs> they were proud of that. <laughs> so I know I know it's an area we've looked at in the last couple of years. Yeah, well, so so we're a little bit hamstrung right now. Um, we have one code enforcement officer. Uh, we are uh, we finished our. Um, we're recruiting for two positions. Those positions have closed. We're just going through the, the screening application. We also have the audit that we're going to be working um, with the city manager's office on to make some refinements. But we're really looking forward to making some improvements in that program. All right. And maybe shoot for 61 or 62. Again. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations again for becoming the director of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, should we move on to Too late to turn back now, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> You have, you have another just, just one comment, nothing about the budget here, but um, something I've heard from a lot of applicants in terms of the coordination between planning, permitting, inspections, and actually getting their certificates is there's kind of like, it feels loopy to them. And if we could begin, you know, looking at that more holistically as these two departments merge and perhaps tracking it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Let's move on to the transportation. People have yeah. questions, comments? So, Steve Guagliardo, OMB. One quick note as we move to transportation. On the pie chart that Chantal talked about, there is a significant portion that is related to capital. I think the capital conversation is best saved for next week. All of these projects are included in the general fund, capital fund, and can be talked about as part of that conversation. I'm ready. Okay, great. Um, 287, love the goals and objectives, especially goal number one. I'll be honest with you, it, it, it feels like we spend a lot of time on two and three, which is public parking and travel by bicycle. Just personally, I don't know how much time and effort the, you know, the team spends or money on traffic flow on major streets. Maybe it just isn't something we see or walking. And then, of course, we'll get to shuttle riders. So. Um, it's not clear on page 311 how much we spend on the city shuttles, if I'm on the right page. Did I, is 311 right? No, I don't think that is right. No, my bad, yep. How much do we spend on the city shuttles? Um, we spend 168,000 roughly on the MV transportation shuttle and 131,000, I'm rounding, uh, for the Caltrain shuttle. So the, the, the two, the, the two shuttles? Yes, so okay. there's the different, the two shuttle routes. Right, one that's is the, the one, 131? Yes, and the 131 is the Caltrain. Okay, and do we own those vehicles? No. No, okay. It's through contract. It's a contract. Yes. And I see we have a total number of riders. Do we have a, is it possible at all to get a unique number of riders? No, I didn't think so. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a no. I was like, We're yeah. working on getting better ridership information. We had some complications with the uh, Caltrain shuttle ridership this year. So that is something we're looking at as we um, re-up those contracts. But we are working with outside contractors. So we have some limitations, but we're working to make it more accountable. 
Okay. Um, you know, I'm very happy in the budget adjustments to see a whole bunch of these things. Number two just makes sense. Um, number three is desperately needed, and I'm glad that shuttles are in there with parking. Um, and number four, I'm on page 294 now, um, has been something I and other people have been asking for for about a year and a half, is to have someone available to be working on rail um, and everything else. So um, happy to see this. Um, looking forward to the new leader arriving. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's, there's really you know, um, so much to be done. And um, I know you all know that. And it's top of the citizen survey, top, top of really everyone's um, list. So um, I think in general, the community is doing a good job being patient. Um, and you guys are doing a good job trying to like hold things together and not have them fall apart. Um, so I, I just want to sort of compliment everyone on the sort of status quo as we, as we work forward. Um, I am happy it'll be its own organization and I do think adding these, you know, these two manager positions is, um, is great and I do look forward to learning a lot more about um, the shuttles once we have someone. Um, so I'll just jump in quickly. So I agree with Councilmember Cormack about kind of the way the goals are laid out and goal one kind of being one we should probably focus a bit more on. Um, and also about the management positions overall for the department and for rail stuff. Uh, I guess two things. So one is I would point out, I'm just kind of like wrap my mind around the parking stuff. So on the one hand, on the citizen survey, it says percent of surveyed residents rating the amount of parking as good or excellent. And I wonder if that's really the right way of thinking about it, right? I don't think any of us, it's not the amount of parking. It's like, do I have my parking spot now? Right, you actually don't care about the amount. And so, so I wonder if that's just kind of a shift in thinking we may want to explore a little bit going forward. Yeah. Availability, yeah. clarity yeah. of Parking finding availability it, right? standards, the right. elusive right. to be defined. Right, I, I just don't think the amount's right, because I, I could care less, you know, if the rest of you get parking, it's just about me. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then I guess the other thing is, is this the right time to bring up the other memo we had in hand about TMA stuff? And I've, here it is. Um, so right now the steady state is, or the proposed, right now the proposed support is 480,000. Is that what's budgeted for 2020? Yeah. Okay. And our friends at the TMA are requesting a couple of different levels, but 720 is the 50% increase. And it's kind of the money input car output machine, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think about that? Um, <coughs> what page are you on? I mean, I'm I have in, the I'm supplement. This. Yeah, this, but where, uh, where does you, it tie to the other one? I'm just looking for that. It's in the special revenue fund section. Oh, okay. That's why I had, didn't um, have it yet. Okay. Cool. University Avenue and TMA funding specifically is on page 103. I think, do you, should we wait then and do all special revenue funds together perhaps? Part of this whole item. No, okay. All right. So I guess what's interesting to me, I guess, is we know that it roughly costs the city about 1500 or 2000 bucks to remove a vehicle from parking in our downtown. Right? That's the cost for us to get a car off the road from parking here, whether they're using VTA, Caltrain, Scoop, whatever. Um, but we're only charging in these parking areas, you know, 750 or 375 dollars. That seems a little backwards to me. Um, so I'm I'm in support. I, I think you know, Councilmember Du Bois, you've raised a lot of questions about measuring the TMA, 
and are we really able to link the spend and, and the trips removed? I think those are good questions, but I think it's still a pretty nascent program and one of the best we have yet at addressing that goal of reducing SOBs. So I'm generally in, front, in support of continuing our practice of increasing those permit fees to fund the TMA. I also have been kind of keying into the thing a few of us have asked questions about recently um, of the subsidy going over to the RPPs, right, 700,000 or so, and that this may also be another source for that. So I'll just raise that to you both, that I'm supportive of raising these parking fees. Um, you know, ideally to support the TMA, but I think the RPP might be another target too. So that's, that's some comments. Okay. Um, so if I could go through. Um, so I was curious, back to transportation overall, um, I, I, you guys have kind of created an org chart without a head of transportation. So might some of the definitions, these positions shift when a person comes on board? There's a position for that, yes. Yeah. So, it was, so like the combination of parking and shuttle, for example, if they want to organize it differently, that might, that might change. Yes, and we've yes. left room okay. for that in the work plan discussion as well, which is a way that we're sort of building a good foundation for a new CTO with information and the staffing, and then they can come in and really assess what best okay. assignments are good for the but team. But in the budget, they'll just have the number of heads that we Correct. Approve. Yeah, but okay. assignments are completely and people open. So <laughs> right. Ultimately. People. Yeah. Yes. On the shuttle KPIs, um, it's been a number of years. I'd really like to see uh, kind of the details on the ridership and the routes come come to council again at some point. And it tied into Councilmember Cormack's question about how much money are we spending there. Um, I think it's been probably four years since it came to council. Um, and then on page 289, I'm trying to remember what my note was. Oh, well, yeah, it's this metric around the RPP of how many how many people are in town or part of an RPP. Kind of just had a similar reaction, like I'm not sure if that's a, what does that metric mean? Is that a good metric or a bad metric? Right. Um, so we might want to think about, uh, again, kind of metrics around RPPs. May yeah. I jump in on that? What I thought was helpful on Monday night was knowing what percent of households that is in the city. Yeah, I thought that was actually far more relevant. It made, you know. But I'm, I'm just saying it's not a, well, something we want to optimize. No, no, but I'm just saying that <laughs> even the number of households, I wrote what percent of total, and then, so. Yeah, but what yeah. I'm saying is, is there another metric that's actually a better measure of, like, achieving what we want? Yeah. I actually thought your comment, Councilmember Cormack, the other day about different neighborhoods have different lot widths, right? Yeah. And, and that's kind of an interesting thing. And like, it gets back to the same point, like people expect to be able to park in front of their house. They don't care if you can, but they want to do it in front of their house. And that may be something a little more interesting. Um, I was also struck by the range of parking availability. Yes. We had some neighborhoods which were like evergreen, like up to 80% on certain areas. And then other blocks downtown here where it's only like, you know, 10%. So that gets to our standardization question. But. And then to the point about funding the RPPs out of the general fund, um, yeah, I think maybe there's something about in terms of raising the permit fees, but also uh, kind of what we discussed last night is there's kind of a startup cost and a steady state cost. And it'd be good to like have an indication of, you know, what was steady state and um, what would it take to kind of be cost neutral on once, once an RPP is up and running. Um, and then shifting to the TMA, um, I guess I'm a little confused. It's in the budget, but we also passed the work plan last night, which included looking at uh, RPP fees as part of that work plan. So are we going to wait for the work plan to come back, or are we going to uh, change it in the budget? Well, I think the um, the element related to fees in RPP was more a recognition of the interrelationships there, and uh, this is much more like, operational. So um, what I would suggest that focus here on the budget, do what's necessary to fund the programs, and um, the larger interrelationships is something that can be examined as a part of the RPP work. Yeah, so I mean, we did talk about it fairly recently. So it was about a month ago. 
and uh, the TMA basically came to us and said they needed they needed more sticks, more ways to get people to use the TMA. Um, I'm also, you know, I'd love to see us start to use some of these um, these fees for th other transportation needs, not just the TMA. Um, yeah, so I'm struggling a little bit. I, so I think I had been talking about, you know, what if we went to the $600,000 level? Um, I guess right now I would be supportive of that, raising the fees to go up to that level. Um, but then I think we need to kind of look at it more holistically, maybe as part of this work plan and be able to come back and change it again. But the Can work I, plan stuff yeah. we discussed on Monday, that was about... Wasn't that about rationalizing the RPP fees for employees and residents, right? It wasn't about... It was also about standardizing across, right? So if we just right. take... <laughs> but not about the garage fees is what I'm saying. No, but like California Avenue, you know, versus downtown. It was saying, why do we have different, different prices in different places? Those are, if I recall correctly, those are the two different parking funds, or used to be two different parking funds. Right. And there was perceived more demand for downtown parking garages than Cal Ave ones. So the word perceived makes, <laughs> makes me concerned that we're... You know, ultimately, it is a, a council policy decision on whether differential fees make sense. I mean, quite frankly, the RPP 35, list of 35 items um, raises a whole slew of issues as including whether to park or pay for parking downtown in general and so again it, i i would characterize it as an a recognition of the interrelationships rather than to let the rpp work plan drive this it's a, it's a bit of um, um tail wagging the dog um recognizing that there there are a slew of issues this this really will be uh parking overall uh a significant um body of work for the transportation office for the foreseeable future. Um, and so I think continuing to make progress on the individual issues makes sense in the context of understanding that they are connected. So I'll just say then that I think scenario C makes sense, not based less on getting to the TMA funding level, the a, a TMA level funding that's higher than what's in here, but based on the fact that if we're going to see a fee structure where most fees are going to increase by this percentage rate. This seems reasonable and defensible. Um, I guess what I don't understand is how how this would change whether or not we could provide funding and services to California Avenue. Is that implicit? If we do scenario C, is that possible? Or is that additional to scenario C? So, so I think that whether the council wants to provide funding to the TMA to do work in Calab is a policy call in and of itself. Right now, it is 100% funded by the University Avenue parking permits. Um, and so if we wanted to, you know, we threw that on there in the sense that we discussed at the Finance Committee meeting that there are some services that are being provided to the Calab area by the TMA. However, it's not being provided by city funds. So if the city wanted to either reach the $750,000 uh, request from the TMA by adding in Calav as a business area that would be served and use Calav parking permit revenues to help support that number or go beyond that, I, these are all policy calls that... I would argue it's actually make. more than a policy call. It's, it needs to be a contractual arrangement with the right. TMA. Right. And uh, so certainly... Again, what we have before you is the request from the TMA effectively to continue the services that they mm -hmm. are today. Um, and we would need to take separately a uh, discussion, negotiation, agreement with them as to what expanded services would cost and include. Yes, I, I would not be supportive of the 7.5. Again, based on our discussion with the TMA. Um, well, you said 600K, right? Isn't that it? Oh, you're in scenario B. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. I just didn't. He, I felt even Steve was the saying that, um, you know, we're basically uh, giving away money for go passes without a real sustainable plan, and that, um, you know, I would see, you know, a slight increase over where we are now while we work on getting to that sustainable point, uh, and so I, yeah. 
I guess the other part that's going on here, though, is we learned on Monday night that 40% of the people with these permits are paying the low the low income fee, right? So they're not even paying this level. Actually, not so much permits. No, different permits. Right, different permits. The so RPP permits. Okay, this says downtown RPP on. It's not so, these. So the other thing that's in here, <laughs> and which again is different than the work plan last night. So we're talking about raising the parking permit fees. Right. And then we're talking about the RPP fees should be the same price so as not to incent people to park in the neighborhoods. But the work plan last night actually suggested the inverse of charging less in the garage than the neighborhoods to even yeah. further reduce it. Um, Tip yeah. of the iceberg, or <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I think the question in front of us what it feels we like we're with? making this decision earlier than I mean before we have well, a I, fair to, amount to of information. To my point, I think what I was asking Ed, I guess we're going to make a decision for the budget, and then it would come back to us in the work plan. Maybe with a different strategy. That so, so that's where, and again, sorry, not being clear previously. I, I would argue, or I would recommend, you make this budget decision relative to the TMA's request and to address that. Um, there's definitely, as has been pointed out, relationships between the fees uh, charged for these permits and your overall TDM plans as well as uh, expectations around services. Um, but it, it would be pr premature to take on that piece of it. Um, so really, all we have before you is the TMA's request at this point. OK, so then, Chair Du Bois, you're suggesting an increase of 100, no, $120,000 yeah. based using, by increasing fees or just by using our 300K? Increase employee parking permit fees. Okay, so you're saying scenario B, so that's cost neutral. Well, they're they're all cost neutral, right? It just depends how much we want to transfer over to the RP, to the TMA. Well, yeah, I'm just saying that where where is that extra funding for the TMA going to come from? Is it going to come from raising the fees, or is it come from our small pot that we have? We could do a mix of both. Um, I'm not suggesting yeah, yeah, that. I'm yeah. just no, saying it's a, it's a, those are our point. two options, right? I, I mean, so you guys know I'm, I'm a bit radical on this parking stuff. And it, it's mainly because, I mean, like, if you look at nearby cities, you know, like, the rates are like $1,800, $2,000 a year, right? So we are really missing a lot here. I think you have a good point about Cal Ave being pretty different from downtown. And that's something that the work plan we passed on Monday should begin to address. And yes, I agree, we would rather have people parking in the garages rather than RPP commercial permits. And that's something that should be addressed by pricing. Nonetheless, our garage permits are still vastly underpriced. Um, that's a separate issue from how much goes to the TMA. Right, 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 right. Um, but I'm saying we, have, we actually have flexibility in this lever here to keep on raising it and subs cross subsidizing the TMA. So, I mean, I'm personally in support of scenario D, but I think scenario C might be our compromise. So, so we're saying the whole increase in the delta then would all go to the TMA, nothing else. If it goes from 750 to 806, all 56, $56 delta, all of that goes to the TMA. This is, this is the staff work we did based on the previous direction from the committee when the TMA came before the committee and the committee asked us to take a look at the revenue as a way to meet the TMA's request. So we, we, we did not have a separate assignment from that conversation to look at raising the fees for other purposes. So this was in response to the TMA. So that's, I guess, that's why this is yeah. the way it is in front of you. So I'm I, won I wonder if, go ahead, I mean, I <laughs> see if you have the same idea I have. Well, no, I was, I was thinking of this. Is this an item for the parking lot to split the issue of uh, raising parking per fees versus the level of funding for the TMA? Um, yeah, you can. It's a, that's the committee's discussion. Another option could be if you're comfortable with one fee level increase and you just don't know what you want to do with the money yet, you could agree upon a rate increase, yeah. but not. I don't think we really looked at level of fee increase yep. in, on its own, right, other than this thing we got to place this tonight. Correct. 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 No, we have not. I, I, would, I would be supportive of this, um, kind of a pun, putting it in the parking lot, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I know there are bike people here who want us to put it on the bike rack, not the parking <laughs> lot, right? So parking lot slash bike rack, there you go. And, and so again, I, I am 
thinking about our discussion with the TMA and Steve and Steve and uh, again I, I was more comfortable funding that at like the 600,000 level um, so what specifically are we asking staff to do so budget how much they budget right and then I think in the parking lot we would come back maybe to have a separate discussion or would it be something even after the budget to look at fees I guess I'm thinking if we're going to raise the fee, we should do it thoughtfully, and it might include other things, and not just to sort of get to the TMA level of funding that we're hoping for. Right. I don't want to do this in a two-step process, but maybe there's something I don't understand about well, this. What I'm saying is um, we would allocate so much money to the TMA as part of the budget, and then how much money we generate from like a revenue perspective, and whether we use it. To Adrian's point, maybe the fees versus other cities could be low, and if they are low, we could use some of that money for wayfinding or other programs. So but, um, it seems like a separate. Decision. Or the RPP, yeah, right? I, mean, I think what we're getting at is that yeah. there's there are two things. One is like the level of funding we want to support for the TMA, and we can fund that however we want. It just I remember Mayor Felsworth and I two years ago just kind of keyed into this idea that it seems like you know charging for the parking for commercial parkers seemed like a legitimate way to do it. Um, both as a revenue source and philosophically to kind of push people towards other modes. Um, I think the other question that you two are getting onto is like, look, if we have flexibility in these parking fees, um, do we want to raise them to some level? Like, do we just want to, you know, next year go to two thousand dollars? I'm just making up a number. And you know, then you know, we give some of that money to the transportation office. We give some of it to the RPP programs to cross subsidize them. We give some of it to the TMA. But I do think shuttle bus. Sorry? Shuttle bus. Shuttle bus. There the you go. Transportation stuff. Yeah. Bike routes. I, I, th I think we are at the point, though, in the budget process where we do have a legitimate connection between the parking fees and the TMA. It seems like there's some appetite to increase the funding to the TMA. And so that's why I'd say I think we probably could choose this now. And maybe what we parking lot is, or add to the work plan we passed on Monday, is like, hey, what the heck do we do with these garage fees? We don't want to but change don't, the fees multiple times. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't want to change the fees multiple times. The other thing is, like, only two of these parking fees, really, they'd be increased, and then the TMA would get the money, but three of the groups wouldn't really get any benefit from that, right? So the, you mean the RPPs? Three of the prices listed here, they wouldn't be receiving any benefit from the TMA. So Kylie and Ed, maybe, um, again, uh, Parking lot. We could fund. Yeah. The, well, we could agree to fund the TMA from uh -huh. from the reserve. Uh, I forget which fund it is, the University Avenue parking fund, and, and then maybe take a information item to have have the issue of fees come back to us, and even potentially uh, as part of that, we could potentially refund the University parking fund mm -hmm. if we wanted to. So. You know, not raise fees right now, for, but just to determine the level for the TMA, and then have it come back to us for a future discussion on on fee level. And Sorry, where were you the taking the 120k from? From yeah. the University Avenue parking yeah. fund. So from the one one three five, the trans. From the 3.1 million. What? Where, where are you looking? Yeah, that's a good point. I'm. If I understand it, oh. the option was to use this. Oh, the fund balance in the University Ave parking fund. Um, just temporarily, and then once we determine. Yeah, that's actually one of my overall questions about all these special revenue funds is, you know, what's available and what isn't. So it looks like we transfer in the University Avenue parking permit fund. We're, we're transferring over a million dollars. What What's that for? Is that related to this? So that's related to CIPs. That has to do with the parking management and system implementation mostly. Okay. Well, on current, what's the current? But so that's going into the University Avenue Parking Fund, which currently has $3.1 million? Sorry, that's being transferred from the University Ave Parking Fund to the Capital Fund for that project. Could you explain what the fund is currently used for? Sure. So I apologize. Is the question of the council member, what is the current use of the University Ave Parking Fund? Is that the... Councilmember Du Bois is uh, looking at the 3.1 million and thinking we that's on page one of the at places memo and thinking we could use some of that money to increase the TMA and that's the question we're trying to get answered. That is correct. Right. You can do that. That is an option. That would be scenario A. 
you can, it is fungible. There's three million sitting in the fund balance of that fund. And what's that supposed to be used for? It has a number of areas that it can be used for. It is up to the council's discretion. Um, it is a balance that has built up over time as projects have been delayed um, and we haven't moved forward on different things. There's capital infrastructure that can be done. It can be used for wayfinding. It can be used for enforcement. Um, I believe it is, is currently it, used for operations. Correct? So is this so like what the valet parking comes out of here that we just increased? It does, it does. as does the, I think, the energy. Are we using it for the electricity in the garages as well as the cleaning, uh, some security Correct. So expenses. if you look on page 103 to what I think Ed and you guys all are alluding to, if you look on page 103 at the bottom of the outline of the University Avenue Parking Permit Fund in, fund in, on, in 2020, you can see the income from operations. Um, that's the difference between the revenues that are coming in for the program versus the programmed expenses. Sorry, what page are you on? 103. 103. So overall, the 2020. Oh, yeah, down at the bottom. Yep. Yeah. So the 2020 proposed budget anticipates that about $3.5 million in revenue will come in and that there are, oper there are expenses both operating to what Ed was talking about, the um, cleaning of the garages, the custodial services, steam cleaning, et cetera, um, some police patrol, uh, the actual administration of the system, and then that million dollars of capital, there is an operating loss of $500,000. But that's because we're moving $1.1 million over to the CIP fund. We are, but we okay. have a history of doing stuff like that. We move, we have this fund pay for its CIP fair share when we do CIP improvements to the downtown area associated with parking. If you look in 2019, there was a budgeted $2.3 million transfer. So when you see negative numbers there, you're drawing on that $3.1 million balance. So to the extent the council chose to use that $1.3 million fund balance to increase funding for the TMA, it just means that you, you're prioritizing that over other things that may come up. They're not all necessarily defined, but it is a, it's, you're not going to go negative from a financial perspective, but you may not be able to afford something in the future. So it's kind of a question of do we want to draw on this reserve or, yeah, do, yeah. We want, or do we want to pay as we go. Does, so. And does the CIP fund related to the Waverly Garage or not? That's really the other question in the back of my mind. How so? I mean, isn't, I'm just, there's, isn't there also money sitting somewhere for a garage? Separately, yes. Separately. The, and the, this is not that, correct. this does not go to that. Okay, correct. thank you. Would not draw away from the funds reserved or needed for the Downtown garage. So let, me, let me try a motion for planning and transportation, and then we still have the other um, special funds to yeah. review in the next 10 minutes <laughs> if we want to stay on schedule. So, my motion would be tentative approval of the planning and transportation budgets. We approve the TMA at 600000 uh, with money coming from the University Avenue Parking Fund, and then we would ask council to refer a uh, valuation of. Uh, employee parking permit fees back to the finance committee and then we would consider um, you know what what increase those fees and we could potentially uh, replace the money in the University Avenue parking fund once we make a decision as well as use those fees for other programs what was the last uh, where did, how far did you get <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry, and, it, and uh, we could use those fees to replace the University Avenue parking funds and uh, potentially other transportation okay. projects. Is that clear what, what my intention is? Basically, we're temporarily funding from the parking fund, and then we're giving ourselves time to come back and talk about um, what the permit fees would be. Okay. Can we also get something into the parking lot slash bike rack for, you know, a week or two from now, or we're saying... That's, we're not going to be able to get that done in time. I thought we wanted to have a substantial discussion about the permit fees. Okay. Themselves. We can't get that done in time. I would, I guess, suggest or, or believe that um, a substantial discussion of parking or permit fees it will not be possible in a week. It, this is really more likely um, an overall discussion of TDM programs and how to fund those and the like. Um, and so I would suspect we're several months away from being able to have that larger discussion. I would note for the committee's um, just information that annual increases in fee permit fee costs is not unusual at all. 
and while um, you know certainly impacting the people who have to pay for those permits, uh, wouldn't suggest that making an increase now and making an increase either several months or a year from now is is, is customary. Can not I, a problem. Can I ask a few more questions uh, before we move? Let me ask one question. So what, are we saying? I thought we have a time of the year when we look at all of our fees. This is it. This is it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, my, my misunderstanding. When so. was the last time this fee was raised? Last year. From what to what? Yeah. About. Okay. So, so, hopeless. so I guess uh, microphones. I, we'll yeah. look it up. I believe it was from 720 to 750. Yeah, I, uh, I, the big I, jump is up to the 720 marker. Uh, and right. So last that year one I remember. Did, we just so did the I, I'm, you know, I'm. If it's 750 now, I'm comfortable going to an $800 level. That yeah. that's not a big delta. I misunderstood. Let me let me revise my motion. Okay. That, that we would just go to the 600k level with the 5% increase, uh, and that but the rest of it we would then come back and have a discussion about further increases. Will you do scenario C? I, I think you're right about the discussion about further increases. It's not going to be during this budget season, but we can have it, and we, we can change fees more than once in a year if we need to. Um, but I, I, I'm, I think I'm comfortable with scenario C. So I think I would do C in terms of raising the fees, but I would still like to fund this TMA at six hundred thousand based on our discussion. So I, I would prefer the six sixty. Six sixty is scenario C, right? Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, scenario C is six sixty. Well, I'm saying we. But would, he's saying go ahead and raise the fee, but just keep it. Give one, give one twenty to mm -hmm. the TMA, and then what do you want the rest to go to? We don't have to. I, I, I just think it. Uh, yeah, my, we had a really substantial discussion with the TMA, and I did not get the feeling that uh, he had a plan to use that money. And um, you know, he was basically asking us to make some structural changes before we. I, I thought he, uh, my understanding, and, and then and it's attached here, right? There's the original thing that he sh they shared with us is here, is that they, they felt that they had sufficient demand to give out that many passes. But, the, um, yes. but um, so, <laughs> microphone. Oh, you're, uh, you're here. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so um, but. But it wasn't sustainable. No, right? no. I, I, I don't I, I'm I comfortable doing that. that. Microphone. I, 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 oh. So just one uh, clarification, <laughs> if I remember the TMA presentation correctly, the reason for the $720,000 annual contribution was to maintain the level of service that was presented in that PowerPoint. There had been a temporary surge, as I recall. Yes. Yeah, no, you'd, you'd, you'd pushed hard to make sure, see what was the maximum number you could get. Right, right, right. Uh, right. Right, right, right. So in... Uh, the quarter October through December 2018, we removed 332 cars. And the quarter January through March 2019, we removed 354 cars. So if we had budget, we could sustain that. And so scenario D would remove roughly 335 cars. So it's, it would keep that roughly steady. And we proved to ourselves we can go beyond that. So I, I remain comfortable with, thank you, with scenario C, as long as we are also doing some other work over the next six months or so to understand the interactions with, you know, the RPPs and whether or not, I guess the other thing that concerns me about just giving more money is that it's still all downtown, right? We're I, I can speak to that briefly. Um, I think that the TMA has expressed that it would be very open to being the Palo Alto wide TMA if the city were comfortable with that. We don't have to debate that tonight. I want to be respectful of the committee's time. But um, when this funding is released to the TMA, the contract will have to be updated. And so the council could give policy direction to staff when that contract is updated to say that this money can be used throughout Palo Alto or in other areas like Calab and downtown as the council sees fit. And the, and the TMA has indicated that they would be very comfortable with that. They'd like to be able to use the money where the demand is. Okay. So, so given all that, I'm, I'm still most comfortable with, with C and further work. Okay, so I'll, I'll make that motion, a substitute motion then. 
Or actually, it's not a substitute, is it? Um, oh, no, sorry. There was no so, scenario C, and as Councilwoman Cormack just said, you know, further work on these parking fee interactions. I don't think we need to flesh that out right now. Are you saying, similar to why I said that it would come back to, we would ask council to refer it back to the finance committee to look at So fees? Let, me, let me break this up. So one is scenario C, the funding level for the TMA. Two is to come well, that, back. No, it's include, raise the fees yes, and. Yes, raise the fees and do the funding to the TMA of that. 660. 660. And then I think this, so that's one piece. Um, and the second piece, I think, as you were mentioning, Councilmember Du Bois, is come back to or recommend to the council to come back to the finance for the finance committee to discuss permit fees more holistically. Right. Yeah. And improve the budgets. Tentatively and tentatively, and, and tentatively yeah. approve these two departments. But <laughs> sorry, so yeah. Yeah. sorry, we are getting so in the weeds on the parking permit yeah. fees. We forget everything else. And, and so that, yeah. that's three parts. I just want to make sure. I'm sure staff heard it, but part in part three that you know the, a variety of uses for the increase in fees. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Variety of possible uses. Okay. Second. And just to confirm that when you say tentatively approve the budget, you also include the other at places memo that I can't seem to find With the planning the and in community environment department reorganization. Yes, including the PCE reorg. Yes, although was there an offset for that? I wasn't quite sure I understood. Yes, what? there's a reserve in non salary that staff put away. Um, and so we'll, I'm sorry. It's your reserve, not our reserve? Uh, no, okay. not that. Okay. It's in the budget uncertainty reserve that was planned. Oh, yes. Okay, so we'll be changing, moving money from there to PCE. Okay. okay. Second. So, again, just, just so I'm clear, Steve, sorry, I didn't see you there the whole time. What I was trying to recount was not what's in his presentation, but what was our discussion. And again, the, the idea that each, every year these fees, which essentially we could use for anything else, uh, we can buy passes and give away as many passes as we want. And what we talked about was how do we get businesses engaged in our TMA? How do we make it sustaining from a funding perspective so that we're not taking these fees ongoing that we could be using for other transportation programs? Well, is that... And so, again, what, what we had talked about that night was what if we funded at less than the request level? Um, we're arguing over $60,000, so I will go along with this motion. But I just wanted to make clear that that's what I was talking about. Okay. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So I think we still need to talk about the special revenue funds, yep. the other ones. Yes. Can we let staff go for that's not involved with that? All of them are? Okay. Sorry, we're running just a little bit late, tr trying to keep on schedule. So let's quickly just look at the rest of the uh, special funds that we haven't discussed yet. Okay. I don't believe I had any questions about the other funds. I, I did. Anybody did? Go ahead. Um, page 97. So um, I've always wondered about all these Stanford funds, so it's been interesting to learn more. Um, am I reading this correctly in community health and safety that there's $2.7 million to be distributed to selected community health programs benefits just sitting there? We have no plans for it for the next five years. Yes, okay. Well, um, one thing that comes to mind is in other parts of the budget, we'll be talking about Project Safety Net. Um, That's where a lot of the money typically has come from, is from this fund. Yeah, but it's a small amount. I'm just thinking if, if, if this is one of the public-private partnerships we're thinking of making a transition, perhaps rather than just an operating fund, there could be some initial funding, and this seems like a really appropriate source that would be startup funding, and then so that's just one thought that comes to my mind um, when I saw that. Um, intermodal transit funds. Um, so it looks like there's also page 106. What did I have on that? 106. Um, is that something that would, you know, we're going to be doing this downtown coordinated area plan is that in this, is that something that we would use this for eventually? It's in the mix. Um, we will ultimately need to put together a funding package and this suggests or, or has uh, the involvement with Stanford. So we'll 
be part of the layer cake? It will be part of the layer <laughs> cake. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, mostly interested in the infrastructure one at the bottom, 10.5 million, which is a possibility for affordable housing. Again, no plan transfers. But I'm reading that correctly, that that's available for affordable housing. Should council wish to do that? Is it, is it infrastructure or is it the neighborhoods and communities and affordable housing? It says housing? infrastructure, comma, sustainable neighborhoods and communities, comma, and okay. affordable housing. It's just labeled differently in the, in the tables. Okay. Um, and then page 98 on climate change. Um, again, um, is this the, it's, could some of this money be used for the electrification efforts that we might be doing? We were talking earlier about, um, with utilities, about things they're interested in, rebates, or how to encourage people. I'm, I'm not familiar enough with this fund, unfortunately, so we'll get up to speed. It just occurs to me that um, that, that might be, um, there are a variety of things that we could use that for. Sure, and then uh, a sizable portion of the climate change one is for the um, bike ped plan that's part of the council infrastructure project, but obviously that's not all of it. Um, so we would need to get up to speed on whether or not that those electrification projects would be eligible based on the development agreement. I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, the biggest things that move the needle on yeah. climate change and yeah. that would be on that level. Understood. Okay, that was my questions on the special operating funds. So. So I'm, I thought that the, um, so just looking at the Stanford Fund in particular, I'm surprised there's so much money there for the community health because we've been funding Project Safety Net and then we also paid for Track Watch mm -hmm. and I thought we were running out. Yes, we did. <laughs> we did, okay. So was it re, refunded? Yeah. Uh, no, there there were different pots of funding for. <laughs> I'll stare. <laughs> um, let's, let's stare. There were different pots of funding um, for that were designated for those types of works, and so the pot that was designated, um, I want to believe the original amount was four million. I could be wrong, and it's that original four million pot um, that of the community health and safety kind of type work that was drained. Um, there was always this other piece that they didn't choose, they being the council hadn't chosen to allocate towards project thought, safety net specifically. I thought if I remember like out of that four million, half of it was supposed to be for youth and teens and half of it was supposed to be for like senior citizens. And so is there this remaining amount really more for senior citizens? Possibly you're getting beyond my knowledge base in terms of expertise on the intricacies of the pots. Uh, this is the, the so. loss of institutional memory uh, yes. that you have so with the, the folks in front of The amount that was of available for Project Safety Net and Track Watch, we pretty much spent Exhausted, all yes, I believe that's true. Yes, maybe then the a parking lot slash bike yes. rack issue could Good. be, could you just come back with, you know, what what restrictions, if any, remain on the funds that are still in mm -hmm. the yes, Stanford yes, University yes. Medical Center? That would yes. be helpful if yeah. I have a second for that. I think, I'd, yeah, it'd be really interesting. Okay, great, this. actually we have a third. And yeah, just am, am I correct in understanding on page, sorry, this, I'm jumping around, 206, project safety net transition is just a cost of 25,000? Is that the total we're spending on project safety net in this next fiscal year? What would that be then? Uh, no, I believe we're spending more than that, but that is the transition money that we just dropped in to help them plan for that transition. Okay. It wasn't necessarily intended to be seed funding and operating subsidy, it was truly for you know, do they need to do fundraising studies? Do they need to do, you know, what's necessary in order to spin out? So we wanted to allocate them some resources to ensure their success okay. of that. But previous level of city support was 270,000, so. Yeah. Correct. Yep, okay, so I, I like your idea. Anything else on special funds? Do we need a motion on that one or no? For the yes. parking lot item? It sounds like you guys split that from the original motion, so I have this clear in my head. The original motion that was approved with the app pieces and the, including the reorg and scenario C. Um, was three minus three A. Three minus three A, understood. Okay, so then yes, we would need a tentative motion for three A. So, should we make that or should we just wait for the parking lot? So there's a few cool. things that you could do. You could 
either put the entire section in the parking lot. You could make a tentative motion to approve section 3A with a follow-up item for staff to research the SCUMC funding in the parking lot um, to be returned as part of budget wrap-up. Okay, let's do the second one. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Nose, could you please repeat our motion? Of course. So, uh, tentatively approve item 3A, placing in the parking lot further information on SUMC funding um, restrictions. The, just for the Stanford Development Yes, Agreement. SUMC, SUMC, SUMC yes. Um, funding restrictions uh, as part of budget wrap-up. Second. Favor? Aye. Great. Okay, unless there's anything else, I think we're going to adjourn until uh, 6.15. 6.15? Right on. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and resume uh, item number four, which is the internal service departments. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yep, we're working on the screen to pull up the PowerPoint. Um, and moving on to internal service departments, and we have Jamie Perez here with uh, the Office of Management and Budget, who's going to help guide us through this. Hi. Um, the city's internal service departments, which include the administrative services, human resources, and in information technology departments. Um, I'll be presenting on behalf of OMB along with the department's respective directors. Um, Internal service departments serve as the backbone of the organization, providing internal business services to other city departments in support of the implementation and delivery of programs to the community. Departments are charged for these services based on their usage through internal service funds, as well as the general fund cost allocation plan. Um, internal service funds in these departments include the printing and mailing services fund for ASD, the general benefits general liabilities insurance program, retiree health benefits, and the workers' compensation funds for HR, and the technology fund for IT. In the case of IT, um, the department is fully budgeted in the technology fund on both the operating and capital side, and uh, department funds are located in the operating and capital books on the pages located on this slide. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off back to Kylie to start us off with ASD. Yep. Um, thank you, Jamie. So putting on a different hat, I guess, um, <laughs> instead of working on budget, before you is the services inventory for the administrative services department. Um, and so as you can see on this list, we have the typical kind of administrative functions such as uh, accounting, budget, um, we have the um, kind of usual payroll at, uh, and revenue collections teams, but in addition to that, we have the print and mailing services team, we have the real estate team, our purchasing team, as well as our warehouse team. Um, so the lion's share of the staff, accounting, and the office of management and budget are dedicated towards the kind of financial backbone of the organization, both the planning and the day-to-day -day accounting of all of the money that's moving around. Um, purchasing is obviously working on all of our goods and services, but primarily one of the biggest pieces that they've got right now is construction contracts and really large ones um, as we go forward with these pretty significant construction um, capital infrastructure investments. Uh, and the other largest um, division would be our printing and mailing services. So these are the individuals and uh, machines, frankly, that <laughs> produce your packets on a weekly basis. Um, and it's not just the council packets, let's be clear, it's also um, all of the commission packets for the, and the board packets and the committee packets as well. Um, <laughs> and it is an internal service fund, yes. So to all of your, uh, if you look at the blue line of revenue, um, actually I didn't orient you to this chart, I apologize. Uh, perfect. Um, the, it is an internal service fund, so everybody within the city is charged for their use of the print and mail services, uh, and it shows up in those allocated charges in departments and a revenue to the fund itself. Uh, we overshooted a, uh, the, we are not over cost recovery, uh, it's because we actually were under cost recovery in the prior year, so we're actually catching up in this fund as opposed to others. Um, as for what we've been spending our time on the last year, primarily the teams have been working on obviously the council's priority of increasing our contributions for pension to our trust fund, uh, also issuing the debt associated with our infrastructure um, plan. So we just successfully did the closing of our certificates of participation for the CalAV garage. Um, and in the coming year or two, we will be most likely looking at that again for both the uh, water plant, the water treatment plant, as well as the public safety building. Um, in the coming year, we will be heavy working and focusing on the implementation of that sustainability plan, uh, fiscal sustainability plan. So that's everything from a potential revenue generating ballot measure to the pension policy we were discussing earlier today. 
Um, also, as an internal service department, we've really noticed with our own staff turnover and the turnover within the organization, we kind of are focusing on back to basics, just of the training. And so procurement is a high area, high touch, high collaboration area that we would like to focus on both our internal staff and citywide training so that everybody's on the same page. Um, and then in certain areas, we're looking at uh, how do we evolve the services, uh, especially in areas like printing and mailing. And with that, I will turn it over to, I believe, Rumi. Yes. And she will go over HR. Great. Thank you, Kylie. Ruby Portillo, Human Resources Director, Chief People Officer. And I'm here to talk about human resources. We are a small but mighty department of 17 point some number of uh, FTEs. Um, we are organized in um, gr groupings th that are by specialty, so we handle benefits, um, personnel transactions, employee and labor relations, benefits, uh, risk management, and uh, workers' comp. And um, we uh, support the uh, close to 1,100 um, uh, workforce, uh, employee workforce. Um, we've, we've, um, we've focused this um, year on, or actually, I should just start out by saying that I've been here for about three and a half years now. And when I arrived at Palo Alto, um, our, um, our department was running short by about, uh, at one point, we had seven. Uh, vacancies. So our focus has really been on stabilizing the HR department. We are now um, carrying one vacancy and um, we have had difficulty in filling that because there is a shortage in uh, recruitment expertise out in the market. Um, we are, uh, in addition to uh, focusing on, the, on stabilizing the HR department, um, we have um, completed seven union contracts. And so stabilizing both the operating department of HR and then also the employee and labor relations function has really been our primary focus. Um, we have, go ahead. We have also, um, in addition to that, engaged with council quite a bit about the larger citywide issues around recruitment and retention. And so um, we have, um, we anticipate when we talk about in the development of um, our budget and focus for this year, it, for this upcoming year, is really around that larger recruitment and retention. Um, and um, we have presented some initiatives to council that, and have been in discussions um, around the, when we have been um, talking about the uh, union agreements. Um, <clears throat> we have also another area of focus for us is um, re-engaging our uh, training program. Uh, during the recessionary years, um, a lot of the focus on our internal training um, became decentralized, and so we're pulling that back together, and we have um, gone through an RFP process where we're bringing in a, uh, some experts in the field of training to pull together a citywide training plan. Um, we have also um, oversight of the workers' comp program, and um, we have, are seeing some stabilization there as well. And part of that is um, really we attribute to uh, council's approval of a position two years ago. And so we now have um, dedicated staff in the workers' comp area. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, what else can we talk about here? Let me go back to that. So, um, so we have, um, if, I, if I could just speak for a minute to the recruitment and retention issues, um, there are three main themes um, that uh, have really attributed, uh, there's been a convergence of both the aging of the workforce, um, which was a predicted one, and then um, we also have, um, uh, let's see, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so there was actually a number of issues. Um, there was the, the increasing recruitment, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the retirement uh, that was predicted. And then we also have the, the, the uh, transportation and housing issues that we have discussed quite a bit extensively with, with council. And um, so that and with the unemployment rates there in this area, which are regional and kind of larger than Palo Alto, it's just a convergence of all of those things. And as that has been hitting our entire area, then that's where we see that um, uh, in some in some ways that we're, we're experiencing the same things as other municipalities and having um, a lot of, um, of our resources that are having to um, look to be creative to try to uh, address that. <clears throat> so, 
Darren Numoto, Interim IT Director. So, sorry, um, we'll be dis discussing our services inventory and how it aligns with our five different divisions within IT. Um, first off, we have business operations, which aligns with the Office of the CIO and security, providing leadership and strategic direction for the city's use of technologies. Some of their core uh, functions are strategic planning, financial management, cybersecurity, and workforce development. Next, we have the project man management services, which is our project management office. And that manages IT projects as, as well as assist with department-ran projects as well. And their co another core responsibility is for project governance. You know, their goal is to promote standards, awareness, and education around project management best practices. Next, we have a, a slew of different services. Um, infrastructure services, telecommunications, application maintenance and replacement, desktop services and GIS, which aligns with the IT operations team. And, you know, their primary functions are implementing, supporting, and maintaining the use of technology citywide. Um, some of their services that they focus on are network and wireless services, servers, applications, any support, and telecom. And then next we have our ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning Support, which aligns with our enterprise division and partnering with the SAP functional team, providing leadership and support for the city's ERP systems. So, you know, um, this past year, what's working well. So most city project initiatives require some level of support from IT and collaboration with departments to ensure successful execution and delivery of technology. You know, we partner with city departments regarding opportunities to leverage technology that will improve our services to the community. Um, some notable projects that we completed in FY19 are noted in the presentation. All were very successful due to the cooperation and collaboration with the specific, specific city departments. Some of the examples are Fire MDC and RMS for uh, replacement. Both projects went very well and are great examples of how collaboration results in successful execution. MDM enable us to enroll all city-issued mobile devices um, into the program, which means we can securely manage and um, uh, inventory those devices as well. Data center consolidation enables us to reduce our physical footprint in our data center, which equates to reduction in power and um, cooling needs. And uh, we had an initiative to bring our city website in compliance with ADA, and that was very successful. You know, about over 2,400 pages that we had to view and edit and ensure they were compliant. So for this coming year, FY20, um, we have a lot of major initiatives that will kick off and some will continue in, you know, to the next fiscal year and beyond. One of the most notable will be the ERP upgrade, which is definitely going to be a multi-year project. Council Chambers, GIS, and the Next Generation website have the potential of bleeding into the next fiscal year, depending on when we can start executing. And then we have our police MDC, MDC replacement as well, um, which is going to be a large effort in coordination with the police department and OES. With that, I hand it over to OMB. Thank you. Um, okay, so to go over some of the um, recommended proposals in the budget, and uh, just a reminder, the diamond bullets for these items signify um, recommended reductions in order to work towards council's direction to prefund pension. Um, so in ASD, uh, this budget recommends rec uh, recognizing savings equivalent to 2.0 FTE for a total of $280,000 one time. Um, in IT, it reduces non-salary expenses in a variety of areas, totaling to a reduction of $350,000 ongoing. In, um, and with the reorganization of D DSD, the, that includes the transfer of the Business Registry Certificate Program to ASD, which includes um, $175,000 in revenue, $50,000 in contract expenses, and 1.0 FTE. And in HR, it recommends a um, addition of 0.48 part-time position on a temporary basis um, to assist in workers' compensation processing. And on the capital side, 
information technology technology capital investments include the city council chambers upgrade, which over the FY 2020 and five year CIP totals to 1.7 million. And then the continuation of the existing projects, um, existing seven projects for a total of 6.8 million over the five year CIP. Um, with that, staff is here to facilitate further review and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. First of all, I was remiss in not saying this earlier, the consistent three bullets of what's working well and where we plan to focus is very helpful. So thank you, whoever organized that and everyone for sticking with the program. Um, appreciate that. So just, I think I'll just for simplicity's sake go in order. Um, so that means, hmm? Why don't we do department by department? That's what I mean, like, yeah. yeah. Okay, so ASD first. Um, out of curiosity, we have a storekeeper. What does a storekeeper do? Just because it jumped right out at me, and I, I couldn't really come up with what that position did. Sure. These, uh, it's out at the warehouse. So we have a warehouse that stocks all kinds of supplies for everything from an orange cone to the, uh, the parts for all the utilities, the pipes, the valves, the, okay. I don't know. <laughs> it's not like, I mean, it's everything not like we're between. selling like City of Palo Alto no, 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 no. swag somewhere <laughs> in a corner. Actually, street. we are, but Actually, that's done yes. through a contract. <laughs> okay. No, the stormkeeper is out there at the warehouse. Okay. Um, let's see. The other thing that I wanted to say in here is, um, I see it, we're adding a person for treasury. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, that's just what Jamie alluded to, the transfer for the business um, registry certificate Oh, it's the one program. that comes from, oh yeah, Correct. that makes, so with that the, makes all the, the sense in the, the world. So with the switch of the programs, council added that staff. So okay. it's just a, a swap over. That makes all the sense in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then the interest rates, uh, rising interest rate environment. Sorry, I'm on page 180 of operating. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all fine. And what else did I have on this? Yeah, the moving the BRC made sense. And um, I had one other. What are um, what are the? I, I see this on so many things. It will be a, a contract services. So page one eighty eight. Um, just it's always a little hard to tell what the contract services are for. So 239,000 in FY 2020. Sure, so specifically on page 188 uh, is the printing and mailing services. So our contract services are either uh, typically the cost of the machines. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a contract with, um, let's see, there's co cost of machines there. No, no, this is printing and mailing. Hmm? Okay, so. I yeah, that's what, um, I couldn't remember the name. The machines, which is Xerox okay. and ARC, who have our, our copy machines. Okay. So I think that was all I had on ASD operating. Um, okay. Thank you for this. Uh, two quick questions on the presentation. So one, providing citywide procurement training on best practices. I guess what are those? And I know I've, I've heard a couple times floated around like green procurement practices. Is that something we're focusing on? Or? We have a green procurement policy. So we would, to the extent, be training the organization on how to abide by that green procurement policy. But it's really, the whole idea of it is, is um, you know, procurement is something that can really impede at times the flow of business uh, as you think about the construction projects or buying the materials that you need to do it. And as staff turns over, you know, there's certain steps that we take as a public agency based on both our own procurement code rules as well as the fact that it's taxpayer dollars. So it behooves us to make sure that the, the process is as streamlined as possible, frankly. And frankly, a lot of it is just knowledge gap, similar to, you know, us not knowing all the details earlier on some of the other items. With the turnover, people aren't aware of what Palo Alto's processes are. Okay. Um, and so let's just try and, you know, help them help us. Sure. And then my only other comment is on 176 and 177 under initiatives. I see at least, you know, 10 or a dozen here. Um, <laughs> just a comment, but that's all. <laughs> Prioritize your priorities. Um, 
So, so what is your plan for the business registry this year? From the business registry <coughs> perspective is uh, we currently have a contract with uh, Avenue Insights now um, that will expire this fall and we are going out to bid to continue to actually procure services for that um, on a, a longer term basis. Now the council has adopted the revenue generating uh, measure work plan and so we're working on executing that. So to the extent the business registry changes as a result of that work plan, then we'll adapt as necessary. But we'll keep them in parallel at this point. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't remember if you were there Monday night, but one of the public speakers talked about being able to log into your account and have your data from previous years rather than re-entering everything every year. That would be a nice feature. Um, <laughs> I, we yes, as the as the acting interim director, <laughs> outgoing, <laughs> um, who's currently holding the bag on that, uh, we did look into the issues that were raised on Monday night, and um, and it turns out that it actually does pre-populate. So we got a complaint from somebody who had had a, a little bit of user error challenges, and and customer service folks were trying to help them with that. Okay. Um, but it does pre-populate a little bit like the FC, F. PPC, uh, you know, do you need to change anything this year? If not, just recycle what you would put in uh, last that's year. That's good to hear. Yeah. yeah. That seemed like a major, major problem. <laughs> um, and I guess I'll ask you a question I asked earlier. Uh, so where did you feel squeezed out if in your budget? Like if, if you had extra money, is there anything you would do that you can't do? Oh, no. This is an interesting one for me because on one end, I'm responsible yeah, exactly. for making sure this thing balances <laughs> with, with Steve um, and with Ed. And on the other hand, um, we ourselves have our own, own aspects. Um, in all honesty, I think um, there are a number of the basics. I think we, the resources are, are in place and the staff knows how to do the basics. It's going above and beyond and being able to do things like exploring a ballot measure and being able to look at more complex financing options for either debt issuance or the pension um, research, um, et cetera, that I would say are the areas that are more typically resourced probably with just me or consultants. And I don't mean just me, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that, with a few of our kind of managers um, or consultants, and so oftentimes I think those are probably the areas that are squeezed the most because we can't not yeah. do some of the other basics it's like accounting. The long, longer term, more strategic, not not part of your everyday. Right. right, you have to put out a CAFR, so they were going to do that, and they will do it correctly, and we will do it um, with the utmost accuracy, transparency, et cetera, because we have to, it is law. <laughs> um, but the that more strategic look at things, I think, is probably where we are not as focused. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, should we move on to HR? Want to start it? Absolutely. Um, so um, first congratulations on the parental leave program. Thank you. I will say I was absolutely horrified that we did not have one. Um, so better late than never but and I think what we did is generous and appropriate and, you know, very beautifully uh, worded in terms of its inclusivity, but a really kind of, st I'm still horrified that we didn't have that, so just move on from that. <laughs> um, uh, I also see that you'll be working on a revised harassment prevention training this year, so I'm, I'm glad about that. I'm glad to know that that's happening. Um, in the key performance measures, um, so I've been to a lot of training programs, <laughs> and attendance is one proxy, but um, do we do surveys? Do we like track like people's, what people learn, that kind of thing? That seems like it might be a slightly better measure of, of a training program. Yeah, um, that is part of what we're looking at as we rebuild the training program. We okay. are really looking at by occupation group trying to, de to determine what's necessary training and then what's discretionary training. And along with that, we were, are building in feedback loops. Um, we also do quite a bit of promotional testing and there's other avenues for us to gather information about what training needs um, are throughout the organization. So yes, all of that okay. is to be I think considered. just feedback from participants, like would you recommend this to a friend type thing, you right. know, is, um, is pretty beneficial. Right. 
Um, and is, is three months, so 100 days, that's pretty standard to fill a position like in, in the industry? Yes, in civil service hiring, that is pretty typical. Okay. Yes. All righty. Um, let me see what else I had on that, on HR. That was it for HR operating. Thank you. And I know you're spending a lot of time on recruitment and retention. That just goes without saying. I don't need to reemphasize that. But thank you. Sure. Just one quick question on the recruitment and retention. Um, you mentioned, you know, we've got an aging workforce and people retiring. Um, so I would assume that we're kind of looking at a younger workforce to recruit. Um, and have you looked at kind of like comparables with some of the industries around here? I think part of the problem here in this region specifically is working for the city may not be quote unquote as sexy as working for a tech company, right? And, and what kind of comps we may need to offer in terms of that, whether it's, you know, remote work or I know we do our transit passes, like family planning things all of these tech companies offer. I'm just wondering around that. We are through the, some of the initiatives that we're, um, we're recommending. Those are uh, initiatives based on our own observations and some uh, limited data that we have. Um, but one of the things that we are doing is bringing on a staff person to help us with, uh, with the workforce polling um, and also to be looking at those kinds of issues. It's sort of an anecdotal right now and then also through some of the liter literature searches that we're, we're getting this information. But um, we have not commissioned our own uh, studies yet, um, but we do have an interest in doing that. Um, I think the thing is about government work is it is values-based work, and so that is an appeal um, that we can capitalize on. Um, it's not, uh, you know, always about the money and about the benefits, but we are finding a strong interest in identifying with um, service to the public, and then in terms of, um, you know, why people value the work and how it fits with work-life balance and that type of thing, and the flexibility um, is a huge factor that makes a difference. So do you, do you manage the commuting programs as part of HR? We, we have an existing benefit uh, for our employees. It's a pretty limited program right now, but it does sit in HR. It was previously in the transportation um, department or uh, um, unit and planning um, within the transportation staff, and it did transfer over um, maybe a year and a half ago. And so we have oversight of the, um, uh, we do some surveying, and then we also have um, the, the commute benefit uh, pretext. Yeah, it just seemed like it might be an interesting goal as well as like KPI to measure you know, satisfaction with commuting programs as well as, you know, both from an employee perspective and then also from a helping people get to work, you know, how many people are using the programs. That kind yes, of stuff. right. Um, right now we, ha we do um, have the GoPass program out of HR. Um, the thing is that we have limited information on that. We're, we are interested in, in getting more to find out how well it's utilized and how we can enhance uh, mm -hmm. some of the supplemental commuting benefits. Right. Well, we fund the TMA. And we're part of the TMA, right? Yes. Is that also part of HR? Um, that's actually out of the manager's office now. Um, for a limited time, I sat on the board, but that, that was a, a fill-in uh, yeah. assignment. And so our, our representative as an employer on the uh, TMA is actually Michelle. And so she sits in from that perspective as well as transportation managing the contract with the uh, TMA. So it's split. Yeah. yeah, I think of it more as an employer. Yes. Um, and I guess, do we do a lot of our recruiting with with our staff, or do you use external recruiters? We well? have a combination. We have um, in-house recruiters. We have a team of four right now, uh, supplemented by some um, hourly help, but we also have contracts with recruitment firms, and uh, we do have specialized recruiters for certain industries. So uh, how are you looking at that mix in this budget? Is it pretty much the same? last year? Uh, well, we do have greater recruiting needs. What we are doing right now is um, charging out to departments when we use an outside recruiter. And so they're pulling out of their salary savings in order to, to cover the cost of the recruiters. Um, an executive recruitment um, or a manager, uh, one that's contracted out is typically about $35,000 per recruitment. Um, so it's, it's, it's costly to, to uh, bring in the help. But often, you know, that's what's needed to, to yeah. find the talent pool. And then uh, maybe it's a question for Kylie. It doesn't, doesn't look like the, the HR department is really uh, built out to departments in general. Like, Sure. Uh, it is built out to departments, but it's not built out as a direct cost. Um, it's part of what's called the cost plan or cost allocation plan. 
Um, other organizations call it overhead. So it is uh, basically the equivalent of the internal service fund kind of allocation methodology that we showed um, the committee earlier today, but instead of it going through a separate fund, it's happening all within um, and between general fund departments. And, and that makes sense for things like payroll benefits, mm -hmm. but like recruiting, even with our in-house recruiting staff, it seems like you could allocate part of the, that people out we to do. the departments. We oh, do. Okay. But the numbers seem to match very closely. Uh, 17. Because budgeted. they're all budgeted in the general fund, hmm. but then they are recovered through a different mechanism, through the cost allocation plan. So, for example, utilities probably pays for, what, maybe 40%? Um, I want to say probably about 40% of the HR department, and you'll see that in the utilities allocated charges, and then in the HR department budget, you'll see it on page, <sighs> what page would it be on? Steve, it, over yeah, here. Steve it's on page know? 235, Yes. and you see it revenues, it's at the very bottom of the page, it's recognized as charges to other funds. And just a quick point of further clarification, what Kylie just explained is the mechanism for HR's general fund section. It actually does have internal service funds as well, and those are allocated through the internal service fund methodologies we talked about earlier. Okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah, so 1.9 million of HR's $3.8 million budget is charged out to departments. And so Rumi, last question, uh, like where, where did you feel squeezed in your budget this year? Um, well, the wish list is pretty long, but I tell you that, um, you know, the recruiting is definitely a challenge for us. We are finding ourselves having to re-recruit um, and to source. Um, so uh, where I think we're um, really looking for um, added resources or support is to try to um, ha build capacity in the department, and we are doing a lot of still manual work um, and things that ca could be automated um, through systems. And so because we've got a need that's expanding um, on the recruiting side and also in other areas like of, in benefits where it's getting more and more complex, we're needing to, uh, to try to look for efficiencies so that we can redeploy the resources over to the, uh, the expanding need areas. So um, I have always, um, I, you know, it feels to me as if we're about a position to a position and half short to really meet the recruiting um, and other n needs that are in, and so it constantly feels squeezed anyway. Um, but um, as those, uh, you know, as those needs are, it, it, it's sort of, um, it's exacerbated now in this environment. So I would say that, sup, you know, um, really looking at how to um, expand some of our uh, in-house capacity to um, on, uh, work, on workflow items. Um, I'll give an example of that is we, our performance evaluations are still handled manually right now. Um, there's a systems um, solution to it, but we don't have the capacity to put that into place. And so if we were able to automate that, that would be able to free up some resources to then address some of the recruitment retention issues. So if I heard you right too, do you use any online systems for recruiting? Uh, we do have a pretty robust um, uh, applicant tracking system and it does push out information and we do post um, electronically. We're pretty well connected in that way. Um, but we don't have um, the capacity and the dollars to really do active, a lot of active recruiting. Mm. Yep. Go ahead. So do you use LinkedIn? Uh, we have a piloted LinkedIn, but it was quite costly, and so we do not currently have an active um, relationship with LinkedIn. Wow. So I actually think Tom struck on something kind of interesting here. I'm, I'm hearing two sides. One is potentially there's a need for more recruiting, just bandwidth. The other is kind of automating some systems, whether it's recruiting, performance evaluations, et cetera. Um, is that a money problem or a people problem or kind of management? It's yep. it's both actually. I um, with s so um, there's hard dollars that would be needed in order to supplement some of the systems that we have to put contracts into place for services such as um, you know re uh, to expand the recruitment. But then there's also the people behind it that would have to um, staff. But if you had those systems, <coughs> couldn't you do? more work with the same people, I guess. So how? Yeah. 
if you could give us like a guesstimate, is like a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars? I mean, much more. Yeah. Can you can you just give us like a number that would help uh, with some of those systems? <clears throat> well, the yeah. reason why I'm hesitating here is because there's a part about the operations of HR, but there's also a greater workforce need that we have looked at some initiatives that had a fairly sizable price tag on that, and so um, I'm not sure whether the, you know so Ed, did we want to bring that into the picture because we had talked about some workforce initiatives that um, you know we were talking a considerable amount um, because that included the, the commuting um, addressing some of the succession planning uh, the over hiring or the overlap hiring and utilities so um, there's those needs so if you know so that is a you know a larger citywide need. Um, what I would be talking about is sort of immediate relief in human resources of say a position to a position and a half and some supplemental contract dollars. Um, but that I wouldn't want that to leave the impression that that actually would cover uh, you know some of the other yeah. things that we talked about. That, but I'm still a little confused. It sounds okay. like you want more consultant or staff, but. Uh, it sounds like if, if you use technology to automate, you'd have to pay for that as well, right? Right. And so could you kind of use existing staff to use that technology to, would that be a, uh, an improvement? Yes, it would be. I'm thinking that, um, so let's say, for example, an, an additional HR recruiter on staff, um, fully loaded, would probably be about, Kylie, a position about two hundred thousand, yeah. of uh, two hundred fifty thousand, two hundred fifty thousand for a fully loaded single position. Um, in addition to that, I would say we, you know, need to put in a, a contract <coughs> with LinkedIn. Uh, their quote was, um, they were willing to give us a government rate of fifty thousand dollars for an annual. Yeah. Their normal fees I guess like a hundred. So. What if you only had the fifty thousand dollars? Can your existing staff use that? Like, if if you couldn't get both. Uh, yeah, it would certainly help in terms of being able to do more out, uh, outreach and recruiting activity, sure. And that could be done by existing staff. Okay. I'm just thinking about what um, the vice mayor said. Um, I, I know a few young adults, and as far as they're concerned, if it's not LinkedIn, it actually doesn't exist. Like, they're like, jobs are on LinkedIn, and some of them don't, don't even use, you know, the actual web for mm -hmm. it. So, um, but I also heard you talking about performance management system, which is not going to be linked in, right? right? So one side is the recruiting, and then another side is that. Um, I'm, is this potentially a parking lot thing? We could ask for a little more. I'm, I think it is. I guess I'm still along Tom's line of question. Like, is it, you know, another $100,000 to do LinkedIn and some performance management tech? Or I'm also not sure if it's also just another person. But I don't. Yeah. Maybe we. But it, it seems like there's, there's something here. Yeah, I uh, I I would love to give it a little more thought and bring something back. It, uh, and and I think it would be helpful if I could just see the best. You know, really consider what's the best way to to deploy some extra resources. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to. We have a balanced budget here. Right. Um, right. But if there's some, again, uh, what I would be interested in hearing, if, if we put it in the parking lot, mm -hmm. and maybe we're going to go to IT next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is um. Yeah, are there a couple of like uh, cloud-based solutions out there that you could use with your existing staff that would help in different areas? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, we are. Um, I would say that recruitment in, uh, is our largest, uh, you know, our, our real area of um, challenge right now. And so, um, you know, the additional outreach, um, it, but how that gets done most, you know, effectively is something that uh, I'd like to consider. Okay, should we move on to IT sure. first? Um, Jeff, you want to start again? Just keep it going. Right on. Got a rhythm. Um, well, first of all, thank you for filling in. I know that's not always easy. <laughs> um, I do have a couple questions. Um, one is, when might we expect the Next Generation City website? So, um, we actually have awarded a vendor, and we're in contracting right now. Uh, let's see here. I have some dates for you. So targeted 
start date would be July August time frame if all works out well um, that could get pushed out a month or so and then it would we're targeting completion in FY 20 at some point probably mid to late FY 20 but without really engaging with the vendor it's going to be hard to anticipate with scheduling and so forth especially with the resources and city staff so um, the goal is to have it live by end of next year so like a year from now yes okay yeah. Yeah. thank you and a lot of it's timing with contracting and getting through legal and then engaging so and then and and does the will the plan incorporate um, an opportunity for people to give input and yes. feedback and suggestions as we go along yes most definitely so what will happen is we'll probably do at least four weeks of having a beta site that people can go and like my understanding is we did that with the current site and gave people the opportunity to give feedback and so forth, and then we would act on that feedback accordingly. Okay, great. And then I assume I'm on page 257 that the $5 million in contract services, this is SAP and some other things in there, no doubt? So 257 oh. in the operating. Yes. A lot of contracts. Yeah, services. there's. It's loaded with. A so it's something to keep in <laughs> mind as they're pulling up contracts is these would be contracts um, for potentially software services throughout this city. It's not just the IT department, so we centralize everything in the IT fund. Okay. Um, especially for enterprise-wide um, systems. Okay. Um, so the office of the CIO seemed like a large proportion of the cost in this in this um, section. Yes. So I know that um, you know we we had a structure, and you know that hopefully we'll have a new person on board. But it did seem like, given the number of people, um, that was a lot to be in one area. And I know every group is organized differently, but I just noted that. Um, and then I had a couple questions about how IT could could better support a few things. One would be, you know, generally communications with the community, and that's sort of like just a general question. How might um, information technology support better communications with the community? We we'll talk about, you know, whether it's a participatory democracy platform. Is, is IT the right place that, that, would, that would implement something like that? This yes, might be a question to it her. would be in partnership with different divisions within the city. Okay. Or, um, departments within the city for sure and um, we always have a hand in it and how it integrates to back-end systems to make it most seamless um, you know one of the challenges today is we do have a lot of different systems inside of the data so. yeah typically the CMO would be the lead on uh, being the client department um, <laughs> working with IT okay. on implementation and okay. selection all right so then there'll be a similar question like around RPP right which is you know been difficult um, to manage online so you would be in support of the Office of Transportation doing That's correct. that. Okay. Um, do you want me to stop there or do you want to go to Capitol too? Go, go to Capitol. Okay. Just, just IT Capitol, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, for clarification, IT is the only one of these departments with Capitol. Yes. Yeah. And I don't think I had too much here. Sorry, so I'm looking for it. Um, right, this is where the actually the SAP money is, right? I'm sorry, what are you referring Page to? Page 623. What's that That's the name? upgrade. That's yes, the 4.7 yes. is the upgrade. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, also page 626, infrastructure management system. Um, that's going to be awesome. I think that's going to make it easier for everybody. So I'm glad to see there's a little, like, process underneath that that's going to yes. make it easier to answer all these questions so that we always have on Monday nights. Um, and then there was something in the proposal, the overview, that I wasn't sure what this was. Um, was it on the first page, something about a civic innovation something or other? Yes, civic innovation program. Yeah, what is that? Um, is this, was this in IT, wasn't it, or yeah. no? Yeah. Sorry, I'm on the last page, page eight, the slide, slide number eight. So I see the reductions, but I don't know what the civic innovation program was. 
Oh, that was a, a fund that was meant to look at an innovative product solution that would benefit the city as a whole. Okay. And, and did, was, did we find some things that were innovative? And that's why we're moving it. Okay. It, was a, it was a fairly <laughs> small dollar amount. Okay. All righty. Um, and I think... That was it, but I do look forward to the utilities customer bill system improvements, or at least the other person in my household who pays the bills does look forward to that in 638, yes. just the utility one. Yes. Um, okay, that's what I had on IT. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, I was also going to ask about the civic innovation thing. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> on the mobile digital computers for fire and police, how often do we replace those? Um, we're on about a four-year replacement cycle. Is that pretty standard yes. for? Yeah. Okay. And okay. we actually went a little bit over this year, so we're probably in okay. our fifth, sixth year. Totally cool. It's just nice to hear. Um, one quick question on page 257 of the budget. CIP technology fund is going up 200%. Um, yep. What's going on with that and line? That's because of the um, council chambers and ERP project upgrade. Okay. So council chambers, I'm not going to poke that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> The ERP thing, and I'm sure Tom will have questions on this too. Sure. Um, I was under the impression it was roughly on hold. ERP? Yeah. ERP. And so can you give us a quick update about where we are, where we're going, sure. and how we're doing that? And there was an informational item that was presented in the council back in April, I believe, that kind of explained where we are and where we're heading towards. So really current status is we are working towards um, securing a vendor to help us upgrade our current infrastructure to the latest version of SAP. Okay. So we are just upgrading the current system. We're yes. not going up to bid for a new system. That's correct. And so the upgrade of the current system is 4 or $5 million. Um, It'll be, we'll be able to realize some cost savings there as well since we're upgrading. Okay. And compared to, if you could just ballpark me, what would like, you know, going out for bid and procuring a new system? Um, what would that look like? Yeah, within the... Proposal. Sorry, let me just pull that up. And then, kind of a follow up on that is if we are upgrading our current SAP system, um, how much of a how much runtime does that give us? So to answer your first question, you know, um, when we went out to R um, RFP for the original, looking at a new system, the lowest bid was in the ballpark of four plus million. We're ranging all the way up to tens of millions of dollars, of course. Okay. Um, so the choice in upgrading would be able to, would give us the ability to get to the current version of SAP mm -hmm. and provide and fill the gaps that was, um, or fill the gaps that were identified in a report that was done back in 2014, as well as provide a lot of fe new features and enhancements that would, um, increase efficiency throughout the city. Uh, right. The unfortunate thing with the current ERP system, it hasn't been really touched or upgraded for the past 10 years. So we're, you know, we got into a certain state now and that's where um, in upgrading the system, really it's more than an upgrade. We're replacing the infrastructure behind it and, you know, the okay. servers from the OS to the application layer and we're moving to um, a more progressive database which will set us up for future. Okay. So really this is a, this sets us up to be able to leverage future um, products from SAP as well. Okay. If, if you had to guess, I mean, like when, let's say we go through these upgrades, are approved, they get done, all is, is healthy. Um, when do you think we are, the city is looking at an ERP change? You mean um, when after would we the have upgrade? After the upgrade. Um, it's like four I would say then. minimum five years. You know, if we make the commitment to continually care and feed it, enhance it, um, it's going to, it will, it will serve the city for a long time. Okay. That's good to hear. I would just say in future budget years, be sure to make sure that this group knows to care and feed the system we upgrade. Understood. Thank you. Uh, first question is, uh, how is it going in this acting department? I'm enjoying it. You know, I, I, I really enjoy working with departments and figuring out and providing solutions and um, engaging and partnering with the different departments and you know the unique thing with Palo Alto of course we have a breadth of services that we support all the way from public safety to all the libraries that we have community service programs so yep. 
Good. Well, um, let's start off with the uh, KPIs. Uh, sure. It seemed like, you know, we are spending a lot of money on SAP and other enterprise systems. It seemed like some KPI around um, maybe department productivity or kind of use of these enterprise systems would be would be useful. Yeah, it, seems, it seems very kind of support desk focused. Understood. And we are looking at that and going to be enhancing our KPIs as well. Yeah. That's definitely a, a high priority within IT. I also had the impression, I, I, sorry, I've been looking at a lot of papers tonight, um, that your use of consultants and, and temps seems relatively low yes. for an IT, IT department. Yes. Is, that, is there a reason for that? or? Part of it is, you know, we've been able to recruit some highly um, skilled talent within IT that helps augment a lot of that and, you know, the staff that we have can fill a lot of those gaps. Um, and I was waiting for your other question. <laughs> <laughs> the last one that you asked everybody. Um, well, I'll get there. <laughs> and that kind of folds into that, but. Um, I wasn't so. was going to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, it just seems like uh, most IT departments want some flexibility and use more consultants. Yes, yeah. and, and that is, we do leverage that within SAP for um, professional services and as well for other projects where we need to you know, hire staff to, you know, with computer replacements where it's a, a kind of a time-based um, increase in workload um, that would help augment the staff. Yeah. Uh, just curious on the mobile device management project. Sure. Can employees use their own phones under that system? So currently, um, personal phones weren't included. Uh, okay. I would like to see them included as well in that. And the whole premise of doing that is to protect city data. Um, and we have the ability just to protect city data. So if for some reason somebody departed from the city, we can just remove the actual city data, city application for the phone most, as well. Most systems support that these yes. days, right? Yep. Is and it ours just does. It's just a policy It was issue? a decision at the point in time when we rolled it out. Okay. Yeah, I would, again, not really a budget point, but I, uh, I would support that at yes. some point. Yep. Um, so are we still running our own data center? Yes, or? we do. And do we also use kind of cloud-based data centers? Not at this point. Um, one of the one of the goals in our consolidation, we're virtualizing a lot of things, and we're making internal improvements to be able to leverage cloud for things such as disaster recovery or um, backup services and so forth. So it is a goal. Um, we've already reduced our footprint by at least forty plus percent um, within our data center. Um, you mean physical space? Yes, or? physical, actual yeah. rack space. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it must be some amount of overhead to run our own data center. You know, with the virtualized technology nowadays, it's not as cumbersome, you know, because we can combine many more systems into a smaller footprint. Um, and, you know, we're a Microsoft shop, so it makes it easier to manage, and we have the staff to do that. You know, and there's always that balance between outsourcing and the cost. You have, you know, the OpEx versus the CapEx. And since yeah. we already have the infrastructure in place, um, going out and spending a lot of dollars on hosted services um, could be, could impact our budget heavily. Mm -hmm. But we had other, yeah, I mean, but for things like the disaster recovery and yes. things, it could help. Definitely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are we constrained by regulations in terms of hosting stuff on premises versus in the cloud or? You know, because we're full public safety, there's certain things we have to abide by. And that's the same thing with Office 365. We're in their government tenant, which is the highest level of certified. Um, and Amazon and Google even now have government tenants as well. That. And then I, I noticed, and I guess it's up here, I mean, you, you cut back $350,000. Yeah. Um, what what are we losing or what did you a lot of it was in the professional services area which is uh the, just for various y projects yes to help supplement staff for various projects and you know in decrease timeline and delivery okay um page 257 under contract services here yeah, there was a drop of over six hundred thousand dollars is that just kind of more of the same? Also? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, is that kind of hamstringing you in any way, or 
It has a potential to. Um, that's where we're, you know, we might have to partner with other departments within the city to help fund certain initiatives they have within their departments. Okay. Um, and then I did have a question on the chamber upgrade. Yes. It's more for Kylie. Uh, is, <laughs> why do we use some of these funds? It just seemed like an odd assortment of funds. Okay. <laughs> Steve, you want to take that or do we do? Happy to take it. So I think the question from the chair was why are certain funds used as a funding source for that particular project? Um, and the, sh the short answer is that as an internal service fund, the technology fund benefits the entire organization. And so when they do a project like Chambers Upgrade, it benefits the entire organization. Um, so the airport fund, the airport has business that is heard by council in Chambers. Um, the utilities funds, their business is heard by council in Chambers. There's also a number of committees um, for utilities that use Chambers and all of those. So <coughs> this is a benefit to each of those funds, and so they contribute their fair share of it. Yeah. I mean, that's a fair point. We call it council chambers, but it's used for a lot of, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. do, you guys, do you guys think we're a benefit to the organization? <laughs> <laughs> I know some of us are. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah so I, I had had that. That was literally my first question as I went through all this. I'm like, why is the airport fund <laughs> yeah. paying for part of the council chambers? But you know, as Nose explained it to me, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's fair as long as everyone is contributing. So, so my last question I will ask you. Other, I mean, is it mainly in the outsourced services? Like, where did you know? Where are you worried about things in your budget, or where do you feel squeezed? Really, the um, professional services area to help with, you know, as Rumi was mentioning, you know, there, we have a lot of needs for enhancing our services and enhancing yeah. how we do business as a city, but that takes dollars and resources that, um, you know, we are constrained by, so. I mean, know. I think you have an uh, awesome opportunity, right? If, yes. If you can show uh, increased productivity, increased ROI, uh, I think council will fund projects, right? Yes. So I think those KPIs are critical. And just Agreed. If we can do more with technology, you know, with the same staff, it'll pay for itself. So, Agreed. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And that's where, you know, my focus would be is to help really shore up our internal services and set us up for yeah. um, enabling platforms. And that's the reason why we're upgrading SAP as well, because with right. our legacy inter, um, system interfacing is very difficult. With an upgraded system, it makes it much easier. But I'd, I'd really encourage you and your team, like if during the year, if there are projects that come up, I mean, frame them in terms of uh, productivity benefits, and you know, and then yep. you know, bring them up to definitely. the city manager. Yep, definitely. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Yep. I think I will tentatively move item four for approval. Um, and then I think we should talk about what we want a parking lot in terms of HR. Um, whether, so I would just. So before we go to HR, I'm just curious, uh, back with IT, I mean, are there other departments that have asked for things like HR that we should be aware of? There are a lot of different opportunities. You know, we work closely with the libraries and their systems and so, but you know, they're fairly self-sufficient, but we support them on the back end. Um, you know, there are other applications in um, both in uh, uh, yeah, utilities as well as, um, sorry, uh, the planning divisions, right, that will leverage. Um, our GIS upgrade will help facilitate some of that as well. Um, being able to offer different services that um, to to the city or different information is, to the city. Is there anything in the SAP upgrade that would help in um, HR? Yeah, there definitely are opportunities. Once we get to a new platform, there are other modules within SAP we'd be able to leverage, yes. Okay. No, no, so I'm, I'm just going to tentatively move this section, um, but then it sounded like we may want to parking lot something for HR. And so I'm wondering if you guys can help me. Yeah. And uh, Rumi just pointed out, that. sorry, um, sorry to interrupt, but Rumi just pointed out one of the opportunities would be integrating NeoGov, which is our recruiting platform with SAP. So we have um, ch exchange of information with both systems. Just thinking, awarding, um, you know, something about a modest 
you know, request for, you know, initiative to support um, recruitment specifically. It sounded more like to support recruitment. So we're fun. open to considering a modest request from HR to support recruitment. Yeah. In the parking yeah, lot? I think, again, if it's scalable, like I think we're mainly talking about software. Ms. Nose looks as if she would like me to refine that wording. I'm just not sure I understand what, would, what the committee wants back. Do you want a proposal from staff to come back on what we would spend some um, amount of money on? Yes. Like, you know, wrap up? One or two ideas about, you know, if we gave HR an additional 50,000, 100,000. Okay, Maybe and that's a little the bit more. I was going to say, if you yes. can yeah. add some sort of level of magnitude, what does modest mean? I mean, is modest two hundred thousand is modest. Yes, uh, fifty to one hundred thousand. Beautiful. Those are just the little. Pieces. Maybe one above that. Like I, I would be happy to hear it at least. You know. <laughs> Good. Right, so, do you want to? Did we specifically say software solutions, or we're we're clear enough? I think so. I mean, with that amount of money, I don't think you can hire anybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, just one quick point of clarification for the motion. If council members could include that the motion does include the relevant internal service funds as well, that'd be very helpful. Yes, it includes the relevant internal service funds. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks all the staff. Thanks for being here. Sorry. Let's start asking the reverse question. So if you had to cut some more, would you do that? <laughs> Last item of the night, which is the um, okay. city council appointed officials. I guess we're starting with city attorney. So we'll do a quick read into the service area from Kayla Shapiro with the Office of Management and Budget, and then we'll pass it to Molly. Good evening, council members. Uh, again, my name is Kayla Shapiro. I'm with the budget office. We are now at item number five on the agenda, the council appointees, uh, all of whom are responsible for the administration of this great city. Uh, this includes the city attorney, city auditor, city clerk, and city manager. And in this section, we will also cover the city council's budget. You can find these sections in the operating budget book, starting on page 121. And now we can transition to City Attorney Molly Stump, who will begin this section by sharing information from the City Attorney's Office Services Inventory. Great, thank you. Good evening, committee members. Nice to see you all. Um, let's just roll in. Here is our uh, overview of our services, and this is a much simpler um, chart than I think you've spent the day looking at. Uh, <laughs> Our, our work, th this is a very high level look at our work. Um, most of our work involves what we call consultation and advisory. That includes all the transactions, the legislative work, the legal advice that we do, the compliance work. Um, and the next uh, biggest section is litigation and dispute resolution. And then there's an, a smaller section there for um, our uh, continuing legal education, our business operations, those kinds of things. Um, of course, diving down deeper than this, what you'd see is a mirror of the whole city's budget because what we do is really a layer on top of everything else that you've been seeing. We, we have the legal services piece that supports all 
all of the rest of the work in the legal arena. So very briefly, what's working well, we, we did some very successful hiring and onboarding and we're uh, fully staffed at the moment upstairs, which is wonderful. We have a very strong team of very dedicated public servants who are um, smart and capable in their specialty areas and very um, much devoted to the public interest. Um, we did a lot of uh, good work this year, I think, um, supporting council priorities in the areas of housing, environmental services. Um, we did the legal work to support the Pets in Need partnership, um, some of the other um, uh, key uh, public-private partnerships that have uh, become significant in the city and the infrastructure work. That's such a big part of what we're doing here. Um, we also um, took our training programs up a notch this year. Um, we did do uh, training um, uh, for uh, public works and utilities folks on construction, on the management and administration phase of construction uh, contracting, which is an area where our folks are spending more time uh, and, and doing bigger and more complicated projects. Um, so those are just a few highlights. Um, where we plan to focus in the future, um, we I think we find, as I think you would recognize, that we're spending quite a bit of time talking about um, changing in new mandates from the state and from the federal government as well that are of great interest to, to us here in, on, at the local level. And we're helping to support that with legal advice um, and potentially ordinances and uh, there could be other aspects as well. We are focusing um, we always have, it's part of our regular core work, but we are seeing maybe some increased intensity around um, dispute resolution, which needs to be paired with really strong advocacy in order to effectively uh, resolve disputes. And the, the details on those kinds of things, of course, we work with you um, in a confidential setting to, to talk about. Um, and then we are also spending time supporting all of the wonderful new managers and staff that are coming into project, key project positions in the city. Um, we find uh, on the eighth floor that we, we do have some of the more experienced folks who've been now around for quite some time. And so uh, we are in a position to help folks um, come up to speed fully and get integrated into the city's processes um, so they can be successful. So that's going too far. That's going to be Dawn. Do I pass it on now or do they? Okay, great. Well, good evening, Chair de Bois and council members. Uh, this is our first time meeting. I think my name is Dawn Rhodes and I'm helping out in the city auditor's office. I believe this is my sixth week. So um, we're getting things back on track. Um, I was also allotted um, just two slides from the budget <laughs> office. Thank you <laughs> for that. So, and have, if, it, if it's possible, that I think an even more straightforward situation than, the, than Molly's. Yeah, just <laughs> two slices of, of the pie here. So working with Steve, we tried to break down the best way we could just to, to show the department. But really, it does break down uh, in a big sense into um, performance audits, which is the bulk of what we do, actually looking at different areas according to the audit work plan. Uh, that was uh, approved last November. And then the external monitoring reporting, our office oversees the external auditors that come and do the financial audit of the, of the city, um, as well as, um, at least up till now, the performance auditing program, the National Citizen Survey, things like that. So there are some non-performance auditing pieces, so we just wanted to show that representation a little bit just to give you that breakdown. And then uh, what's working well, we just uh, decided to select, this are these are just some of the audits that were worked on um, last year and uh, so such as the code enforcement audit. There were several uh, ERP audits that were done uh, last year um, surrounding data governance, standardization, separation of duties. There are actually several more on the work plan, not to get uh, too far off track, but there are actually several more e ERP audits on the work plan. Um, that in light of the change in uh, direction with the ERP that you just heard about a little bit earlier, we might kind of want to rethink about uh, whether that still makes sense since we're keeping the same system. In some cases it might, in some cases it might not. But we had some of those uh, this past year and then as well as we, uh, the performance report and the National Citizen Survey. As far as where we plan to focus, uh, again, we just selected some of the audits that are on the work plan that um, either uh, we haven't begun yet or we, we began, but they were on hold for a while. The, um, um, the office, we, we were on hold for a few months there. Some things didn't move forward uh, a little bit, uh, but we're, we're moving them forward now. So one of them is a transferable development rights audit. Uh, we uh, began that one last uh, summer, but because of staffing issues, um, and both the departments we were auditing and our own department, uh, that got put on hold. So we're, we've picked that back up again. Contract risk and oversight audit, 
um, and then an audit of the, the SCADA system is on the uh, work plan. Um, and then one uh, item to um, highlight is uh, that we are also looking at um, doing an organizational assessment. The council has approved a contract to bring in a firm to do an organizational assessment of the city auditor's office uh, in order to give that a, um, a good look as far as um, how, how we look um, according to comparable cities and, and um, you know, that sort of thing. So that, that'll be a, a major effort underway in our offices as well. And that's my two slides. Okay. We want to see your pie. How many slices do you have? I do have a few more slices. Wow. So looking at my pie chart, <laughs> the uh, biggest part of the chart is for transparent leg legislative process. And that deals with the um, agendas, the reports, everything that we post online um, and take care of for the, the citizens and for council. It's the public records requests um, and all that information. Um, election services, 8.5%. Luckily this year we won't have an election. We'll have one next year, which will be uh, quite large, I believe, between council members and initiatives. Um, so that will have a bigger slice. Um, administrative services, uh, one of my staff members um, helps oversee the administrative citation and works with um, contract uh, lawyers, attorneys, that hold these hearings. And um, they're anything from, um, gosh, I can't even think of all the ones that they do. Um, they're parking. Parking, mm -hmm. um, the um, marketplaces, the two markets. Um, she oversees that and works with them on that. Um, public noticing and engagement, um, and then business operations. What is working well? Um, as you know, my deputy got hired away to the city of Sunnyvale. So even with his leaving right now and with everybody cross-trained, um, we are maintaining the workload, even with the short staffing. I wouldn't want to continue this for a long time. Um, but we're maintaining it. Um, increased transparency. We're taking all of our older ordinances and resolutions and linking them up into the internet. So when staff or the public want to look at um, ordinances that passed back in right now, 1960, to current, we have those all online um, and are going to be moving backwards as far as we can with all the ordinances and resolutions. So there's a extra step of transparency that we're trying to get out there for the public and staff. Um, and cross-training of staff. Um, administrative staff are clerking the council standing committee meetings. So that's leaving Jessica and I able to focus on clerking the uh, council meetings. And it's also increasing the um, knowledge that my administrative staff have on, um, you know, working with standing committees. Um, where we plan to focus is the hire and training of the new deputy city clerk. They did uh, phone interviews yesterday, so we'll be doing interviews um, of candidates within the next two weeks and see where we go from there. Uh, Chambers upgrade is going to be a big part for us. I'm sorry. Whoops, let me go back. Chambers upgrade is, um, we'll be involved in that. Um, and then the board and commission application process. Um, I've been working with a BEAM student from Gunn High School who is looking at our application process and she's done a wonderful job. We're actually going to uh, bring her to the council meeting on Monday to introduce her and Christine Seismas from the BEAM project to, uh, to tell us all about it. And that ends mine. Yes, it's, uh, we should have uh, the clicker. done the seating arrangements a little better. All right, just to wrap up. Oh, and by the way, as we look at the look at the pie chart, um, just a comment on recognize, uh, acknowledging the work that has gone into these pie charts. These are the service inventory. Um, uh, information that has been a significant work effort across the city over the last several months and and um, not to let the the moment slip by this is more information than has 
typically been provided in the uh, uh, this budget process and, and certainly the Finance Committee review by having this basically big picture of on a dollar basis where do where does the funding that um, is allocated to each of our offices and the departments that you've heard so far uh, translate into the programs or services that we provide. Um, as noted earlier, these are a work in progress. Uh, the definitions of the programs uh, could certainly always be debated and, and uh, as a result, this is our cut at it um, that has been largely led uh, by the budget office. So really want to appreciate their, their work um, in helping guide some consistency in how this is looked at across all of the departments. Okay, then turning back to CMO, um, so I'm fond of saying the city manager's office is in effect the glue between the council and the department operations, the council's policy direction and, and what the departments would either by inertia or on their own initiative be focused, we, we do provide the glue or sometimes the rubber band uh, between uh, the direction uh, from the council and uh, the operations of the individual departments. So as you look at this uh, pie chart, you see a variety of what our office does in supporting and facilitating the council's legislative actions to uh, the special projects that we take on on an ongoing basis and the um, individual uh, both programs and the direction and leadership we provide to the individual departments. Inherently, being the glue or the rubber band requires our office to be very flexible in where we spend our time, sort of a rubber glue <laughs> as the case may be. And, um, as a result, um, and perhaps uh, unfortunately, what tends to get squeezed is the yellow slice here. And so the support that's provided to the workforce, whether it be specific programs or, or initiatives that we're trying to um, uh, lead uh, for the organization, depending on the needs on, on a triage uh, basis uh, to focus in other areas and the needs of the organization and based on council direction. Let's see. So moving to uh, the what's working well and uh, where we plan to focus, the um, city manager's office does have a business model as it relates to specific projects, a few examples of which you see here. And it is, as I like to refer to it, as uh, our model of triage, uh, stabilize, and delegate, or um, ideally in a, a, a perfect world, rather than delegate, it's declare, declare success on an issue. Unfortunately, so many of the issues we take on do require uh, ongoing management and resource allocation. Uh, so the triage in identifying, working with the council where uh, the uh, city's energy, the organization's energy needs to be focused in order to address a community need, if it's generated externally, or a priority as if it's generated by the council and then to stabilize and identify how to organize around the issue uh, being where the city manager's office uh, focuses and then ultimately once an issue is stabilized ideally to delegate it to a department uh, in a form that a department can run with a program or incorporate it and balance existing uh, resource allocations. So that's the model we use for special projects. Rail is sort of the mother of all of those uh, um, immediate issues that need lots of resources and even more uh, given the transitions in our transportation staff and uh, then how that then ultimately uh, over the course of time has been now put together into a work plan and ultimately will be turned into projects and at some point be able to declare success on them. Uh, so again, we've got a few other examples and uh, as far as uh, where we plan to focus in the upcoming year, uh, as the council's already seen, we've now got work plans on each of the council uh, priorities and uh, we'll be executing on those uh, over the course of the next several months and years. Uh, and. Uh, Beyond that, uh, once again, uh, really want to focus uh, to a greater extent and with higher visibility on uh, providing support to the workforce that does address many of the issues that we've already talked about today. So with that, I think we'll stop. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, everybody. Uh, we will have Kayla just go over the, the last highlights, I think, and then we'll, we'll turn back to the committee. All right. Uh, yeah, we have a high-level overview of the proposed budget actions from these departments. Uh, this year, there uh, are beginning $16,000 in ongoing reductions in non-salary expenses in the city clerk's office. This reflects about a 4.5% reduction in their total non-salary budget. 
Next, we have a $250,000 one-time investment in recruitment and retention initiatives in the city manager's office budget. This complements additional funding recommended earlier today in the non-departmental budget for a total general fund investment of $750,000. Then there is a $100,000 one-time expense in the city manager's budget to continue implementation of the Sustainability and Climate Action Plan, also known as the SCAP in support of the City Council's 2019 priority of addressing climate change. Then there is a cost neutral action in the City Manager's office to align staffing resources commensurate with the needs of the office. And one item that's not on this slide, uh, but was discussed earlier today and just as a reminder to us all, the parking citation review is recommended to be reallocated from the City Clerk's office to the newly established Office of Transportation. And there are no budget proposals from the offices of the city attorney or the city auditor or the city council. However, it is important to note that both the offices of the city attorney and auditor have eliminated positions in fiscal year 2019 as part of the city's ongoing fiscal sustainability efforts. And with that, staff is available for any questions that you may have. You guys don't want the council pie chart. <laughs> 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 Thank you for that right. pie. <laughs> so let's do it uh, one CAO at a time. So you want to do city attorney, Allison? Sure. I'm happy to go first. Um, mostly I'm happy to see that the mythical bike bridge, I know that the city manager loves it when I call it that, it got negotiated last year, page 123. Thank you. Still looking forward to it. Just a small joke. No, but the only question I really have with uh, the city attorney's office and um, is traditionally when you have an in-house team and there's always a question of how much do we do in-house and how much do we spend externally. I didn't hear you discuss that, so presumably you're comfortable with, you know, the expertise you have in-house and then the people that you retain outside for specialty areas. But if you could just touch on that, that's the only question I have in this area. Sure, thank you very much for that. So Palo Alto does use a hybrid system for legal services and I think um, it is the best system. So we do have a robust in-house department and we do almost all of our transactional work, our advice, our compliance work and training work in-house. Um, our lawyers are specialists in municipal law in their particular area and are very efficient, get to know the departments and our business operations and so are able to be very efficient in their work and we are lower cost than uh, all, almost all of our outside counsel and certainly on average quite a bit lower cost. Um, we do occasionally use a highly specialized transactional uh, counsel to assist us in areas that are very specialized where we don't practice um, frequently. For example, right now we have some real estate transactions that are fairly sophisticated and so we will consult with an outside expert to make sure that um, we get those documented correctly. We, on, on the flip side, we do send most of our litigation out to outside counsel. And that is a, a standard um, solid practice. Um, litigation is very disruptive in, in terms of the, um, the way that the, the timing works on it. So it's hard, very hard to integrate that um, with the regular ongoing advice needs of, of our clients. And when you have try to do both types of practice, um, you inevitably um, don't, don't get to the contract review and the transaction documentation because you're, you're doing the court work. Um, so, so what we do very actively manage our outside counsel um, more than most cities. So we are involved in all the strategic decisions uh, on our cases. Uh, we review significant briefs. Uh, we attend mediations and settlement conferences. Um, and so I think the system uh, works quite well and I'd recommend that it be continued. I would note for the council one concern that I have had and uh, budget office is aware of this and we're watching this together. Our litigation uh, costs do tend to fluctuate year to year and that's due to our size. Um, litigation, the, the cost of, of defending the city um, uh, is, is something that we have to incur and it, the, it, the significance of it varies depending on what's going on in the cases, which we have some control over, but to a great degree we do not control. We need to respond 
to what comes in the door and what happens in the world. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to predict, but there, we do see patterns over time, and we're coming off a period of somewhat higher expenditures. Um, this year, our outside council budget um, is smaller than it was last year, because last year when we did give up a position, uh, the budget office assisted us with some one-time one funding for litigation. So um, we, given what's on our plate, what we see in our current litigation portfolio, and then the potential suits that we're aware of and working to resolve, there is a fair likelihood that we are un under-resourced on outside council costs. So we'll work with the budget office and we'll watch that and we may need to come back to council at the mid-year to, to supplement that, that activity. And of course, if there are new initiatives um, that have a significant li uh, litigation component, um, those also will need to be talking as we, we are working on those issues, we'll need to be talking about the costs and how we're gonna fund those. Thanks. Thank you for this. Um, that one question about the resourcing for outside counsel was helpful, or the answer there. Um, on the focus areas of changing state and federal mandates, um, I guess from an outsider's perspective, sometimes it seems like we spend a lot of people and money and time responding to these things. And I'm just wondering if long term there's kind of a smarter, more efficient strategy around some of this, something of things like, you know, wireless or real estate. Um, like what, what are other cities doing around this? So, so this is a very good question. Um, the, and something that we watch and discuss on the staff side and try to bring to council for your consideration at the appropriate time. It is always a, a balancing act and it's ultimately a policy decision, how much time council wants to spend on these kinds of things. Um, except, of course, in instances where we are actually um, sued, and then, and then we must respond. Um, in the wireless, for example, we did have an extensive effort recently to try to put in place a more streamlined process where a set of decisions would get made up front that could be then applied at the staff level in a more efficient manner. Um, we will see um, if that uh, bears fruit. Um, frankly, that's one area where we are spending a very significant amount of time, both on the staff side and in the legal office, um, on each of those applications, each very small transaction. So that that one we think is ripe for, uh, hopefully the legal environment will settle down, uh, the rules will become more stable over time, that hasn't happened yet, but perhaps we're getting to a point. And then, you know, we hope that the city will get to a place where it's comfortable with a set of standards and decisions that can then be applied in a more streamlined way, as opposed to treating each uh, application as an exception Customs process. Standard. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> Actually, I had this question for IT as well. The there's a difference on the the budget staffing versus the org chart. Um, so, what, what's the difference there? <laughs> so. Um, it, Sharp eyes. So there are um, uh, one and a half, I think, um, legal analysts will tell me if I'm wrong about that, um, positions in the legal office that are funded out of the utilities department. Okay. And um, b both of those folks, they're, they're lawyers, they do legal work and they're supervised um, and managed in my office, but they are um, paid uh, for by utilities. Um, one of those positions is reflected in our org chart and the other one sitting in the utilities department and for the life of me, although it's been explained to me, don't really understand why. <laughs> yeah. Do they report to you? They do. Okay. Yeah. So Steve Guagliardo, Office of Management and Budget. This is something you'll see in various departments as we get into departments that are funded through other mechanisms other than the general fund. The org chart at the beginning of this section reflects where people sit and where they report. The budget reconciliation table reflects where they're actually budgeted. Yep. So if you go to the utilities section, you would see those uh, attorney positions budgeted there in the table of org. But, um, and I meant to ask on the, but the IT budget was the inverse. There were more people budgeted that were in the org chart. Yeah, so, right, exactly. So there are certain staff um, that are budgeted in IT that report to ASD. For example, the uh, SAP functional team is budgeted in the IT fund, but because they work with payroll, because they work with HR, they sit and report in ASD since that's the nexus of the work. Okay, thank you. So, so I also had a lot of questions around the contract services. So 
So you are taking a decrease this year of $100,000, it looks like. Yes, yeah, so I think you're referring to the, that was one-time funding from, from last year. Okay. That was part of the savings that were achieved through the elimination of an administrative position in my office. Yeah. And we did discuss that we, we knew we would have some needs for funding litigation, and so that money was yeah. allotted and that's for that. gone down substantially. It was a million dollars in 2017, and you still had 11 people then. That's right. So how, how has that happened? So it happens because litigation, um, the, the costs of defending can, can vary depending on what's going on with your cases, the number, the type, okay. the nature, and the intensity of activity. So the, but there's a separate line for litigation dispute resolution. Those are, that's not the outsourced service, that's the actual money to, so, to settle the case? No. no. That, that line is the staff in my office that do that work. So we, that's um, so claims administration. Together. So before something becomes a lawsuit, a government claim must be filed and we investigate and resolve those claims. Very occasionally we bring them to council. So you may remember um, hearing about a few of the more significant dollar ones, but there are many of them that are small and are resolved uh, administratively in my office. So, and, and then we also are overseeing and managing the whole litigation portfolio. So that's what that line is, our, okay. our internal staff. So then for our internal staff, and this may be for Kylie or Molly, I'm not sure. Our litigation dispute resolution dollars, they have actual amounts for 2018. Do we do we know what the actual amount was 2019? Or not yet? Well, we're in the middle of that year, yeah. so. But it just dropped quite significantly, it seems like. It, it will get bigger before we finish the fiscal year. Okay. But you're budgeting 700000 where it's been a million dollars previous years. Right. So we are we are seeing this is again the litigation costs are cyclical and we are seeing them and it's a good thing um, uh, in the downward trend um, for a variety of reasons um, that probably if we can explore in terms of talking about our, the specifics of our cases and where they are. But it sounded like you were kind of cautioning us that it might not be enough. So I'm just wondering, should we be budgeting more? So it's a discussion, and we have ha have talked to budget about this whether. There are different schools of thought. We, when you budget funds for litigation, if we don't need to use it, if we resolve our cases or they're less expensive to defend, we, we won't use it. It's, it's not like other project money that there's always something else to do. Yeah. Um, so if the city wanted to, to allocate more funds up front so that those, that decision was made and the funds were there sufficient to go through the year, you could do that. If what we have sort of decided to do is to watch and see how we're doing, and then at the mid-year, uh, come back and advise yeah. council. And I budget may have I mean, comments. Rather than, yeah, request money in the mid-year, why not, why not use what, at least a reasonable amount? Just, it looks low based on history. I mean, how did you guys come up with 700,000? Right, so that $700,000 in 2020 reflects kind of the annualized amount um, from the prior year, which did have that additional $100,000 in it. Um, to Molly's point, you know, there are different ways of approaching this. Should the council so choose, you could certainly allocate the funding at the beginning of the year. And if it wasn't spent through the year, it could be captured at year end when we do the reporting and closed out that way. Alternatively, an option could be to see where we're at. To Molly's point, um, there's a fair likelihood that we would need additional funding we should be able to monitor that through the first five months of the fiscal year and report back to council should additional funding be necessary. Sure, I understand that. I guess my question is, we, we probably want the best guess we could make. And um, so if you look at the three-year average, it seems like it would be higher, right? So I'm just asking, like, are we anticipating needing to ask for more money or is this our best estimate? I think it's, that's, Molly can help us in terms of where we're at in the litigation that's active and whether or not those costs will come to fruition over the course of the next 18 months. Um, we absolutely, if the, the committee wants to allocate some money towards the attorney's office right now um, in advance, that is 100% something that is a feasible and legitimate option. Yeah. Uh, so again, I, I understand we could do it. I'm asking, like, is this your is, like, I mean, highest probability? Do you feel... I have to ask Molly on how yeah. how probable it is that it will materialize. My suspicion is high, but yes, I think that the the budgeted funds reflected in this budget are unlikely to cover our uh, litigation defense needs through the entire year. I think it is likely that we will come back at mid year and and see that we need additional funds. 
what number would you say would you be comfortable with is likely? So you mean like a total of 900,000? Mm-hmm. Correct. Um, your 2018 actuals, uh, in terms of your kind of contract services, which is where you're going to see some of that outside council costs, are probably more realistic, so to speak. So. Yeah, I think that's correct. There's some carryover that happened between the years uh, because we had encumbered money with some outside contractors. So I'm not saying that 900,000 is the right number for contract services in 2020, but um, the last few years when we've been pulling money or doing year end cleanups, it's been anywhere between one to two hundred thousand dollars. So I'm looking at I'm looking at the litigation dispute resolution line, mm -hmm. and are you also looking at the contract services? Ones? Correct. Yes. They're both. So the litigation and dispute resolution is going to be both non-salary and salary, because that's dollars by division. And then the one below dollars by category are going to be dollars by budget group. Got it. So they will total the same way, just slicing and dicing numbers in different ways. That's all. So I don't may, know how my colleagues feel about this. Can I, can yep. I just jump in on this? Um, how have we budgeted for, for this line item in the past? So. Uh, a combination of ways. There's been a base budget that I think has been in place for quite a few years, and we may have actually adjusted that slightly. All right, good. Um, also, there has been a separate contingency fund, um, which for a number of years early in my tenure and before I got here was 250000 and was later reduced to 100000 So there's a separate contingency fund that tends to get drawn towards the end of the year when we're looking for dollars to pay lawyers. Um, and then one reason that you see the, the higher numbers uh, a few years ago, um, there was a period where we had a few vacancies in my office and we were able to use some salary savings to fund what were um, higher than typical outside counsel fees um, for, for that year. So that mechanism was available. And one of our sort of things that we've noted is that now that we've achieved a, a more complete level of staffing, those funds, that source of funds will not be available to make the budget work. So this is one of those budget items that I think is, is less predictable than some of the other ones. So while I would usually be a big fan of, you know, let's pick the best number at the beginning of the year, uh, it, to me actually it has some appeal to be like, hey, let's check in halfway through the year see you're going to have six months more of information at that point about what you've spent and what we might need to spend and we might also have some a better sense of what's going on on the revenue side so there's also probably some benefit from <laughs> keeping that pot of money tight enough to make sure that um you know everyone's making appropriate decisions so I, i'd usually be on on the side of yeah let's bump it up a little bit but i, I think because this one is less predictable than just about anything else we've seen today that I would be comfortable coming back in in the mid-year but but I hear your concern so I'm I'm open to to doing something but that does not I think preclude us from doing a a mid-year check-in yeah, I think that's reasonable I just really wanted to understand how confident we were it didn't sound like I was that confident but I think it's hard to predict well sure but it does feel like even now we think it's low <laughs> so um, okay, so should we move on to auditor? Yeah. It's again, going in, in order again. Um, thank you very much for being here, Mr. Rhodes. Welcome. It's nice to have you. Appreciate your help. Um, and, I, you know, for me, in light of the fact that we are doing an organizational assessment, I, I don't have any additional comments on the budget at this time. Yeah. I actually also didn't have any questions, but welcome. Nice to meet you. Yeah, it's great to meet you. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a little more interaction with council. Um, I had two quick ones. So, one was the sales tax recovery. Um, I don't know if you've been spending time on that yet. I think, yeah, you know, I think historically we we recovered more than we had. I think last year, and I noticed you, your goal was like three to one, and I wondered why you didn't want to go back up to five to one. 
Uh, just out of a sense of being conservative to some degree um, and just because of the uh, the turnover in the city auditor's office, some activities were put on hold for a while, so there wasn't as much um, wasn't as much recovery efforts in our own office. The recovery efforts are both by Muni Services and then yep. a staff member in our own office. And so in our own office, we, we didn't put as much uh, time into that um, just because of staffing turnover and things were put on hold. So we just decided to guess on the uh, conservative side, but you know, hopefully it'll be more than that. What do you mean that things were put on hold? Um, so I don't know all the background of it, but there was a period of time, um, you know, late last year, and then I got here at the end of March, so the first quarter or so of this year, um, when it was uh, there's some of the audits and uh, some of the functions like the sales tax, um, the, s the staff was told to hold back on um, at the time, so we uh, didn't move forward on some of those. Huh. Um, I've started that back up, but that was, uh, so we just decided to be a little bit conservative with, with the number, um, but we're working on that again, so hopefully okay. it'll be higher. Yeah, it's probably not part of the budget, so I'd love, like to hear more about that. If, uh, I'll find some time to talk to you. Um, but yeah, I, I think if you could put some effort into sales tax recovery. Um, and then mm -hmm. just the second comment was, it'd be great to see an updated audit plan come to council uh, sometimes. Okay. Okay, uh, city clerk. Hello, city Hello. clerk. I'm sorry. I, I, I will try and do oh, two sorry, things. Done? <laughs> You're done? Yeah, I, I had a no. question, but I guess we're going in order. No. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, it's. I didn't realize that having the administrative staff clerking the council standing committee meetings was new, but it's a pleasure to have them there and get to know them better, and I think they're doing great. Thank you. Um, very excited about the initiative to work with departments to create a staff report writing guide. I'm sure this will not come as a surprise to anybody, so that's great, fantastic. Um, and I am supportive of budget adjustment number one. Um, you know, moving that to the new Office of Transportation makes plenty of sense. And then finally, I'll just say that I, I know you guys are short staffed and it has not shown at all. And I realize that's because you're doing extra work, but you know, from my perspective, um, you know, everyone has been as pleasant and helpful and everything has come exactly when it's supposed to. So well done on keeping things going during the interim. Thank you. Just one quick one. Um, so an area of focus is the board and commission application process. Is that to yield more applicants, to shorten the time window, to get a broader diversity of applicants? And I'm just trying to get a handle on that a little bit or make it easier for your office to process. It's um, to automate the system. Right okay. now we do um, fillable PDFs and we were using um, DocuSign document to do it and there were a lot of issues with doing that. Huh. Um, people needed a lot of assistance from my staff to fill it out and it didn't work so well. So we're looking to automate it um, with the, using a different system. There's a company called Civic Plus um, that we're looking into that does agenda management, but they also have a special board and commission uh, program also. Um, our BEAM student has looked into Google Docs mm -hmm. and has actually made some applications in Google Docs and is, has tested them with uh, people to see how they've worked out. So um, we're looking to automate it and make it um, easier for people to apply. Nice, okay, thank you. Um, so you have a lot of KPIs in the high 90s, 98 <laughs> percent, which is good to see. Uh, and I'm not, I think 98 percent on public records requests, you know, sounds pretty good. But I'm just curious why why we don't hit 100 percent kind of legal compliance. What, what happens when we don't? Um, it's 98 percent because sometimes they get lost in the system or um, there's times when uh, departments have to extend the time that they need to respond to a public records request. Um, and there has been an increase um, in the last two years of public records requests and the um, amount of information that they're requesting. Um, say, like even for council members, um, they want all the texts or all the emails on a certain subject that council members have received. And there's a lot of search that goes into that and um, like this last year when David was here, 
he was going through four, five, six thousand records to try and um, tone it down to what was responsive to the records. So some of it yep. is based on, you know, the records that are requested. And so when we're going over, do we respond and let, let the person know it's going to take longer than Yes, we do. It is? Okay. And then um, with, with the open position, if you, if you need additional temporary help, are you able to get that or because you're not spending the salary on David at the moment? I could do it, but we are um, interviewing, doing the actual interviews within the next two weeks of staff, of, of potential candidates. Um, so I'm hoping um, that that comes to fruition, that somebody will be a good candidate and we'll be able to hire them. Um, staff has picked up the load, the workload that was done um, by David, and the admins are taking on more duties. Um, so it's f for the interim, we're doing okay, okay. Um, and, and we can manage. I wouldn't want to do it for six months to a year um, because there will be other initiatives coming up that will challenge us. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, city manager? Yeah. Sure. Um, so one thing is I actually thought um, Ed, the KPIs here are actually pretty nice. There's like a range of them. Some are doing really well. Some, you know, could use some improvement. Um, but I actually thought they spoke to a lot of what your office and role is about. So kudos on that. Great. Um, I will share we did pour over them quite a bit. Yeah, the one that was interesting to me is, um, and the goal is goal number one, achieve council priorities and policy direction in a timely manner. I think for the most part the city does that. What sometimes bugs me, and this may be something for the next year a little bit, and it's not so much a budget issue, is like, what have we directed and just kind of fall, has fallen by the wayside? And I think we all probably have that once in a while. I remember like, oh, didn't we say this and that, mm -hmm. and what happens to it? And maybe it's our job to track it, but it's just something that struck me on goal number one. Um, I think those are my comments from now, but let me look through the budget summary again. Okay. Um, so if I look at uh, slide nine, um, I, I think you left out under what's working well, a transition, right? That's usually a pretty major deal when a city moves from one city manager to oh, another. So I think you everyone should take credit for a peaceful transition of power doesn't happen in in all in all uh, places so um so that was uh, something missing from the what's working well um and in terms of where we plan to focus just starting here at the top level you know i mean i think the top three i you know i fully expect um you know to be rock solid um and i'm very happy to see enhanced citizen engagement on there because i, I think we are perhaps not yet rock solid um, opportunity for improvement and I I want to tell you and um, that I hear not only from you but from all almost all the members of your staff a recognition that this is an area where we collectively can do better and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really happy to know that that's on on everybody's list and I think working together we can do better so um, I like um, vice mayor fine noticed on goal one fair amount of things here um, lead the development of citywide business plans you know it's I don't, I, this is my first year, but it does seem like we have an awful lot of <laughs> big things on our plate. Mm -hmm. So that, that is like a, a work stream in and of itself. Um, and then the one after it, maintain a highly qualified, engaged, and effective workforce. I know that's, um, you know, those, those two alone, in addition to keeping the wheels on the bus, will be a lot. Um, so we had the uh, outreach efforts there. And there are just a couple things. Um, I see on the key performance measures, I'm looking at page 164, a lot of um, objectives. So FY, uh, you know, 2020, it increases in every single area. Um, so those, I think, did Director Late use the word aspirational earlier right. this year, earlier today? It seemed like a year, doesn't it? Um, so great. Um, hopefully we have a plan. If we don't have our website until next year, I'm not sure how <laughs> I can get some of these going, but um, mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes. Um, and I do want to point out while we're here on page 165 that one of the things that makes it possible for us to go through a budget year, like, in a, frankly, it's been a pretty pleasant process so far, is, you know, the increase in uh, sales tax revenue of 8.2%. That's 
That's significant, okay. and we haven't really talked much about the top line, but that's one of the things that's making it possible for us to go through. Um, page 166, I see we have 6,900 subscribers to the city manager's online newsletter. Is that what's known <laughs> as the message to the, from the mayor or whatever, or is that something else? It, it, well, yes, among uh, other articles that are part of the... That's the target. We're at 6,400. He's going to go out. We're at 6,400, yeah. So maybe 6, we have about 10% right. of the... Yeah, so be interesting to see that as a proportion of the people who live here as opposed to, like, the sheer number of people that we that it goes to. Um, yeah, maybe we could all forward it mm -hmm. on to people we know. <laughs> <laughs> see if they'd like to see if they'd uh, like to yeah. sign up. It's it um, get blocked. Yeah, and on the, the budget adjustments, I think those are all appropriate. And let me see if I had anything on the other page. Um, that's it for the city manager. Well, I'm sorry question about the S cap. Mm -hmm. uh, so $100,000 one time. So what's going to happen next year? We are focused on some of the analytics necessary to do the S cap update. Um, I think in particular there's some modeling and um, uh, in particular I believe this is around the transportation and the emissions that uh, we wanted to get a better handle on as we're moving into the uh, next phase of the plan. But do you, do you expect it to be an ongoing cost like next year? Will it be this something else with the S cap? It, it would vary uh, from year to year. Uh, this one in particular, um, again, recognizing the significance of transportation in our remaining greenhouse gas emissions, uh, our staff wanted to really get a better handle on where we are and the uh, um, effectiveness of various uh, strategies we've been testing out. Yeah, Steve Guaglieri, Office of Management and Budget. I would just add that there is also ongoing contractual funding in the Office of Sustainability in the City Manager's Office. So there is a dedicated pool of funding for those things that will happen on an annual basis. This was in recognition of the Sustainability Division's needs for FY 2020. Okay, yeah, I just didn't want to make sure we weren't supplementing the, the loss of the Chief Sustainability Officer with a ongoing $100,000 a year right. consulting. No, it's, it's much more uh, focused in this particular case. And I, yeah, and if I could just build on that too, one of the things we've really been trying to focus on with the implementation plan is operationalizing sustainability throughout the organization. So a lot of the, the time and money spent on sustainability will would be expected to be showing up throughout the budget in other departments as opposed to in the Office of Sustainability. And then I didn't really understand why the the point point two five reduction was a zero dollar change. Um, could somebody explain that one? This is uh, enterprise fund. Go ahead, Steve. Sure. So I'll take a crack at it. So you're reducing a point two five FTE that was the assistant city manager slash utilities general manager, a very high level management position. Um, in turn, you're also deleting one of the deputy city manager positions. In exchange for that elimination of 1.25 positions, you're adding 1.0 assistant city manager. So the net of all of that, um, and it, there's another position transaction in there as well, of an admin associate three to an admin assistant. So the net of all of that is a $0 cost increase, but you're effectively eliminating 0.25 FTE in the general fund. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then I'm not, I'm not gonna argue for an economic development person, which we had some time ago. But I would like to say I, I would hope that some of the staff in the city management office could be fairly active in terms of our two downtowns and the assortment of businesses uh, that we have there. Yes, um, definitely. That is a, a clear focus for us. And in fact, uh, once Michelle is um, fully divested from development services, she will be spending more of her time uh, focused on our business community and liaison. Nice. Okay. And then on page... Um, 166, I think there's a typo there for proposed hours at council meetings. I think, I think we're on track to be less than that. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <coughs> All right, uh, does anybody else have anything? I'll, I'll just second what you said about the economic development manager. I know it's been brought up a couple times and I guess it really is up to you whether it's across a couple people or an individual role. Um, but in terms of a couple areas, whether it's our business tax opportunities, whether it's rail, 
business engagement, whether it is parking stuff. And the last thing I always bring up is kind of, you know, the mojo of Palo Alto, like, you know, whether we have cool events and festivals and all that stuff. Um, there, there's some, there's something there to push on. Definitely. I'll third that. Good. All right, so I would move that we tentatively. Uh, we haven't discussed the city council. Oh. <laughs> Just item five. I didn't May I? see much there. Do you have something? Yeah, sure. well, no, I Sorry. mean, we had one of our colleagues um, uh, was wondering why, um, you know, um, there were increases, and it, and he was saying that he didn't get more in salary, but in fact, I just wanted to note for the record that the salaries have gone down, because there were nine, now there are seven, so that's that. Um, I actually do wonder here what our contract services are. What are the contract services for the city council? Um, there's several, I'm trying to think of exactly what they are. Um, we've done some recruitments. Um, CAO reviews. CA, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, That's CA, right. those okay. type of MRG and those contracts come out of um, the oh, council's from the budget. Council. Oh, that makes total sense. Okay, great. Thank you. What, why did our health care go up so much? Sure. Steve Guagliardo with Office of Management and Budget again. And so the way we budget health care in the city is actually tied to the incumbent employees' elections and their benefit elections. So as council, even though it went down from 9 to 7, should council members choose to be in the family medical plan rather than the single medical plan, that has significant impacts on that particular line item. And so what you see is ebbs and flows with that depending on what people's elections are. Even though we did go down in council members, depending on the benefit elections, that results in the changing you see there. Does that include former council members? So that particular cost um, for FY 2020 does not include former council members. That's only the go forward regular monthly premiums. Huh. Yeah, so the, yeah, there's a separate line item for retiree medical and that covers that piece. So basically saying Adrian got married and the budget all out. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Allison got, got elected. And <laughs> I, I, I declined. Me too. It's not me. <laughs> mm. It is interesting, though. Actually, you can go look up, look up stuff on Transparent California and see. Uh, okay. So now can we yes. move to tentatively adopt uh, all of these items? Second. Yeah. Aye. All, all approved? All right, so we were five minutes over. Wow, that's impressive. Thank you guys. Thanks for one day. Easy, eh? <laughs> Don't remind me for sure. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you all. Yeah. 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 Now I get to go home.